Chapter One of Marcia Schuyler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. Chapter One. The sun was already up, and the grass blades were twinkling with sparkles of dew as Marcia stepped from the kitchen door. She wore a chocolate calico with little sprigs of red and white scattered over it. Her hair was in smooth brown braids down her back, and there was a flush on her round cheeks that might have been but the reflection of the rosy light in the east. Her face was as untroubled as the summer morning, in its freshness, and her eyes as dreamy as the soft clouds that hovered upon the horizon, uncertain where they were to be sent for the day. Marcia walked lightly through the grass, and the way behind her sparkled again like that of the girl in the fairy tale who left jewels wherever she passed. A rail fence stopped her, which she mounted as though it had been a steed to carry her onward, and sat a moment looking at the beauty of the morning, her eyes taking on that faraway look that annoyed her stepmother when she wanted her to hurry with the dishes or finish a long seam before it was time to get supper. She loitered but a moment, for her mind was full of business, and she wished to accomplish much before the day was done. Swinging easily down to the other side of the fence, she moved on through the meadow, over another fence and another meadow, skirting the edge of a cool little strip of woods, which lured her with its green mysterious shadows, its whispering leaves and twittering birds. One wistful glance she gave into the sweet silence, seeing a clump of maidenhair ferns rippling their feathery locks in the breeze. Then resolutely turning away, she sped on to the slope of Blackberry Hill. It was not a long climb to where the blackberries grew, and she was soon at work, the great luscious berries dropping into her pail almost with a touch. But while she worked, the vision of the hills, the sheet metal below, the river winding between the neighboring farms, melted away, and she did not even see the ripe fruit before her, because she was planning the new frock she was to buy with these berries she had come to pick. Pink and white it was to be. She had seen it in the store the last time she went for sugar and spice. There were dainty sprigs of pink over the white ground, and every berry that dropped into her bright pail was no longer a berry, but a sprig of pink chintz. While she worked, she went over her plans for the day. There had been busy times at the old house during the past weeks, Kate, her elder sister, was to be married. It was only a few days now to the wedding. There had been a whole year of preparation, spinning and weaving and fine sewing. The smooth white linen lay ready, packed between rose leaves and lavender. There had been yards and yards of tatting and embroidery made by the two girls for the trousseau, and the village dressmaker had spent days at the house, cutting, fitting, shearing, till now there was a goodly array of gorgeous apparel piled high upon bed and chairs and hanging in the closets of the great spare bedroom. The outfit was as fine as that made for Patience Hartrant six months before, and Mr. Hartrant had given his one daughter all she had asked for in the way of a setting out. Kate had seen to it that her things were as fine as Patience's. But they were all for Kate. Of course that was right. Kate was to be married, not Marcia, and everything must make way for that. Marcia was scarcely more than a child as yet, barely seventeen. No one thought of anything new for her just then, and she did not expect it. But into her heart there had stolen a longing for a new frock herself, amid all this finery for Kate. She had her best one, of course. That was good and pretty, and quite nice enough to wear to the wedding, and her stepmother had taken much relief in the thought that Marcia would need nothing during the rush of getting Kate ready. But there were people coming to the house every day, especially in the afternoons, friends of Kate and of her stepmother, to be shown Kate's wardrobe and to talk things over curiously. Marcia could not wear her best dress all the time. And he was coming. That was the way Marcia always denominated the prospective bridegroom in her mind. His name was David Spafford, and Kate often called him Dave. But Marcia, even to herself, could never bring herself to breathe the name so familiarly. She held him in great awe. He was so fine and strong and good, with a face like a young saint in some old picture, she thought. She often wondered how her wild, sparkling sister Kate dared to be so familiar with him. She had ventured the thought once when she watched Kate dressing to go out with some young people, 
and preening herself like a bird of paradise before the glass. It all came over her, the vanity and frivolousness of the life that Kate loved, and she spoke out with conviction. Kate, you'll have to be very different when you're married. Kate had faced about amusedly and asked why. Because he is so good, Marcia had replied, unable to explain further. Oh, is that all? said the daring sister, wheeling back to the glass. Don't you worry. I'll soon take that out of him. But Kate's indifference had never lessened her young sister's awe of her prospective brother-in-law. She had listened to his conversations with her father during the brief visits he had made, and she had watched his face at church while he and Kate sang together as the minister lined it out. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. A new song which had just been written, and she had mused upon the charmed life Kate would lead, it was wonderful to be a woman and be loved as Kate was loved, thought Marcia. So in all the hurry, no one seemed to think much about Marcia, and she was not satisfied with her brown delaine afternoon dress. Truth to tell, it needed letting down, and there was no more left to let down. It made her feel like last year to go about in it, with her slender ankle so plainly revealed. So she set her heart upon the new chintz. Now with Marcia, to decide was to do. She did not speak to her stepmother about it, for she knew it would be useless. Neither did she think it worth while to go to her father, for she knew that both his wife and Kate would find it out and charge her with useless expense, just now when there were so many other uses for money, and they were anxious to have it all flow their way. She had an independent spirit, so she took the time that belonged to herself, and went to the blackberry patch which belonged to everybody. Marcia's fingers were nimble and accustomed, and the sun was not very high in the heavens when she had finished her task and turned happily toward the village. The pails would not hold another berry. Her cheeks were glowing with the sun and exercise, and little wisps of wavy curls had escaped about her brow, damp with perspiration. Her eyes were shining with her purpose, half fulfilled, as she hastened down the hill. Crossing a field, she met Hanford Weston, with a rake over his shoulder and a wide-brimmed straw hat like a small shed over him. He was on his way to the south meadow. He blushed and greeted her as she passed shyly by. When she had passed, he paused and looked admiringly after her. They had been in the same classes at school all winter, the girl at the head, the boy at the foot. But Hanford Weston's father owned the largest farm in all the country round about, and he felt that did not so much matter. He would rather see Marcia at the head anyway, though there never had been the slightest danger that he would take her place. He felt a sudden desire now to follow her. It would be a pleasure to carry those pails that she bore as if they were mere featherweights. He watched her long, elastic step for a moment, considered the sun in the sky and his father's command about the south meadow, and then strode after her. It did not take long to reach her side, swiftly as she had gone. As well as he could, with the sudden hotness in his face and the tremor in his throat, he made out to ask if he might carry her burden for her. Marcia stopped annoyed. She had forgotten all about him, though he was an attractive fellow, sometimes called by the girls, Handsome Hanford. She had been planning exactly how that pink, sprigged chintz was to be made, and which parts she would cut first in order to save time and material. She did not wish to be interrupted. The importance of the matter was too great to be marred by the appearance of just a schoolmate, whom she might meet every day, and whom she could so easily spell down. She summoned her thoughts from the details of mutton-leg sleeves, and looked the boy over, to his great confusion. She did not want him along, and she was considering how best to get rid of him. "'Weren't you going somewhere else?' she asked sweetly. "'Wasn't there a rake over your shoulder? What have you done with it?' The culprit blushed deeper. "'Where were you going?' she demanded. "'To the South Meadow,' he stammered out. "'Oh, well, then you must go back. I shall do quite well, thank you. Your father will not be pleased to have you neglect your work for me, though I'm much obliged, I'm sure.' Was there some foreshadowing of her womanhood in the decided way she spoke, and the quaint, prim set of her head as she bowed him good morning and went on her way once more? The boy did not understand.' He only felt abashed and half angry that she had ordered him back to work, and too in a tone that forbade him to take her memory with him as he went. 
Nevertheless, her image lingered by the way and haunted the south meadow all day long as he worked. Marcia, unconscious of the admiration she had stirred in the boyish heart, went her way on fleet feet, her spirit one with the sunny morning, her body light with anticipation, for a new frock of her own choice was yet an event in her life. She had thought many times as she spent long hours putting delicate stitches into her sister's wedding garments, how it would seem if they were being made for her. She had whiled away many a dreary scene by thinking out, in a sort of dream story, how she would put on this or that at will if it were her own, and go here or there, and have people love and admire her as they did Kate. It would never come true, of course. She never expected to be admired and loved like Kate. Kate was beautiful, bright, and gay. Everybody loved her, no matter how she treated them. It was a matter of course for Kate to have everything she wanted. Marcia felt that she never could attain to such heights. In the first place, she considered her own sweet, serious face with its pure brown eyes as exceedingly plain. She could not catch the lights that played at hide-and-seek in her eyes when she talked with animation. Indeed, few saw her at her best because she seldom talked freely. It was only with certain people that she could forget herself. She did not envy Kate. She was proud of her sister and loved her, though there was an element of anxiety in the love. But she never thought of her many faults. She felt that they were excusable because Kate was Kate. It was as if you should find fault with a wild rose because it carried a thorn. Kate was set about with many a thorn, but amid them all she bloomed, her fragrant pink self, as apparently unconscious of the many pricks she gave, and as unconcerned as the flower itself. So Marcia never thought to be jealous that Kate had so many lovely things, and was going out into the world to do just as she pleased, and lead a charmed life with a man who was greater in the eyes of this girl than any prince that ever walked in fairy tale. But she saw no harm in playing a delightful little dream game of pretend now and then, and letting her imagination make herself the beautiful, admired elder sister, instead of the plain younger one. But this morning, on her way to the village store with her berries, she thought no more of her sister's things, for her mind was upon her own little frock, which she would purchase with the price of the berries, and then go home and make. A whole long day she had to herself, for Kate and her stepmother were gone up to the neighboring town on the packet to make a few last purchases. She had told no one of her plans, and was awake betimes in the morning to see the travelers off, eager to have them gone that she might begin to carry out her plan. Just at the edge of the village, Marcia put down the pails of berries by a large flat stone and sat down for a moment to tidy herself. The lacing of one shoe had come untied, and her hair was rumpled by exercise. But she could not sit long to rest, and taking up her burdens, was soon upon the way again. Mary Ann Fothergill stepped from her own gate, lingering till Marcia should come up, and the two girls walked along side by side. Mary Ann had stiff, straight, light hair and high cheekbones. Her eyes were light, and her eyelashes almost white. They did not show up well beneath her checked sunbonnet. Her complexion was dull and tanned. She was a contrast to Marcia with her clear red and white skin. She was tall and awkward and wore a linsey woolsey frock, as though it were a meal sack temporarily appropriated. She had the air of always trying to hide her feet and hands. Mary Ann had some fine qualities, but beauty was not one of them. Beside her, Marcia's delicate features showed clear-cut like a cameo, and her every movement spoke of patrician blood. Mary Ann regarded Marcia's smooth brown braids enviously. Her own sparse hair barely reached to her shoulders, and straggled about her neck helplessly and hopelessly, in spite of her constant efforts. "'It must be lots of fun at your house these days,' said Mary Ann wistfully. Are you most ready for the wedding? Marcia nodded. Her eyes were bright. She could see the sign of the village store just ahead, and knew the bolts of new chintz were displaying their charms in the window. My, but your cheeks do look pretty, admired Mary Ann impulsively. Say, how many of each has your sister got? Two dozens, said Marcia, conscious of a little swelling of pride in her breast. It was not every girl that had such a setting out as her sister. My, sighed Mary Ann, and outside things, too. I suppose she's got one of every color. What are her frocks? 
tell me about them. I've been up to Dutchess County and just got back last night, but Ma wrote Aunt Tilly that Miss Hotchkiss said her frocks was the prettiest Miss Hancock's ever sewed on. We think they are pretty, admitted Marcia modestly. There's a sprig chin... Here she caught herself, remembering, and laughed. I mean, muslin delaine, and a blue delaine, and a blue silk. My silk, breathed Mary Ann in an ecstasy of wonder. And what's she going to be married in? White, answered Marcia, white satin, and the veil was mother's, our own mother's, you know. Marcia spoke it reverently, her eyes shining with something far away that made Mary Ann think she looked like an angel. Oh, my! Don't you just envy her? No, said Marcia slowly. I think not. At least, I hope not. It wouldn't be right, you know. And then she's my sister, and I love her dearly. And it's nearly as nice to have one's sister have nice things, and a good time, as to have them oneself. You're good, said Mary Ann decidedly, as if that were a foregone conclusion. But I should envy her, I just should. Miss Hotchkiss told Ma there weren't many lots in life so all honey and dew prepared like your sister's. All the money she wanted to spend on clothes, and a nice set out, and a man as handsome as you'll find anywhere. And he's well off too, ain't he? Ma said she heard he kept a horse and lived right in the village too. Not as how he needed to keep one to get anywhere either. That's what I call luxury, a horse to ride around with. And then Mr. What's-His-Name? I can't remember. Oh, yes, Spafford. He's good, and everybody says he won't make a bit of fuss if Kate does go around and have a good time. He'll just let her do as she pleases. Only old Grandma Doolittle says she doesn't believe it. She thinks every man, no matter how good he is, wants to manage his wife just for the name of it. She says your sister'll have to change her ways or else there'll be trouble. But that's Grandma. Everybody knows her. She croaks. Ma says Kate's got her nest feathered well if ever a girl had. Ma, I only wish I had the same chance. Marcia held her head a trifle high when Mary Ann touched upon her sister's personal character. But they were nearing the store, and everybody knew Mary Ann was blunt. Poor Mary Ann. She meant no harm. She was but repeating the village gossip. Besides, Marcia must give her mind to sprig chintz. There was no time for discussions if she would accomplish her purpose before the folks came home that night. Mary Ann, she said in her sweet, prim way that always made the other girls stand a little in awe of her, you mustn't listen to gossip. It isn't worth while. I'm sure my sister Kate will be very happy. I'm going in the store now, are you? And the conversation was suddenly concluded. Mary Ann followed meekly, watching with wonder and envy, as Marcia made her bargain with the kindly merchant and selected her chintz. What a delicious swish the scissors made as they went through the width of cloth, and how delightfully the paper crackled as the bundle was being wrapped. Mary Ann did not know whether Kate or Marcia was more to be envied. "'Did you say you were going to make it up yourself?' asked Mary Ann. Marcia nodded. "'Oh, my! Ain't you afraid?' I would be. It's the prettiest I ever saw. Don't you go and cut both sleeves for one arm. That's what I did the only time Ma ever let me try. And Mary Ann touched the package under Marcia's arm with wistful fingers. They had reached the turn of the road, and Mary Ann hoped that Marcia would ask her out to help. But Marcia had no such purpose. Well, goodbye. Will you wear it next Sunday? she asked. Perhaps, answered Marcia breathlessly, and sped on her homeward way her cheeks bright with excitement. In her own room she spread the chintz out upon the bed and with trembling fingers set about her task. The bright shears clipped the edge and tore off the lengths, exultantly, as if in league with the girl. The bees hummed outside in the clover and now and again buzzed between the muslin curtains of the open window, looked in and grumbled out again. The birds sang across the meadows and the sun mounted to the zenith and began its downward march but still the busy fingers worked on. Well for Marcia's scheme that the fashion of the day was simple, wherein were few puckers and plates and tucks and little trimming required, else her task would have been impossible. Her heart beat high as she tried it on at last, the new chintz that she had made. 
She went into the spare room and stood before the long mirror in its wide gilt frame that rested on two gilt knobs standing out from the wall like giant rosettes. She had dared to make the skirt a little longer than that of her best frock. It was almost as long as Kate's, and for a moment she lingered, sweeping backward and forward before the glass and admiring herself in the long graceful folds. She caught up her braids in the fashion that Kate wore her hair and smiled at the reflection of herself in the mirror. How funny it seemed to think she would soon be a woman like Kate. When Kate was gone, they would begin to call her Miss sometimes. Somehow she did not care to look ahead. The present seemed enough. She had so wrapped her thoughts in her sister's new life that her own seemed flat and stale in comparison. The sound of a distant hay wagon on the road reminded her that the sun was near to setting. The family carry-all would soon be coming up the lane from the evening packet. She must hurry and take off her frock and be dressed before they arrived. Marcia was so tired that night after supper that she was glad to slip away to bed, without waiting to hear Kate's voluble account of her day in, in town, the beauties she had seen and the friends she had met. She lay down and dreamed of the morrow and of the next day and the next. In strange bewilderment she awoke in the night and found the moonlight streaming full into her face. Then she laughed and rubbed her eyes and tried to go to sleep again. But she could not, for she had dreamed that she was the bride herself, and the words of Mary Ann kept going over and over in her mind. Oh, don't you envy her! Did she envy her sister? But that was wicked. It troubled her to think of it, and she tried to banish the dream but it would come again and again with a strange sweet pleasure. She lay wondering if such a time of joy would ever come to her as had come to Kate, and whether the spare bed would ever be piled high with clothes and fittings for her new life. What a wonderful thing it was anyway to be a woman and be loved. Then her dreams blended again with the soft perfume of the honeysuckle at the window and the hooting of a young owl. The moon dropped lower, the bright stars paled, Dawn stole up through the edges of the woods far away, and awakened a day that was to bring a strange transformation over Marcia's life. End of chapter 1as a natural consequence of her hard work and her midnight awakening, Marcia overslept the next morning. Her stepmother called her sharply, and she dressed in haste, not even taking time to glance toward the new folds of chintz that drew her thoughts closetward. She dared not say anything about it yet. There was much to be done, and not even Kate had time for an idle word with her. Marcia was called upon to run errands, to do odds and ends of things, to fill in vacant places, to sew on lost buttons, to do everything for which nobody else had time. The household had suddenly become aware that there was now but one more intervening day between them and the wedding. It was not until late in the afternoon that Marcia ventured to put on her frock. Even then she felt shy about appearing in it. Madam Schuyler was busy in the parlor with callers, and Kate was locked in her own room whither she had gone to rest. There was no one to notice if Marcia should dress up, and it was not unlikely that she might escape much notice even at the supper table, as everybody was so absorbed in other things. She lingered before her own little glass, looking wistfully at herself. She was pleased with the frock she had made and liked her appearance in it, but yet there was something disappointing about it. It had none of the style of her sister's garments, newly come from the hand of the village mantua maker. It was girlish and showed her slip of a form prettily in the fashion of the day, but she felt too young. She wanted to look older. She searched her drawer and found a bit of black velvet, which she pinned about her throat, with a pin containing the miniature of her mother. Then, with a second thought, she drew the long braids up in loops and fastened them about her head in older fashion. It suited her well, and the change it made astonished her. She decided to wear them so and see if others would notice. Surely some day she would be a young woman, and perhaps then she would be allowed to have a will of her own occasionally. She drew a quick breath as she descended the stairs and found her stepmother and the visitor just coming into the hall from the parlor. They both involuntarily ceased their talk and looked at her in surprise. Over Madame Schuyler's face there came a look as if she had received a revelation. 
Marcia was no longer a child, but had suddenly blossomed into young womanhood. It was not the time she would have chosen for such an event. There was enough going on, and Marcia was still in school. She had no desire to steer another young soul through the various dangers and follies that beset a pretty girl from the time she puts up her hair until she is safely married to the right man, or the wrong one. She had just begun to look forward with relief to having Kate well settled in life. Kate had been a hard one to manage. She had too much will of her own and a pretty way of always having it. She had no deep sense of reverence for old staid manners and customs. Many a long lecture had Madame Schuyler delivered to Kate upon her unseemly ways. It did not please her to think of having to go through it all so soon again. Therefore, upon her usually complacent brow, there came a look of dismay. Why, exclaimed the visitor, is this the bride? How tall she looks. No, bless me, it isn't, is it? Yes, well, I'll declare, it's just Marsh. What have you got on, child? How old you look! Marcia flushed. It was not pleasant to have her young womanhood questioned, and in a tone so familiar and patronizing. She disliked the name of Marsh exceedingly, especially upon the lips of this woman, a sort of second cousin of her stepmother's. She would rather have chosen the new frock to pass under inspection of her stepmother without witnesses, but it was too late to turn back now. She must face it. Though Madame Schuyler's equilibrium was a trifle disturbed, she was not one to show it before a visitor. Instantly she recovered her balance, and perhaps Marcia's ordeal was less trying than if there had been no third person present. "'That looks very well, child,' she said critically, with a shade of complacence in her voice. It is true that Marcia had gone beyond orders in purchasing and making garments unknown to her, yet the neatness and fit could but reflect well upon her training.' It did no harm for Cousin Maria to see what a child of her training could do. It was, on the whole, a very credible piece of work, and Madame Schuyler grew more reconciled to it as Marcia came down toward them. "'Make it herself?' asked Cousin Maria. "'Why, Marsh, you did real well. My Matilda does all her own clothes now. It's time you were learning. It's a trifle longish to what you've been wearing them, isn't it? But you'll grow into it, I dare say.' got your hair a new way too i thought you were kate when you first started downstairs you'll make a good-looking young lady when you grow up only don't be in too much hurry take your girlhood while you've got it is what i always tell matilda matilda was well on to thirty and showed no signs of taking anything else madame schuyler smoothed an imaginary pucker across the shoulders and again pronounced the work good I picked berries and got the cloth, confessed Marcia. Madame Schuyler smiled benevolently and patted Marcia's cheek. You needn't have done that, child. Why didn't you come to me for money? You needed something new, and that is a very good purchase. A little light, perhaps, but very pretty. We've been so busy with Kate's things, you've been neglected. Marcia smiled with pleasure and passed into the dining room, wondering what power the visitor had over her stepmother to make her pass over this digression from her rules so sweetly, nay, even with praise. At supper they all rallied Marcia upon her changed appearance. Her father jokingly said that when the bridegroom arrived he would hardly know which sister to choose, and he looked from one comely daughter to the other with fatherly pride. He praised Marcia for doing the work so neatly, and inwardly admired the courage and independence that prompted her to get the money by her own unaided efforts rather than to ask for it, and later, as he passed through the room where she was helping to remove the dishes from the table, he paused and handed her a crisp five-dollar note. It had occurred to him that one daughter was getting all the good things, and the other was having nothing. There was a pleasant tenderness in his eyes, a recognition of her rights as a young woman, that made Marcia's heart exceedingly light. There was something strange about the influence this little new frock seemed to have upon people. Even Kate had taken a new tone with her. Much of the time at supper she had sat staring at her sister. Marcia wondered about it as she walked down toward the gate after her work was done. Kate had never seemed so quiet. Was she just beginning to realize that she was leaving home forever, and was she thinking how the home would be after she had left it? How she, Marcia, would take the place of elder sister, with only little Harriet and the boys, their stepsister and brothers, left? 
Was Kate sad over the thought of going so far away from them? Or was she feeling suddenly the responsibility of the new position she was to occupy and the duties that would be hers? No, that could not be it, for surely that would bring a softening of expression, a sweetness of anticipation. And Kate's expression had been wondering, perplexed, almost troubled. If she had not been her own sister, Marcia would have added, hard, but she stopped short at that. It was a lovely evening. The twilight was not yet over as she stepped from the low piazza that ran the length of the house, bearing another above it on great white pillars. A drapery of wisteria in full bloom festooned across one end and half over the front. Marcia stepped back across the stone flagging and driveway to look up the purple clusters of graceful fairy-like shape that embowered the house, and thought how beautiful it would look when the wedding guests should arrive the day after the morrow. Then she turned into the little gravel path, box-bordered, that led to the gate. Here and there, on either side, luxuriant blooms of dahlias, peonies, and roses leaned over into the night and peered at her. The yard had never looked so pretty. The flowers truly had done their best for the occasion, and they seemed to be asking some word of commendation from her. They nodded their dewy heads sleepily as she went on. Tomorrow the children would be coming back from Aunt Eliza's, where they had been sent safely out of the way for a few days, and the last things would arrive. And he would come. Not later than three in the afternoon he ought to arrive, Kate had said, though there was a possibility that he might come in the morning, but Kate was not counting upon it. He was to drive from his home to Schenectady, and leaving his own horse there to rest, come on by coach. Then he and Kate would go back in fine style to Schenectady in a coach and pair, with a colored coachman, and at Schenectady take their own horse and drive on to their home, a long, beautiful ride, so thought Marcia half-enviously. How beautiful it would be! What endless, delightful talks they might have about the trees and birds and things they saw in passing! Only Kate did not love to talk about such things. But then she would be with David, and he talked beautifully about nature or anything else. Kate would learn to love it if she loved him. Did Kate love David? Of course she must, or why should she marry him? Marcia resented the thought that Kate might have other objects in view, such as Marianne Fothergill had suggested, for instance. Of course Kate would never marry any man unless she loved him. That would be a dreadful thing to do. Love was the greatest thing in the world. Marcia looked up to the stars, her young soul thrilling with awe and reverence for the great mysteries of life. She wondered again if life would open some time for her in some such great way, and if she would ever know better than now what it meant. Would someone come and love her, someone whom she could love in return with all the fervor of her nature? She had dreamed such dreams before many times, as girls will, while lovers and future are all in one dreamy, sweet blending of rosy tints and joyous mystery. But never had they come to her with such vividness as that night. Perhaps it was because the household had recognized the woman in her for the first time that evening. Perhaps because the vision she had seen reflected in her mirror before she left her room that afternoon had opened the door of the future a little wider than it had ever opened before. She stood by the gate where the syringa and lilac bushes leaned over and arched the way, and the honeysuckle climbed about the fence in a wild pretty way of its own, and flung sweetness on the air in vivid, erratic whiffs. The sidewalk outside was brick, and whenever she heard footsteps coming, she stepped back into the shadow of the syringa and was hidden from view. She was in no mood to talk with anyone. She could look out into the dusty road and see dimly the horses and carryalls as they passed, and recognize an occasional laughing voice of some village maiden out with her best young man for a ride. Others strolled along the sidewalk and fragments of talk floated back. Almost everyone had a word to say about the wedding as they neared the gate, and if Marcia had been in another mood, it would have been interesting and gratifying to her pride. Everyone had a good word for Kate, though many disapproved of her in a general way for principle's sake. Hanford Weston passed with long slouching gait, hands in his trousers pockets, and a frightened, hasty sideways glance toward the lights of the house beyond. He would have gone in boldly to call if he had dared, and told Marcia that he had done her bidding and now wanted a reward. 
but John Middleton had joined him at the corner, and he dared not make the attempt. John would have done it in a minute if he had wished. He was brazen by nature, but Hanford knew that he would as readily laugh at another for doing it. Hanford shrank from a laugh more than from the cannon's mouth, so he slouched on, not knowing that his goddess held her breath behind a lilac bush not three feet away, her heart beating in annoyed taps to be again interrupted by him in her pleasant thoughts. Merry laughing voices mingling with many footsteps came sounding down the street and paused beside the gate. Marcia knew the voices and again slid behind the shrubbery that bordered all the way to the house, and not even a gleam of her light frock was visible. They trooped in, three or four girlfriends of Kate's and a couple of young men. Marcia watched them pass up the box-bordered path from her shadowy retreat, and thought how they would miss Kate, and wondered if the young men who had been coming there so constantly to see her had no pangs of heart that their friend and leader was about to leave them. Then she smiled at herself in the dark. She seemed to be doing the retrospect for Kate, taking leave of all the old friends, home and life in Kate's place. It was not her life anyway, and why should she bother herself and sigh and feel this sadness creeping over her for someone else? Was it that she was going to lose her sister? No, for Kate had never been much of a companion to her. She had always put her down as a little girl, and made distinct and clear the difference in their ages. Marcia had been the little maid to fetch and carry, the errand girl, and unselfish, devoted slave in Kate's life. There had been nothing protective and elder sisterly in her manner toward Marcia. At times Marcia had felt this keenly, but no expression of this lack had ever crossed her lips, and afterwards her devotion to her sister had been the greater to, in a measure, compensate for this reproachful thought. But Marcia could not shake the sadness off. She stole in further among the trees to think about it till the callers should go away. She felt no desire to meet any of them. She began again to wonder how she would feel if day after tomorrow were her wedding day, and she were going away from home and friends and all the scenes with which she had been familiar since babyhood. Would she mind very much leaving them all? Father? Yes, father had been good to her and loved her and was proud of her in a way. But one does not lose one's father no matter how far one goes. A father is a father always, and Mr. Schuyler was not a demonstrative man. Marcia felt that her father would not miss her deeply, and she was not sure she would miss him so very much. She had read to him a great deal and talked politics with him whenever he had no one better by. But aside from that, her life had been lived much apart from him. Her stepmother? Yes, she would miss her as one misses a perfect mentor and guide. She had been used to looking to her for direction. She was thoroughly conscious that she had a will of her own and would like a chance to exercise it. Still, she knew that in many cases without her stepmother she would be like a rudderless ship, a guideless traveler, and she loved her stepmother too as a young girl can love a good woman who has been her guide and helper, even though there never has been great tenderness between them. Yes, she would miss her stepmother, but she would not feel so very sad over it. Harriet and the little brothers? Oh, yes, she would miss them. They were dear little things and devoted to her. Then there were the neighbors and the schoolmates and the people of the village. She would miss the minister, the dear old minister and his wife. Many a time she had gone with her arms full of flowers to the parsonage down the street and spent the afternoon with the minister's wife. Her smooth white hair under its muslin cap and her soft wrinkled cheek were very dear to the young girl. She had talked to this friend more freely about her innermost thoughts than she had ever spoken to any living being. Oh, she would miss the minister's wife very much if she were to go away. The names of her schoolmates came to her. Harriet Woodgate, Eliza Buchanan, Margaret Fletcher, three girls who were her intimates. She would miss them, of course, but how much? She could scarcely tell. Margaret Fletcher more than the other two. Marianne Fothergill? She almost laughed at the thought of anybody missing Marianne. John Middleton? Hanford Weston? There was not a boy in the school she would miss for an instant, she told herself with conviction. Not one of them realized her ideal. There was much pairing off of boy and girl in school, but Marcia, like the heroine of coming through the rye, was good friends with all the boys and intimate with none. They all counted it an honor to wait upon her, and she cared not a farthing for any. She felt herself too young, of course, to think of such things. 
but when she dreamed her day dreams the lover and prince who figured in them bore no familiar form or feature. He was a prince, and these were only schoolboys. The merry chatter of the young people in the house floated through the open windows, and Marcia could hear her sister's voice above them all. Chameleon-like, she was all gaiety and laughter now, since her gravity at supper. They were coming out the front door and down the walk. Kate was with them. Marcia could catch glimpses of the girls' white frocks as they came nearer. She saw that her sister was walking with Captain Leavenworth. He was a handsome young man who made a fine appearance in his uniform. He and Kate had been intimate for two years, and it might have been more than friendship had not Kate's father interfered between them. He did not think so well of the handsome young captain, as did either his daughter Kate or the United States Navy who had given him his position. Squire Schuyler required deep integrity and strength of moral character in the man who aspired to be his son-in-law. The captain did not number much of either among his virtues. There had been a short, sharp contest which had ended in the departure of young Leavenworth from the town some three years before, and the temporary plunging of Kate Schuyler into a season of tears and pouting. But it had not been long before her gay laughter was ringing again, and her father thought she had forgotten. About that time David Spafford had appeared and promptly fallen in love with the beautiful girl, and the Schuyler mind was relieved. So it came about that upon the reappearance of the handsome young captain, wearing the insignia of his first honors, the squire received him graciously. He even felt that he might be more lenient about his moral character, and told himself that perhaps he was not so bad after all. He must have something in him, or the United States government would not have seen fit to honor him. It was easier to think so, now Kate was safe. Marcia watched her sister and the captain go laughing down to the gate and out into the street. She wondered that Kate could care to go out tonight when it was to be almost her last evening at home. Wondered, too, that Kate would walk with Captain Leavenworth when she belonged to David now. She might have managed it to go with one of the girls, but that was Kate's way. Kate's ways were not Marcia's ways. Marcia wondered if she would miss Kate, and was obliged to acknowledge to herself that in many ways her sister's absence would be a relief to her. While she recognized the power of her sister's beauty and will over her, she felt oppressed, sometimes by the strain she was under to please, and wearied of the constant, half-fretful, half-playful fault-finding. The gay footsteps and voices died away down the village street, and Marcia ventured forth from her retreat. The moon was just rising and came up a glorious burnished disk, silhouetting her face as she stood a moment listening to the stirring of a bird among the branches. It was her will tonight to be alone and let her fancies wander where they would. The beauty and the mystery of a wedding was upon her, touching all her deeper feelings, and she wished to dream it out and wonder over it. Again it came to her, what if the day after the morrow were her wedding day? and she stood alone thinking about it. She would not have gone off down the street with a lot of giggling girls, nor walked with another young man. She would have stood here, or down by the gate, and she moved on toward her favorite arch of lilac and syringa. Yes, down by the gate in the darkness, looking out and thinking how it would be when he should come. She felt sure if it had been herself who expected David, she would have begun to watch for him a week before the time he had set for coming, heralding it again and again to her heart in joyous thrills of happiness, for who knew but he might come sooner and surprise her? She would have rejoiced that tonight she was alone, and would have excused herself from everything else to come down there in the stillness and watch for him, and think how it would be when he would really get there. She would hear his step echoing down the street and would recognize it as his. She would lean far over the gate to listen and watch, and it would come nearer and nearer, and her heart would beat faster and faster, and her breath come quicker, until he was at last by her side, his beautiful surprise for her in his eyes. But now, if David should really try to surprise Kate by coming that way tonight, he would not find her waiting nor thinking of him at all, but off with Captain Leavenworth. With a passing pity for David, she went back to her own dream. With one elbow on the gate and her cheek in her hand, she thought it all over. The delayed evening coach rumbled up to the tavern not far away and halted. Real footsteps came up the street, but Marcia did not notice them, only as they made more vivid her thoughts. Her dream went on, and the steps drew nearer, until suddenly they halted, and someone appeared out of the shadow. 
her heart stood still, for form and face in the darkness seemed unreal, and the dreams had been most vivid. Then with tender masterfulness, two strong arms were flung about her, and her face was drawn close to his, across the vine-twined gate, until her lips touched his. One long clinging kiss of tenderness he gave her, and held her head close against his breast for just a moment, while he murmured, My darling, my precious, precious Kate, I have you at last. The spell was broken, Marcia's dream was shattered, her mind awoke, with a scream she sprang from him, horror, and a wild but holy joy mingling with her perplexity. She put her hand upon her heart, marveling over the sweetness that lingered upon her lips, trying to recover her senses as she faced the eager lover who opened the little gate and came quickly toward her, as yet unaware that it was not Kate to whom he had been talking. End of chapter 2 Chapter Three of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. Marcia stood quivering, trembling. She comprehended all in an instant. David Spafford had come a day earlier than he had been expected to surprise Kate, and Kate was off having a good time with someone else. He had mistaken her for Kate. Her long dress and her put-up hair had deceived him in the moonlight. She tried to summon some womanly courage and in her earnestness to make things right, she forgot her natural timidity. "'It is not Kate,' she said gently. "'It is only Marcia. Kate did not know you were coming tonight. She did not expect you till tomorrow. She had to go out. That is, she has gone with—' The truthful, youthful, troubled sister paused. To her mind it was a calamity that Kate was not present to meet her lover. She should at least have been in the house ready for a surprise like this. Would David not feel the omission keenly? She must keep it from him if she could about Captain Leavenworth. There was no reason why he should feel badly about it, of course, and yet it might annoy him. But he stepped back laughing at his mistake. "'Why, Marcia, is it you, child? How you have grown! I never should have known you,' said the young man pleasantly. He had always a grave tenderness for this little sister of his love. "'Of course your sister did not know I was coming,' he went on. "'And doubtless she has many things to attend to.' I did not expect her to be out here watching for me, though for a moment I did think she was at the gate. You say she has gone out? Then we will go up to the house, and I will be there to surprise her when she comes. Marcia turned with relief. He had not asked where Kate was gone, nor with whom. The squire and Madame Schuyler greeted the arrival with elaborate welcome. The squire, like Marcia, seemed much annoyed that Kate had gone out. He kept fuming back and forth from the window to the door and asking, what did she go out for to-night? She ought to have stayed at home. But Madame Schuyler wore ample satisfaction upon her smooth brow. The bridegroom had arrived. There could be no further hitch in the ceremonies. He had arrived a day before the time, it is true, but he had not found her unprepared. So far as she was concerned, with a few extra touches, the wedding might proceed at once. She was always ready for everything in time. No one could find a screw loose in the machinery of her household. She bustled about, giving orders and laying a bountiful supper before the young man, while the squire sat and talked with him, and Marcia hovered watchfully, waiting upon the table, noticing with admiring eyes the beautiful wave of his abundant hair tossed back from his forehead. She took a kind of pride of possession in his handsome face, the far-removed possession of a sister-in-law. There was his sunny smile that seemed as though it could bring joy out of the gloom of a bleak December day and there were the two dimples, not real dimples, of course, men never had dimples, but hints, suggestions of dimples that caught themselves when he smiled, here and there, like hidden mischief well kept under control, but still merrily ready to come to the surface. His hands were white and firm, the fingers long and shapely, the hands of a brain worker. The vision of Hanford Weston's hands, red and bony, came up to her in contrast. She had not known that she looked at them that day when he had stood awkwardly asking if he might walk with her. Poor Hanford! He would ill compare with this cultured, scholarly man, who was his senior by ten years, though it is possible that with the ten years added he would have been quite worthy of the admiration of any of the village girls. 
The fruit cake and raspberry preserves and doughnuts and all the various viands that Madam Schuyler had ordered set out for the delectation of her guest had been partaken of, and David and the Squire sat talking of the news of the day, touching on politics, with a bit of laughter from the Squire at the man who thought he had invented a machine to draw carriages by steam in place of horses. "'There's a good deal in it, I believe,' said the younger man. "'His theory is all right, if he can get someone to help him carry it out.' "'Well, maybe, maybe,' said the squire, shaking his head dubiously. "'But it seems to me a very fanciful scheme. "'Horses are good enough for me. "'I shouldn't like to trust myself to an unknown quantity like steam. "'But time will tell.' "'Yes, and the world is progressing. "'Something of the sort is sure to come. "'It has come in England.' It would make a vast change in our country, binding city to city and practically eradicating space. Visionary schemes, David, visionary schemes, that's what I call them. You and I'll never see them in our day, I'm sure of that. Remember, this is a new country and must go slow. The squire was half laughing, half in earnest. Amid the talk, Marcia had quietly slipped out. It had occurred to her that perhaps the captain might return with her sister. She must watch for Kate and warn her. Like a shadow in the moonlight, she stepped softly down the gravel path once more and waited at the gate. Did not that sacred kiss, placed upon her lips, all by mistake, bind her to this solemn duty? Had it not been given to her to see, as in a revelation by that kiss, the love of one man for one woman, deep and tender and true? In the fragrant darkness her soul stood still and wondered over love, the marvelous. With an insight such as few have who have not tasted years of wedded joy, Marcia comprehended the possibility and joy of sacrifice that made even sad things bright because of love. She saw like a flash how Kate could give up her gay life, her home, her friends, everything that life had heretofore held dear for her, that she might be by the side of the man who loved her so. But with this knowledge of David's love for Kate, came a troubled doubt. Did Kate love David that way? If Kate had been the one who received that kiss, would she have returned it with the same tenderness and warmth with which it was given? Marcia dared not try to answer this. It was Kate's question, not hers, and she must never let it enter her mind again. Of course she must love him that way or she would never marry him. The night crept slowly for the anxious little watcher at the gate, had she been sure where to look for her sister, and not afraid of the tongues of a few interested neighbors who had watched everything at the house for days that no item about the wedding should escape them, she would have started on a search at once. She knew if she just ran into old Miss Pemberton's, whose house stood out upon the street with two straight-backed little high white seats each side of the stoop, a most delightful post of observation, she could discover at once in which direction Kate had gone, and perhaps a good deal more of hints and suggestions besides. But Marcia had no mind to make gossip. She must wait as patiently as she could for Kate. Moreover, Kate might be walking even now in some secluded, rose-lined lane, arm in arm with the captain, saying a pleasant farewell. It was Kate's way, and no one might gainsay her. Marcia's dreams came back once more, the thoughts that had been hers as she stood there an hour before. She thought how the kiss had fitted into the dream. Then all at once conscience told her it was Kate's lover, not her own, whose arms had encircled her. And now there was a strange unwillingness to go back to the dreams at all, a lingering longing for the joys into whose glory she had been for a moment permitted to look. She drew back from all thoughts and tried to close the door upon them. They seemed too sacred to enter. Her maidenhood was but just begun, and she had much yet to learn of life. She was glad, glad for Kate, that such wonderfulness was coming to her. Kate would be sweeter, softer in her ways now. She could not help it with a love like that enfolding her life. At last there were footsteps. Hark! Two people. Only two. Just what Marcia had expected. The other girls and boys had dropped into other streets or gone home. Kate and her former lover were coming home alone. And furthermore, Kate would not be glad to see her sister at the gate. This last thought came with sudden conviction, but Marcia did not falter. Kate, David has come. Marcia said it in low, almost accusing tones. At least so it sounded to Kate, 
before the two had hardly reached the gate. They had been loitering along talking in low tones, and the young captain's head was bent over his companion in an earnest, pleading attitude. Marcia could not bear to look, and did not wish to see more, so she had spoken. Kate, startled, sprang away from her companion, a white angry look in her face. "'How you scared me, Marsh!' she exclaimed pettishly. "'What if he has come? That's nothing. I guess he can wait a few minutes. He had no business to come tonight anyway. He knew we wouldn't be ready for him till tomorrow.' Kate was recovering her self-possession in proportion as she realized the situation. That she was vexed over her bridegroom's arrival, neither of the two witnesses could doubt. It stung her sister with a deep pity for David. He was not getting as much in Kate as he was giving, but there was no time for such thoughts. Besides, Marcia was trembling from head to foot, partly with her own daring, partly with wrath at her sister's words. "'For shame, Kate!' she cried. "'How can you talk so, even in fun? "'David came to surprise you, "'and I think he had a right to expect to find you here, "'so near to the time of your marriage.' There was a flash in the young eyes as she said it, and a delicate lifting of her chin with the conviction of the truth she was speaking, that gave her a new dignity even in the moonlight. Captain Leavenworth looked at her in lazy admiration and said, "'Why, Marsh, you're developing into quite a spitfire. What have you got on tonight that makes you look so tall and handsome? Why didn't you stay in and talk to your fine gentleman? I'm sure he would have been just as well satisfied with you as your sister.' Marcia gave one withering glance at the young man and then turned her back full upon him. He was not worth noticing. Besides, he was to be pitied, for he evidently cared still for Kate. But Kate was fairly white with anger. Perhaps her own accusing conscience helped it on. Her voice was imperious and cold. She drew herself up haughtily and pointed toward the house. "'Marcia Schuyler,' she said coldly, facing her sister, Go into the house and attend to your own affairs. You'll find that you'll get into serious trouble if you attempt to meddle with mine. You're nothing but a child yet and ought to be punished for your impudence. Go, I tell you, she stamped her foot. I will come in when I get ready. Marcia went, not proudly as she might have gone the moment before, but covered with confusion and shame, her head drooping like some crushed lily on a bleeding stalk. Through her soul rushed indignation, mighty and forceful, indignation and shame, for her sister, for David, for herself. She did not stop to analyze her various feelings, nor did she stop to speak further with those in the house. She fled to her own room, and burying her face in the pillow, she wept until she fell asleep. The moon shadows grew longer about the arbored gateway, where the two she had left stood talking in low tones, looking furtively now and then toward the house, and withdrawing into the covert of the bushes by the walk. But Kate dared not linger long. She could see her father's profile by the candlelight in the dining room. She did not wish to receive further rebuke, and so in a very few minutes the two parted, and Kate ran up the box-edged path, beginning to hum a sweet old love song in a gay, light voice, as she tripped by the dining room windows, and thus announced her arrival. She guessed that Marcia would have gone straight to her room and told nothing. Kate intended to be fully surprised. She paused in the hall to hang up the light shawl she had worn, calling good night to her stepmother and saying she was very tired and was going straight to bed to be ready for tomorrow. Then she ran lightly across the hall to the stairs. She knew they would call her back and that they would all come into the hall with David to see the effect of his surprise upon her. She had planned to a nicety just which stair she could reach before they got there, and where she would pause and turn and poise, and what pose she would take with her round white arm stretched to the handrail, the sleeve turned carelessly back. She had ready her countenances, a sleepy indifference, then a pleased surprise, and a climax of delight. She carried it all out, this little bit of impromptu acting, as well as though she had rehearsed it for a month. They called her, and she turned deliberately, one dainty slippered foot with its crossed black ribbons about the slender ankle, just leaving the stair below, and showing the arch of the aristocratic instep. Her gown was blue, and she held it back just enough for the stiff white frill of her petticoat to peep below. Well, she read the admiration in the eyes below her, 
Admiration was Kate's life. She thrived upon it. She could not do without it. David stood still, his love in his eyes, looking upon the vision of his bride, and his heart swelled within him that so great a treasure should be his. Then straightway they all forgot to question where she had been, or to rebuke her that she had been at all. She had known they would. She ever possessed the power to make others forget her wrongdoings, when it was worth her while to try. The next morning things were astir even earlier than usual. There was the sound of the beating of eggs, the stirring of cakes, the clatter of pots and pans from the wide stone-flagged kitchen. Marcia, fresh as a flower from its morning dew in spite of her cry the night before, had arisen to new opportunities for service. She was glad with the joyous forgetfulness of youth when she looked at David's happy face, and she thought no more of Kate's treatment of herself. David followed Kate with a true lover's eyes, and was never for more than a few moments out of her sight, though it seemed to Marcia that Kate did not try very hard to stay with him. When afternoon came, she dismissed him for what she called her beauty nap. Marcia was passing through the hall at the time, and she caught the tender look upon his face, as he touched her brow with reverent fingers and told her she had no need for that. Her eyes met Kate's as they were going up the stairs, and in spite of what Kate had said the night before, Marcia could not refrain from saying, Oh, Kate, how could you when he loves you so? You know you never take a nap in the daytime. You silly girl, said Kate pleasantly enough. Don't you know the less a man sees of one, the more he thinks of her? With this remark she closed and fastened her door after her. Marcia pondered these words of wisdom for some time, wondering whether Kate had really done it for that reason, or whether she did not care for the company of her lover. And why should it be so that a man loved you less because he saw you more? In her straightforward code, the more you loved persons, the more you desired to be in their company. Kate had issued from her beauty nap, with a feverish restlessness in her eyes, an averted face, and ink upon one finger. At supper she scarcely spoke, and when she did she laughed excitedly over little things. Her lover watched her with eyes of pride and ever-increasing wonder over her beauty, and Marcia, seeing the light in his face, watched for its answer in her sister's, and finding it not, was troubled. She watched them from her bedroom window as they walked down the path where she had gone the evening before, decorously side by side, Kate holding her light muslin frock back from the dew on the hedges. She wondered if it was because Kate had more respect for David than for Captain Leavenworth that she never seemed to treat him with as much familiarity. She did not take possession of him in the same sweet, imperious way. Marcia had not lighted her candle. The moon gave light enough, and she was very weary, so she undressed in the dim chamber and pondered upon the ways of the great world. Out there in the moonlight were those two who tomorrow would be one, and here was she alone. The world seemed all circling about that white chamber of hers, and echoing with her own consciousness of self and a loneliness she had never felt before. She wondered what it might be. Was it all sadness at parting with Kate, or was it the sadness over inevitable partings of all human relationships, and the all-aloneness of every living spirit? She stood for a moment, white-robed, beside her window, looking up into the full round moon, and wondering if God knew the ache of loneliness in his little human creature's souls that he had made, and whether he had ready something wherewith to satisfy. Then her meek soul bowed before the faith that was in her, and she knelt for her shy but reverent evening prayer. She heard the two lovers come in early and go upstairs, and she heard her father fastening up the doors and windows for the night. Then stillness gradually settled down, and she fell asleep. Later, in her dreams, there echoed the sound of hastening hoofs far down the deserted street and over the old covered bridge, but she took no note of any sound, and the weary household slept on. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The wedding was set for ten o'clock in the morning, after which there was to be a wedding breakfast, and the married couple were to start immediately for their new home. David had driven the day before with his own horse and chase to a town some twenty miles away, and there left his horse at a tavern to rest for the return trip 
for Kate would have it that they must leave the house in high style. So the finest equipage the town afforded had been secured to bear them on the first stage of their journey, with a portly negro driver and everything according to the custom of the greatest of the land. Nothing that Kate desired about the arrangements had been left undone. The household was fully astir by half-past four, for the family breakfast was to be at six promptly, that all might be cleared away and in readiness for the early arrival of the various aunts and uncles and cousins and friends who would drive over from the country round about. It would have been something Madame Schuyler would never have been able to get over if aught had been awry when a single uncle or aunt appeared upon the scene, or if there seemed to be the least evidence of fluster and nervousness. The rosy sunlight in the east was mixing the morning with fresher air, and new odors for the new day that was dawning when Marcia awoke. The sharp click of spoons and dishes, the voices of the maids, the sizzle, sputter, odor of frying ham and eggs, mingled with the early chorus of the birds, and calling to life of all living creatures, like an intrusion upon nature. It seemed not right to steal the morning's quiet hour thus rudely. The thought flitted through the girl's mind, and in an instant more the whole panorama of the day's excitement was before her, and she sprang from her bed. As if it had been her own wedding day instead of her sister's, she performed her dainty toilet, for though there was need for haste, she knew she would have no further time beyond a moment to slip on her best gown and smooth her hair. Marcia hurried downstairs just as the bell rang for breakfast, and David, coming down smiling behind her, patted her cheek and greeted her with, "'Well, little sister, you look as rested as if you had not done a thing all day yesterday.' She smiled shyly back at him, and her heart filled with pleasure over his new name for her. It sounded pleasantly from his happy lips. She was conscious of a gladness that he was to be so nearly related to her. She fancied how it would seem to say to Mary Ann, "'My brother-in-law says so-and-so. It would be grand to call such a man brother.' They were all seated at the table but Kate, and Squire Schuyler waited with pleasantly frowning brows to ask the blessing on the morning food. Kate was often late. She was the only member of the family who dared to be late to breakfast, and being the bride and the center of the occasion, more leniency was granted her this morning than ever before. Madame Schuyler waited until every one at the table was served to ham and eggs, coffee and bread and butter, and steaming griddle cakes, before she said, looking anxiously at the tall clock, "'Marcia, perhaps you better go up and see if your sister needs any help. She ought to be down by now. Uncle Joab and Aunt Polly will be sure to be here by eight. She must have overslept, but we made so much noise. She is surely awake by this time.' Marcia left her half-eaten breakfast and went slowly upstairs. She knew her sister would not welcome her, for she had often been sent on like errands before and the brunt of Kate's anger had fallen upon the hapless messenger, wearing itself out there so that she might descend all smiles to greet father and mother and smooth off the situation in a most harmonious manner. Marcia paused before the door to listen. Perhaps Kate was nearly ready, and her distasteful errand need not be performed. But though she held her breath to listen, no sound came from the closed door. Very softly she tried to lift the latch and peep in, Kate must still be asleep. It was not the first time Marcia had found that to be the case when sent to bring her sister. But the latch would not lift. The catch was firmly down from the inside. Marcia applied her eye to the keyhole, but could get no vision save a dim outline of the window on the other side of the room. She tapped gently once or twice and waited again, then called softly, "'Kate! Kate! Wake up! Breakfast is ready, and everybody is eating!' "'Aunt Polly and Uncle Joab will soon be here.' She repeated her tapping and calling, growing louder as she received no answer. Kate would often keep still to tease her thus. Surely, though, she would not do so upon her wedding morning. She called and called and shook the door, not daring, however, to make much of an uproar lest David should hear. She could not bear he should know the shortcomings of his bride. But at last she grew alarmed. Perhaps Kate was ill.' At any rate, whatever it was, it was time she was up. She worked for some minutes trying to loosen the catch that held the latch, but all to no purpose. She was forced to go downstairs and whisper to her stepmother the state of the case. Madame Schuyler, excusing herself from the table, went upstairs, purposeful decision in every line of her substantial body, determination in every sound of her footfall. 
Bride though she be, Kate would have meted out to her just dues this time. Company and a lover and the nearness of the wedding hour were things not to be trifled with even by a charming Kate. But Madam Schuyler returned in a short space of time puffing and panting, somewhat short of breath and color in her face. She looked troubled, and she interrupted the squire without waiting for him to finish his sentence to David. "'I cannot understand what is the matter with Kate,' she said, looking at her husband. "'She does not seem to be awake, and I cannot get her door open. She sleeps soundly, and I suppose the unusual excitement has made her very tired. But I should think she ought to hear my voice. Perhaps you better see if you can open the door.' There was studied calm in her voice, but her face belied her words. She was anxious lest Kate was playing one of her pranks. She knew Kate's careless, fun-loving ways. It was more to her that all things should move decently and in order than that Kate should even be perfectly well. But Marcia's white face behind her stepmother's ample shoulder showed a dread of something worse than a mere indisposition. David Spafford took alarm at once. He put down the silver syrup jug from which he had been pouring golden maple syrup on his cakes and pushed his chair back with a click. "'Perhaps she has fainted,' he said, and Marcia saw how deeply he was concerned. Father and lover both started upstairs, the father angry, the lover alarmed. The squire grumbled all the way up that Kate should sleep so late, but David said nothing. He waited anxiously behind while the squire worked with the door. Madam Schuyler and Marcia had followed them, and halting curiously just behind came the two maids. They all loved Miss Kate, and were deeply interested in the day's doings. They did not want anything to interfere with the well-planned pageant. The squire fumbled nervously with the latch, all the time calling upon his daughter to open the door, then wrathfully placed his solid shoulder and knee in just the right place, and with a groan and wrench the latch gave way, and the solid oak door swung open, precipitating the anxious group somewhat suddenly into the room. Almost immediately they all became aware that there was no one there. David had stood with averted eyes at first, but that second sense, which makes us aware without sight when others are near or absent, brought with it an unnamed anxiety. He looked wildly about. The bed had not been slept in. That they all saw at once. The room was in confusion, but perhaps not more than might have been expected when the occupant was about to leave on the morrow. There were pieces of paper and string upon the floor, and one or two garments lying about as if carelessly cast off in a hurry. David recognized the purple muslin frock Kate had worn the night before, and put out his hand to touch it as it lay across the foot of the bed, vainly reaching after her who was not there. They stood in silence, father, mother, sister, and lover, and took in every detail of the deserted room, then looked blankly into one another's white faces, and in the eyes of each a terrible question began to dawn. Where was she? Madame Schuyler recovered her senses first. With her sharp practical system she endeavored to find out the exact situation. Who saw her last? she asked sharply, looking from one to the other. Who saw her last? Has she been downstairs this morning? She looked straight at Marcia this time, but the girl shook her head. I went to bed last night before they came in, she said, looking questioningly at David, but a sudden remembrance and fear seized her heart. She turned away to the window to face it where they could not look at her. We came in early, said David, trying to keep the anxiety out of his voice as he remembered his well-beloved's good night. Surely, surely, nothing very dreadful could have happened just overnight and in her father's own house. He looked about again to see the natural, everyday little things that would help him drive away the thoughts of possible tragedy. Kate was tired. She said she was going to get up very early this morning and wash her face in the dew on the grass. He braved a smile and looked about on the troubled group. She must be out somewhere upon the place, he continued, gathering courage with the thought. She told me it was an old superstition. She has maybe wandered further than she intended, and perhaps got into some trouble. I'd better go and search for her. Is there any place near here where she would be likely to be? He turned to Marcia for help. But Kate would never delay so long, I'm sure, said the stepmother severely. She's not such a fool as to go traipsing through the wet grass before daylight for any nonsense. If it were Marcia now, you might expect anything. But Kate would be satisfied with the dew on the grass by the kitchen pump. I know Kate. Marcia's face crimsoned at her stepmother's words, but she turned her troubled eyes to David and tried to answer him. 
There are plenty of places, but Kate has never cared to go to them. I could go out and look everywhere. She started to go down, but as she passed the wide mahogany bureau, she saw a bit of folded paper lying under the corner of the pincushion. With a smothered exclamation, she went over and picked it up. It was addressed to David in Kate's handwriting, fine and even like copperplate. Without a word, Marcia handed it to him, and then stood back where the wide draperies of the window would shadow her. Madame Schuyler, with sudden keen prescience, took alarm. Noticing the two maids standing wide-mouthed in the hallway, she summoned her most commandatory tone, stepped into the hall, half-closing the door behind her, and cowed the two handmaidens under her glance. "'It is all right,' she said calmly. "'Miss Kate has left a note and will soon return. Go down and keep her breakfast warm, and not a word to a soul. Dolly, Debbie, do you understand? Not a word of this. Now hurry and do all that I told you before breakfast.' They went with downcast eyes and disappointed droops to their mouths, but she knew that not a word would pass their lips. They knew that if they disobeyed that command, they need never hope for favor more from Madame. Madame's word was law. She would be obeyed. Therefore, with remarkable discretion, they masked their wondering looks and did as they were bidden. So while the family stood in solemn conclave in Kate's room, the preparations for the wedding moved steadily forward below stairs and only two solemn maids, of all the helpers that morning, knew that a tragedy was hovering in the air and might burst about them. David had grasped for the letter eagerly, and fumbled it open with trembling hand, but as he read, the smile of expectation froze upon his lips, and his face grew ashen. He tottered, and grasped for the mantel-shelf to steady himself as he read further, but he did not seem to take in the meaning of what he read, the others waited breathless, a reasonable length of time, Madame Schuyler impatiently patient. She felt that long delay would be perilous to her arrangements. She ought to know the whole truth at once and be put in command of the situation. Marcia, with sorrowful face and drooping eyelashes, stood quiet behind the curtain, while over and over the echo of a horse's hoofs in a silent street and over a bridge sounded in her brain. She did not need to be told. She knew intuitively what had happened, and she dared not look at David. "'Well, what has she done with herself?' said the squire impatiently. He had not finished his plate of cakes, and now that there was word, he wanted to know it at once and go back to his breakfast. The sight of his daughter's handwriting relieved and reassured him. Some crazy thing she had done, of course, but then Kate had always done queer things, and probably would to the end of time.' She was a hussy to frighten them so, and he meant to tell her so when she returned, if it was her wedding day. But then Kate would be Kate, and his breakfast was getting cold. He had the horses to look after and orders to give to the hands before the early guests arrived. But David did not answer, and the sight of him was alarming. He stood as one stricken dumb all in a moment. He raised his eyes to the squires, pleading, pitiful. His face had grown strained and haggard. "'Speak out, man. Doesn't the letter tell?' said the squire imperiously. "'Where is the girl?' And this time David managed to say brokenly, "'She's gone!' And then his head dropped forward on his cold hand that rested on the mantel. Great beads of perspiration stood out upon his white forehead, and the letter fluttered gaily, coquettishly, to the floor, a reminder of the uncertain ways of its writer. The squire reached for it impatiently, and wiping his spectacles laboriously put them on and drew near to the window to read, his heavy brows lowering in a frown. But his wife did not need to read the letter, for she, like Marcia, had divined its purport, and already her able faculties were marshaled to face the predicament. The squire, with deepening frown, was studying his elder daughter's letter, scarce able to believe the evidence of his senses that a girl of his could be so heartless. Dear David, the letter ran, written as though in a hurry, done at the last moment, which indeed it was. I want you to forgive me for what I am doing. I know you will feel bad about it, but really I never was the right one for you. I am sure you thought me all too good, and I never could have stayed in a straight jacket. It would have killed me. I shall always consider you the best man in the world, and I like you better than anyone else, except Captain Leavenworth. I can't help it, you know, that I care more for him than anyone else, though I've tried. So I am going away tonight, and when you read this we shall have been married. 
You are so very good that I know you will forgive me and be glad I am happy. Don't think hardly of me, for I always did care a great deal for you. Your loving, Kate. It was characteristic of Kate that she demanded the love and loyalty of her betrayed lover to the bitter end, false and heartless though she had been. The coquette in her played with him even now, in the midst of the bitter pain she must have known she was inflicting. No word of contrition spoke she, but took her deed as one of her prerogatives, just as she had always taken everything she chose. She did not even spare him the loving salutation that had been her custom in her letters to him, but wrote herself down as she would have done the day before when all was fair and dear between them. She did not hint at any better day for David, or give him permission to forget her, but held him for all time as her own, as she had known she would by those words of hers. I like you better than anyone else except. Ah, that fatal except. Could any knife cut deeper and more ways? They sank into the young man's heart as he stood there those first few minutes and faced his trouble, his head bowed upon the mantelpiece. Meantime, Madame Schuyler's keen vision had spied another folded paper beside the pincushion. Smaller it was than the other, and evidently intended to be placed further out of sight. It was addressed to Kate's father, and her stepmother opened it and read, with hard pressure of her thin lips, slanted down at the corners and a steely look in her eyes. Was it possible that the girl, even in the midst of her treachery, had enjoyed with a sort of malicious glee the thought of her stepmother reading that note? and facing the horror of a wedding party with no bride? Knowing her stepmother's vast resources, did she not think that at last she had brought her to a situation to which she was unequal? There had always been this unseen, unspoken struggle for supremacy between them. Though it had been a friendly one, a sort of testing on the girl's part of the powers and expedience of the woman, with a kind of vast admiration mingled with amusement, but no fear for the stepmother who had been uniformly kind and loving toward her, and for whom she cared, perhaps as much as she could have cared for her own mother. The other note read, Dear Father, I am going away tonight to marry Captain Leavenworth. You wouldn't let me have him in the right way, so I had to take this. I tried very hard to forget him and get interested in David, but it was no use. You couldn't stop it. So now I hope you will see it the way we do and forgive us. We are going to Washington, and you can write us there and say you forgive us, and then we will come home. I know you will forgive us, Daddy dear. You know you always loved your little Kate, and you couldn't really want me to be unhappy. Please send my trunks to Washington. I've tacked the card with the address on the ends. Your loving little girl, Kate. There was a terrible stillness in the room, broken only by the crackling of paper as the notes were turned in the hands of their readers. Marcia felt as if centuries were passing. David's soul was pierced by one awful thought. He had no room for others. She was gone. Life was a blank for him, stretching out into interminable years. Of her treachery and false-heartedness in doing what she had done in the way she had done it, he had no time to take account. That would come later. Now he was trying to understand this one awful fact. Madame Schuyler handed the second note to her husband, and with set lips quickly skimmed through the other one. As she read, indignation rose within her, and a great desire to outwit everybody. If it had been possible to bring the erring girl back and make her face her disgraced wedding alone, Madame Schuyler would have been glad to do it. She knew that upon her would likely rest all the rearrangements, and her ready brain was already taking account of her servants and the number of messages that would have to be sent out to stop the guests from arriving. She waited impatiently for her husband to finish reading that she might consult with him as to the best message to send, but she was scarcely prepared for the burst of anger that came with the finish of the letters. The old man crushed his daughter's note in his hand and flung it from him. He had great respect and love for David, and the sight of him broken in grief the deed of his daughter roused in him a mighty indignation. His voice shook, but there was a deep note of command in it that made Madame Schuyler step aside and wait. The squire had arisen to the situation, and she recognized her lord and master. "'She must be brought back at once, at all costs,' he exclaimed. "'That rascal shall not outwit us. Fool that I was to trust him in the house. 
Tell the men to saddle the horses. They cannot have gone far yet, and there are not so many roads to Washington. We may yet overtake them, and married or unmarried, the hussy shall be here for her wedding. But David raised his head from the mantel shelf and steadied his voice. No, no, you must not do that, father. The appellative came from his lips almost tenderly, as if he had long considered the use of it with pleasure, and now he spoke it as a tender bond meant to comfort. The older man started, and his face softened. A flash of understanding and love passed between the two men. Remember, she has said she loves someone else. She can never be mine now. There was terrible sadness in the words as David spoke them, and his voice broke. Madame Schuyler turned away and took out her handkerchief, an article of apparel for which she seldom had use, except as it belonged to every well-ordered toilet. The father stood looking hopelessly at David and taking in the thought. Then he, too, bowed his head and groaned. And my daughter, my little Kate, has done it. Marcia covered her face with the curtains, and her tears fell fast. David went and stood beside the squire and touched his arm. Don't, he said pleadingly. You could not help it. It was not your fault. Do not take it so to heart. But it is my disgrace. I have brought up a child who could do it. I cannot escape from that. It is the most dishonorable thing a woman can do. And look how she has done it. Brought shame upon us all. Here we have a wedding on our hands, and little or no time to do anything. I have lived in honor all my life, and now to be disgraced by my own daughter. Marcia shuddered at her father's agony. She could not bear it longer. With a soft cry, she went to him and nestled her head against his breast unnoticed. Father, father, don't, she cried. But her father went on without seeming to see her. To be disgraced and deserted? and dishonored by my own child. Something must be done. Send the servants. Let the wedding be stopped. He looked at Madam, and she started toward the door to carry out his bidding, but he recalled her immediately. No, stay, he cried. It is too late to stop them all. Let them come. Let them be told. Let the disgrace rest upon the one to whom it belongs. Madam stopped in consternation. A wedding without a bride. Yet she knew it was a serious thing to try to dispute with her husband in that mood. She paused to consider. "'Oh, father!' exclaimed Marcia. "'We couldn't! Think of David!' Her words seemed to touch the right chord, for he turned toward the young man, intense tender pity in his face. "'Yes, David. We are forgetting David. We must do all we can to make it easier for you. You will be wanting to get away from us as quickly as possible.' How can we manage it for you? And where will you go? You will not want to go home just yet. He paused, a new agony of the knowledge of David's part coming to him. No, I cannot go home, said David hopelessly, a look of keen pain darting across his face. For the house will be all ready for her, and the table set. The friends will be coming in, and we are invited to dinner and tea everywhere. They will all be coming to the house, my friends, to welcome us. No, I cannot go home. Then he passed his hand over his forehead blindly and added in a stupefied tone, And yet I must, sometime, I must go home. End of chapter 4the room was very still as he spoke. Madam Schuyler forgot the coming guests and the preparations, in consternation over the thought of David and his sorrow. Marcia sobbed softly upon her father's breast, and her father involuntarily placed his arm about her as he stood in painful thought. "'It is terrible,' he murmured. "'Terrible! How could she bear to inflict such sorrow? She might have saved us the scorn of all of our friends. David, you must not go back alone. It must not be.' You must not bear that. There are lovely girls and plenty elsewhere. Find another one and marry her. Take your bride home with you, and no one in your home need be the wiser. Don't sorrow for that cruel girl of mine. Give her not the satisfaction of feeling that your life is broken. Take another. Any girl might be proud to go with you for the asking. Had I a dozen other daughters, you should have your pick of them, and one should go with you if you would condescend to choose another from the home where you have been so treacherously dealt with. But I have only this one little girl. 
She is but a child as yet and cannot compare with what you thought you had. I blame you not if you do not wish to wed another Schuyler, but if you will, she is yours, and she is a good girl. David, though she is but a child, speak up, child, and say if you will make amends for the wrong your sister has done. The room was so still one could almost hear the heartbeats. David had raised his head once more and was looking at Marcia. Sad and searching was his gaze, as if he fain would find the features of Kate in her face. Yet it seemed to Marcia, as she raised wide, tear-filled eyes from her father's breast where her head still lay, that he saw her not. He was looking beyond her and facing the home-going alone and the empty life that would follow. Her thoughts the last few days had matured her wonderfully. She understood and pitied, and her woman nature longed to give comfort. Yet she shrunk from going unasked. It was all terrible, this sudden situation thrust upon her, yet she felt a willing sacrifice if she but felt sure it was his wish. But David did not seem to know that he must speak. He waited, looking earnestly at her, through her, beyond her, to see if heaven would grant this small relief to his sufferings. At last Marcia summoned her voice. If David wishes, I will go. She spoke the words solemnly, her eyes lifted slightly above him, as if she were speaking to another one higher than he. It was like an answer to a call from God. It had come to Marcia this way. It seemed to leave her no room for drawing back, if indeed she had wished to do so. Other considerations were not present. There was just the one great desire in her heart to make amends in some measure for the wrong that had been done. She felt almost responsible for it, a family responsibility. She seemed to feel the shame and pain as her father was feeling it. She would step into the empty place that Kate had left and fill it as far as she could. Her only fear was that she was not acceptable, not worthy to fill so high a place. She trembled over it, yet she could not hold back from the high calling. It was so she stood in a kind of sorrowful exultation waiting for David. Her eyes lowered again, looking at him through the lashes and pleading for recognition. She did not feel that she was pleading for anything for herself, only for the chance to help him. Her voice had broken the spell. David looked down upon her kindly, a pleasant light of gratitude flashing through the sternness and sorrow in his face. Here was comradeship and trouble, and his voice recognized it as he said, Child, you are good to me, and I thank you. I will try to make you happy if you will go with me, and I am sure your going will be a comfort in many ways, but I would not have you go unwillingly. There was a dull ache in Marcia's heart, its cause she could not understand, but she was conscious of a gladness that she was not counted unworthy to be accepted, young though she was, and child though he called her. His tone had been kindness itself, the gentle kindliness that had won her childish sisterly love when first he began to visit her sister. She had that answer of his to remember for many a long day, and to live upon, when questionings and loneliness came upon her. But she raised her face to her father now and said, I will go, father. The squire stooped and kissed his little girl for the last time. Perhaps he realized that from this time forth she would be a little girl no longer, and that he would never look into those child eyes of hers again, unclouded with the sorrows of life, and filled only with the wonder pictures of a rosy future. She seemed to him and to herself to be renouncing her own life forever, and to be taking up one of sacrificial penitence for her sister's wrongdoing. The father then took Marcia's hand and placed it in David's, and the betrothal was complete. Madame Schuyler, whose reign for the time was set aside, stood silent, half disapproving, yet not interfering. Her conscience told her that this wholesale disposal of Marcia was against nature. The new arrangement was a relief to her in many ways, and would make the solution of the day less trying for every one. But she was a woman, and knew a woman's heart. Marcia was not having her chance in life as her sister had had, as every woman had a right to have. Then her face hardened. How had Kate used her chances? Perhaps it was better for Marcia to be well placed in life before she grew headstrong enough to make a fool of herself as Kate had done. David would be good to her, that was certain. One could not look at the strong, pleasant lines of his well-cut mouth and chin and not be sure of that. Perhaps it was all for the best. At least it was not her doing, and it was only the night before that she had been looking at Marcia and worrying because she was growing into a woman so fast. 
Now she would be relieved of that care and could take her ease and enjoy life until her own children were grown up. But the voice of her husband aroused her to the present. "'Let the wedding go on as planned, Sarah, and no one need know until the ceremony is over except the minister. I myself will go and tell the minister. There will need to be but a change of names.' But, said the madam with housewifely alarm as the suddenness of the whole thing flashed over her, Marcia is not ready. She has no suitable clothes for her wedding. Not ready? No clothes? said the squire, now thoroughly irritated over this trivial objection, as a fly will sometimes ruffle the temper of a man who has kept calm under fire of an enemy. And where are all the clothes that have been making these weeks and months past? What more preparation does she need? Did the hussy take her wedding things with her? What's in this trunk? But those are Kate's things, father, said Marcia in gentle explanation. Kate would be very angry if I took her things. They were made for her, you know. And what if they were made for her? answered the father, very angry now at Kate. You are near of a size. What will do for one is good enough for the other. And Kate may be angry and get over it, for not one rag of it all will she get, nor a penny of my money will ever go to her again. She is no daughter of mine from henceforth. That rascal has beaten me and stolen my daughter, but he gets a dowerless lass. Not a penny will ever go from the Schuyler estate into his pocket, and no trunk will ever travel from here to Washington for that heartless girl. I forbid it. Let her feel some of the sorrow she has inflicted upon others more innocent. I forbid it. Do you hear? He brought his fist down upon the solid mahogany bureau until the prisms on a candle stand in front of the mirror jangled discordantly. Oh, father! gasped Marcia and turned with terror to her stepmother. But David stood with his back toward the rest, looking out of the window. He had forgotten them all. Madam Schuyler was now in command again. For once the squire had anticipated his wife, and the next move had been planned without her help, but it was as she would have it. Her face had lost its consternation and beamed with satisfaction beneath its mask of grave perplexity. She could not help it that she was glad to have the terrible ordeal of a wedding without a bride changed into something less formidable. At least the country round about could not pity, for who was to say but that David was as well suited with one sister as with the other? And Marcia was a good girl. Doubtless she would grow into a good wife, far more suitable for so good and steady a man as David than pretty, imperious Kate. Madame Schuyler took her place of command once more and began to issue her orders. Come then, Marcia, we have no time to waste. It is all right, as your father has said. Kate's things will fit you nicely, and you must go at once and put everything in readiness. You will want all your time to dress and pack a few things and get calm. Go to your room right away and pick up anything you will want to take with you, and I'll go down and see that Phoebe takes your place and then come back. David and the squire went out like two men who had suddenly grown old and had not the strength to walk rapidly. No one thought any more of breakfast. It was half-past seven by the old tall clock that stood upon the stair landing. It would not be long before Aunt Polly and Uncle Joab would be driving up to the door. Straight ahead went the preparations, just as if nothing had happened, and if Mistress Kate Leavenworth could have looked into her old room an hour after the discovery of her flight, she would have been astonished beyond measure. Up in her own room stood poor bewildered Marcia, she looked about upon her little white bed and thought she would never likely sleep in it again. She looked out of the small paned window with its view of distant hill and river and thought she was bidding it good-bye forever. She went toward her closet and put out her hand to choose what she would take with her, and her heart sank. There hung the faded old ginghams, short and scant and scorned but yesterday, yet her heart wildly clung to them. Almost would she have put one on and gone back to her happy, carefree school life. The thought of the new life frightened her. She must give up her girlhood all at once. She might not keep a vestige of it, for that would betray David. She must be Kate from morning to evening. Like a sword thrust came the remembrance that she had envied Kate, and God had given her the punishment of being Kate in very truth. Only there was this great difference. She was not the chosen one, and Kate had been. She must bear about forever in her heart the thought of Kate's sin. The voice of her stepmother drew nearer and warned her that her time alone was almost over, and out on the lawn she could hear the voices of Uncle Joab and Aunt Polly who had just arrived. 
She dropped upon her knees for one brief moment and let her young soul pour itself out in one great cry of distress to God, a cry without words borne only on the breath of a sob. Then she arose, hastily dashed cold water in her face, and dried away the traces of tears. There was no more time to think. With hurried hand she began to gather a few trifles together from closet and drawer. One last lingering look she took about her room as she left it, her arms filled with the things she had hastily culled from among her own. Then she shut the door quickly and went down the hall to her sister's room to enter upon her new life. She was literally putting off herself and putting on a new being, as far as it was possible to do so outwardly. There on the bed lay the bridal outfit. Madam Schuyler had just brought it from the spare room, that there might be no more going back and forth through the halls to excite suspicion. She was determined that there should be no excitement or demonstration or opportunity for gossip among the guests, at least, until the ceremony was over. She had satisfied herself that not a soul outside the family, save the two maids, suspected that aught was the matter, and she felt sure of their silence. Kate had taken very little with her, evidently fearing to excite suspicion, and having no doubt that her father would relent and send all her trousseau as she had requested in her letter. For once Mistress Kate had forgotten her fineries, and made good her escape with but two frocks and a few other necessaries in a small handbag. Madam Schuyler was relieved to the point of genuine cheerfulness over this, despite the cloud of tragedy that hung over the day. She began to talk to Marcia as if she had been Kate, as she smoothed down this and that article and laid them back in the trunk, telling how the blue gown would be the best for church, and the green silk for going out to very fine places, to tea drinkings and the like, and how she must always be sure to wear the cream undersleeves with the Irish point lace with her silk gown, as they set it off to perfection. She recalled, too, how little experience Marcia had had in the ways of the world, and all the while the girl was being dressed in the dainty bridal garments, she gave her careful instructions in the art of being a success in society, until Marcia felt that the green fields and the fences and trees to climb and the excursions after blackberries and all the joyful merry-makings of the boys and girls were receding far from her. She could even welcome Hanford Weston as a playfellow in her new future, if thereby a little fresh air and freedom of her girlhood might be left. Nevertheless, there gradually came over her an elation of excitement, the feel of the dainty garments, the delicate embroidery, the excitement lest the white slippers would not fit her, the difficulty of making her hair stay up in just Kate's style, for her stepmother insisted that she must dress it exactly like Kate's and make herself look as nearly as possible as Kate would have looked. All drove sadness from her mind, and she began to taste a little delight in the pretty clothes, the great occasion, and her own importance. The vision in the looking-glass, too, told her that her own face was winsome, and the new array not unbecoming. Something of this she had seen the night before, when she put on her new chintz. Now the change was complete, as she stood in the white satin and lace with the string of seed pearls that had been her mother's tied about her soft white throat. She thought about the tradition of the pearls that Kate's girlfriends had laughingly reminded her of a few days before when they were looking at the bridal garments. They had said that each pearl a bride wore meant a tear she would shed. She wondered if Kate had escaped the tears with the pearls and left them for her. She was ready at last, even to the veil that had been her mother's, and her mother's mother's before her. It fell in its rich folds, yellowed by age, from her head to her feet, with its creamy frost-work of rarest handiwork, transforming the girl into a woman and a bride. Madame Schuyler arranged and rearranged the folds, and finally stood back to look with half-closed eyes at the effect, deciding that very few would notice that the bride was other than they had expected until the ceremony was over and the veil thrown back. The sisters had never looked alike, yet there was a general family resemblance that was now accentuated by the dress. Perhaps only those nearest would notice that it was Marcia instead of Kate. At least the guests would have the good grace to keep their wonderment to themselves until the ceremony was over. Then Marcia was left to herself with trembling hands and wildly throbbing heart. What would Mary Ann think? What would all the girls and boys think? Some of them would be there, and others would be standing along the shady streets to watch the progress of the carriage as it drove away. And they would see her going away instead of Kate. Perhaps they would think it all a great joke, and that she had been going to be married all the time and not Kate. 
but no, the truth would soon come out. People would not be astonished at anything Kate did. They would only say it was just what they had all along expected of her, and pity her father, and pity her perhaps. But they would look at her and admire her, and for once she would be the center of attraction. The pink of pride swelled up into her cheeks, and then realizing what she was thinking, she crushed the feeling down. How could she think of such things when Kate had done such a dreadful thing, and David was suffering so terribly? Here was she actually enjoying and delighting in the thought of being in Kate's place. Oh, she was wicked, wicked! She must not be happy for a moment in what was Kate's shame and David's sorrow. Of her future with David she did not now think. It was of the pageant of the day that her thoughts were full. If the days and weeks and months that were to follow came into her mind at all, between the other things, it was always that she was to care for David and to help him, and that she would have to grow up quickly and remember all the hard housewifely things her stepmother had taught her and try to order his house well. But that troubled her not at all at present. She was more concerned with the ceremony and the many eyes that would be turned upon her. It was a relief when a tap came on the door and the dear old minister entered. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 He stood a moment by the door, looking at her half-startled. Then he came over beside her, put his hands upon her shoulders, looking down into her upturned, veiled face. "'My child,' he said tenderly, "'my little Marcia, is this you? I did not know you in all this beautiful dress. You look as your own mother looked when she was married. I remember perfectly as if it were but yesterday, her face as she stood by your father's side. I was but a young man then, you know, and it was my first wedding in my new church, so you see I could not forget it. Your mother was a beautiful woman, Marcia and you are like her both in face and life. The tears came into Marcia's eyes, and her lips trembled. Are you sure, child, went on the gentle voice of the old man, that you understand what a solemn thing you are doing? It is not a light thing to give yourself in marriage to any man. You are so young yet. Are you doing this thing quite willingly, little girl? Are you sure? Your father is a good man and a dear old friend of mine, but I know what has happened has been a terrible blow to him, and a great humiliation. It has perhaps unnerved his judgment for the time. No one should have brought pressure to bear upon a child like you to make you marry against your will. Are you sure it is all right, dear? Oh, yes, sir, Marcia raised her tear-filled eyes. I am doing it quite of myself. No one has made me. I was glad I might. It was so dreadful for David." "'But, child, do you love him?' the old minister said, searching her face closely. Marcia's eyes shone out radiant and childlike through her tears. "'Oh, yes, sir, I love him, of course. No one could help loving David.' There was a tap at the door, and the squire entered. With a sigh the minister turned away, but there was trouble in his heart. The love of the girl had been all too frankly confessed. It was not as he would have had things for a daughter of his, but it could not be helped, of course, and he had no right to interfere. He would like to speak to David, but David had not come out of his room yet. When he did, there was but a moment for them alone, and all he had opportunity to say was, Mr. Spafford, you will be good to the little girl, and remember she is but a child. She has been dear to us all. David looked at him wonderingly, earnestly in reply. I will do all in my power to make her happy, he said. The hour had come, and all things, just as Madame Schuyler had planned, were ready. The minister took his place, and the impatient bridesmaids were in a flutter, wondering why Kate did not call them in to see her. Slowly, with measured step, as if she had practiced many times, Marcia the maiden walked down the hall on her father's arm. He was bowed with his trouble, and his face bore marks of the sudden calamity that had befallen his house. But the watching guests thought it was for sorrow at giving up his lovely Kate, and they said one to another, How much he loved her! The girl's face drooped with gentle gravity. She scarcely felt the presence of the guests she had so much dreaded, for to her the ceremony was holy. She was giving herself as a sacrifice for the sin of her sister. She was too young and inexperienced to know all that would be thought and said as soon as the company understood. 
She also felt secure behind that film of lace. It seemed impossible that they could know her. So softly and so mistily it shut her in from the world. It was like a kind of moving house about her, a protection from all eyes. So sheltered she might go through the ceremony with composure. As yet she had not begun to dread the afterward. The hall was wide through which she passed, and the day was bright, but the windows were so shadowed by the waiting bridesmaids that the light did not fall in full glare upon her, and it was not strange they did not know her at once. She heard their smothered exclamations of wonder and admiration, and one, Kate's dearest friend, whispered softly behind her, "'Oh, Kate, why did you keep us waiting, you sly girl? How lovely you are! You look like an angel straight from heaven!' There were other whispered words, which Marcia heard sadly. They gave her no pleasure. The words were for Kate, not her. What would they say when they knew all? There was David in the distance waiting for her. How fine he looked in his wedding clothes. How proud Kate might have been of him. How pitiful was his white face. He had summoned his courage and put on a mask of happiness for the eyes of those who saw him, but it could not deceive the heart of Marcia. Surely not since the days when Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and then lifted the bridal veil to look upon the face of her sister Leah, walked their sadder bridegroom on this earth than David Spafford walked that day. Down the stairs and through the wide hall they came, Marcia not daring to look up, yet seeing familiar glimpses as she passed, that green plaid silk lap at one side of the parlor door, in which lay two nervous little hands and a neatly folded pocket handkerchief, belonged to Sabrina Bates, she knew, and the round lace collar a little farther on, fastened by the brooch with a colored daguerreotype, encircled by a braid of faded brown hair under glass, must be about the neck of Aunt Polly. There was not another brooch like that in New York State, Marcia felt sure. Beyond were Uncle Joab's small, meek Sunday boots towing in, and next were little feet covered by white stockings and slippers fastened with cross black ribbons, some child's, not Harriet. Marcia dared not raise her eyes to identify them now. She must fix her mind upon the great things before her. She wondered at herself for noticing such trivial things when she was walking up to the presence of the great God, and there before her stood the minister with his open book. Now, at last, with the most of the audience behind her, shut in by the film of lace, she could raise her eyes to the minister's familiar face, take David's arm without letting her hand tremble much, and listen to the solemn words read out to her. For her alone they seemed to be read. David's heart she knew was crushed, and it was only a form for him. She must take double vows upon her for the sake of the wrong done to him. So she listened. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together. How the words thrilled her. In the sight of God, and in the presence of this company, to join together this man and woman in the bonds of holy matrimony. A deathly stillness rested upon the room, and the painful throbbing of her heart was all the little bride could hear. She was glad she might look straight into the dear face of the old minister. Had her mother felt this way when she was being married? Did her stepmother understand it? Yes, she must, in part at least, for she had bent and kissed her most tenderly upon the brow just before leaving her, a most unusually sentimental thing for her to do. It touched Marcia deeply, though she was fond of her stepmother at all times. She waited breathless with drooped eyes while the minister demanded, If any man can show just cause why they may not be lawfully joined together, let him now declare it, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. What if someone should recognize her, and thinking she had usurped Kate's place, speak out and stop the marriage? How would David feel? And she? She would sink to the floor. Oh, did they, any of them, know? How she wished she dared raise her eyes to look about and see. But she must not. She must listen. She must shake off these worldly thoughts. She was not hearing for idle thinking. It was a solemn, holy vow she was taking upon herself for life. She brought herself sharply back to the ceremony. It was to David the minister was talking now. Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? It was hard to make David promise that, when his heart belonged to Kate. She wondered that his voice could be so steady when it said, I will, and the white glove of Kate's, 
which was just a trifle large for her, trembled on David's arm as the minister next turned to her. "'Wilt thou, Marcia? Ah, it was out now, and the sharp rustle of silk and stiff linen showed that all the company were aware at last who was the bride. But the minister went steadily on. He cared not what the listening assembly thought. He was talking earnestly to his little friend Marcia. "'Have this man to be thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony. Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health?' The words of the pledge went on. It was not hard. The girl felt she could do all that. She was relieved to find it no more terrible, and to know that she was no longer acting a lie. They all knew who she was now. She held up her flower-like head and answered in her clear voice that made her few schoolmates present gasp with admiration. I will. And the dear old minister's wife, sitting sweet and dove-like in her soft gray poplin, fine white kerchief and cap of book muslin, smiled to herself at the music and Marcia's voice and nodded approval. She felt that all was well with her little friend. They waited, those astonished people, till the ceremony was concluded and the prayer over, and then they broke forth. There had been lifted brows and looks passing from one to another of question, of disclaiming any knowledge in the matter, and just as soon as the minister turned and took the bride's hand to congratulate her, the heads bent together behind fans, and the soft buzz of whispers began. "'What does it mean? Where is Kate? She isn't in the room!' Did he change his mind at the last minute? How old is Marcia? Mercy me, nothing but a child, are you sure? Why, my Mary Ann is older than that by three months, and she's no more able to become mistress of a home than a nine days old kitten. Are you sure it's Marcia? Didn't the minister make a mistake in the name? It looked to me like Kate. Look again, she's put her veil back. No, it can't be. Yes, it is. No, it looks like Kate, her hair is done the same, but no, Kate never had such a sweet, innocent look at, as that. Why, when she was a child, her face always had a sharpness to it. Look at Marcia's eyes, poor lamb. I don't see how her father could bear it, and she's so young. But Kate, where can she be? What has happened? You don't say. Yes, I did see that captain about again last week or so. Do you believe it? Surely she never would. Who told you? Was he sure? But Mariah and Janet are bridesmaids, and they didn't see any signs of anything. They were over here yesterday. Yes, Kate showed them everything and planned how they would all walk in. No, she didn't do anything queer, for Janet would have mentioned it. Janet always sees everything. Well, they say he's a good man, and Marshall will be well provided for. Madam Schuyler will be relieved about that. Marcia can't ever lead her the dance Kate has among the young men. How white he looks. Do you suppose he loves her? What on earth can it all mean? Do you suppose Kate feels bad? Where is she anyway? Wouldn't she come down? Well, if twas his choosing, it serves her right. She's too much of a flirt for a good man, and maybe he found her out. She's probably got just what she deserves, and I think Marcia'll make a good little wife. She always was a quiet grown-up child, and Madam Schuyler has trained her well. But what will Kate do now? Hush, they are coming this way. How do you suppose we can find out? Go ask Cousin Janet. Perhaps they've told her. Or Aunt Polly. Surely she knows. But Aunt Polly sat with pursed lips of disapproval. She had not been told, and it was her prerogative to know everything. She always made a point of being on hand early at all funerals and weddings, especially in the family circle, and learning the utmost details which she dispensed at her discretion to latecomers in fine sepulchral whispers. Now she sat silent, disgraced, unable to explain a thing. It was unhandsome of Sarah Schuyler, she felt, though no more than she might have expected of her, she told herself. She had never liked her. Well, wait until her opportunity came. If they did not wish her to say the truth, she must say something." She could at least tell what she thought, and what more natural than to let it be known that Sarah Schuyler had always held a dislike for Marcia, and to suggest that it was likely she was glad to get her off her hands. 
Aunt Polly meant to find a trail somewhere, no matter how many times they threw her off the scent. Meantime, for Marcia, the sun seemed to have shined out once more with something of its old brightness. The terrible deed of self-renunciation was over, and familiar faces actually were smiling upon her and wishing her joy. She felt the flutter of her heart in her throat beneath the string of pearls, and wondered if, after all, she might hope for a little happiness of her own. She could climb no more fences, nor wade in gurgling brooks, but might there not be other happy things as good? A little touch of the pride of life had settled upon her. The relatives were coming with pleasant words and kisses. The blushes upon her cheeks were growing deeper. She almost forgot David in the pretty excitement. A few of her girl friends ventured shyly near, as one might look at a mate suddenly and unexpectedly translated into eternal bliss. They put out cold fingers in salute with distant, stiff phrases belonging to a grown-up world. Not one of them save Mary Ann dared recognize their former bond of playmates. Mary Ann leaned down and whispered with a giggle, "'Say, you didn't need to envy Kate, did you? My, ain't you in clover? Say, Marsh,' wistfully, "'do invite me for a visit sometime, won't you?' Now Mary Ann was not quite on a par with the Schuyler socially, and had it not been for a distant mutual relative, she would not have been asked to the wedding. Marcia never liked her very much, but now, with the uncertain dim future, it seemed pleasant and homelike to think of a visit from Mary Ann, and she nodded and said childishly, "'Sometime, Mary Ann, if I can.' Mary Ann squeezed her hand, kissed her, blushed and giggled herself out of the way of the next comer." They went out to the dining room and sat around the long table. It was Marcia's timid hand that cut the bride cake, and all the room full watched her. Seeing the pretty color come and go in her excited cheeks, they wondered that they had never noticed before how beautiful Marcia was growing. A handsome couple they would make, and they looked from Marcia to David and back again, wondering and trying to fathom the mystery. It was gradually stealing about the company, the truth about Kate and Captain Leavenworth, the minister had told it in his sad and gentle way, just the facts, no gossip. Naturally, everyone was bristling with questions, but not much could be got from the minister. "'I really do not know,' he would say in his courteous, old-worldly way, and few dared ask further. Perhaps the minister, wise by reason of much experience, had taken care to ask as few questions as possible himself, and not to know too much before undertaking this task for his old friend the squire. And so Kate's marriage went into the annals of the village, at least so far as that morning was concerned, quietly, and with little exclamation before the family. The squire and his wife controlled their faces wonderfully. There was an austerity about the squire as he talked with his friends that was new to his pleasant face. But Madame conversed with her usual placid self-poise, and never gave cause for conjecture as to her true feelings. There were some who dared to offer their surprised condolences. To such the stepmother replied that, of course, the outcome of events had been a sore trial to the squire and all of them, but they were delighted at the happy arrangement that had been made. She glanced contentedly toward the child bride. It was a revelation to the whole village that Marcia had grown up and was so handsome. Dismay filled the breasts of the village gossips. They had been defrauded. Here was a fine scandal which they had failed to discover in time and spread abroad in its due course. Everybody was shy of speaking to the bride. She sat in her lovely finery like some wild rose caught as a sacrifice. Yet everyone admitted that she might have done far worse. David was a good man, with prospects far beyond most young men of his time. Moreover, he was known to have a brilliant mind, and the career he had chosen, that of journalism, in which he was already making his mark, was one that promised to be lucrative as well as influential. It was all very hurried at the last. Madame Schuyler and Dolly the maid helped her off with the satin and lace finery, and she was soon out of her bridal attire and struggling with the intricacies of Kate's traveling costume. Marcia was not Marcia any longer, but Mrs. David Spafford. She had been made to feel the new name almost at once, and it gave her a sense of masquerading pleasant enough for the time being, but with a dim foreboding of nameless dread and emptiness for the future, like all masquerading which must end sometime. 
and when the mask is taken off, how sad if one is not to find one's real self again, or worse still if one may never remove the mask, but must grow to it and be it from the soul. All this Marcia felt but dimly, of course, for she was young and light-hearted naturally, and the excitement and pretty things about her could not but be pleasant. To have Kate's friends stand about her, half shyly trying to joke with her as they might have done with Kate, to feel their admiring glances and half-envious references to her handsome husband, almost intoxicated her for the moment. Her cheeks grew rosier as she tied on Kate's pretty poke bonnet, whose nodding blue flowers had been brought over from Paris by a friend of Kate's. It seemed a shame that Kate should not have her things after all. The pleasure died out of Marcia's eyes as she carefully looped the soft blue ribbons under her round chin and drew on Kate's long gloves. There was no denying the fact that Kate's outfit was becoming to Marcia, for she had that complexion that looks well with any color under the sun, though in blue she was not at her best. When Marcia was ready, she stood back from the little looking-glass with a frightened, half-childish gaze about the room. Now that the last minute was come, there was no one to understand Marcia's feelings nor help her. Even the girls were merely standing there waiting to say the last formal farewell that they might be free to burst into an astonished chatter of exclamations over Kate's romantic disappearance. They were Kate's friends, not Marcia's, and they were bidding Kate's clothes goodbye for want of the original bride. Marcia's friends were too young and too shy to do more than stand back in awe and gaze at their mate so suddenly promoted to a life which but yesterday had seemed years away for any of them. So Marcia walked alone down the hall. Yet, no, not all the way alone. A little wrinkled hand was laid upon her gloved one, and a little old lady, her true friend, the minister's wife, walked down the stairs with the bride arm in arm. Marcia's heart fluttered back to warmth again and was glad for her friend, yet all she had said was, My dear, but there was that in her touch and the tone of her gentle voice that comforted Marcia. She stood at the edge of the steps with her white hair shining in the morning, her kind-faced husband just behind her during all the farewell, and Marcia felt happier because of her motherly presence. The guests were all out on the piazza in the gorgeousness of the summer morning. David stood on the flagging below the step, beside the open coach door, a carriage lap-robe over his arm and his hat on, ready. He was talking with the squire. Everyone was looking at them, and they were entirely conscious of the fact. They laughed and talked with studied pleasantness, though there seemed to be an undertone of sadness that the most obtuse guest could not fail to detect. Harriet, as a small flower girl, stood upon the broad low step, ready to fling posies before the bride as she stepped into the coach. The little boys, to whom a wedding merely meant a delightful increase of opportunities, stood behind a pillar munching cake, more of which protruded from their bulging pockets. Marcia, with a lump in her throat that threatened tears, slipped behind the people, caught the two little stepbrothers in her arms, and smothered them with kisses amid their loud protestations and the laughter of those who stood about. But the little skirmish had served to hide the tears, and the bride came back most decorously to where her stepmother stood awaiting her with a smile of complacent, almost completed, duty upon her face. She wore the sense of having carried off a trying situation in a most credible manner, and she knew she had won the respect and awe of every matron present thereby. That was a great deal to Madame Schuyler. The stepmother's arms were around her, and Marcia remembered how kindly they had felt when they first clasped her little body years ago, and she had been kissed and told to be a good little girl. She had always liked her stepmother, and now as she came to say good-bye to the only mother she had ever known, who had been a true mother to her in many ways, her young heart almost gave way, and she longed to hide in that ample bosom and stay under the wing of one who had so ably led her thus far along the path of life. Perhaps Madame Schuyler felt the clinging of the girl's arms about her, and perchance her heart rebuked her that she had let so young and inexperienced a girl go out to the cares of life all of a sudden in this way. At least she stooped and kissed Marcia again and whispered, You have been a good girl, Marcia. Afterwards, Marcia cherished that sentence among memory's dearest treasures. It seemed as though it meant that she had fulfilled her stepmother's first command, given on the night when her father brought home their new mother. Then the flowers were thrown upon the pavement to make it bright for the bride. She was handed into the coach behind the white-haired negro coachman, 
and by his side Kate's fine new hair trunk. Ah, that was a bitter touch. Kate's trunk, Kate's things, Kate's husband. If it had only been her own little moth-eaten trunk that had belonged to her mother and filled with her own things, and if he had only been her own husband. Yet she wanted no other than David, only if he could have been her David. Then Madame Schuyler, her heart still troubled about Marcia, stepped down and whispered, David, you will remember she is young. You will deal gently with her. Gravely David bent his head and answered, I will remember. She shall not be troubled. I will care for her as I would care for my own sister. And Madame Schuyler turned away half satisfied. After all, was that what woman wanted? Would she have been satisfied to have been cared for as a sister? Then gravely, with his eyes half unseeing her, the father kissed his daughter good-bye. David got into the coach, the door was slammed shut, and the white horses arched their necks and stepped away amid a shower of rice and slippers. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven For some distance the way was lined with people they knew, servants and negroes, standing about the driveway and outside the fence, people of the village grouped along the sidewalk, everybody out upon their doorsteps to watch the coach go by, and to all the face of the bride was a puzzle and a surprise. They half expected to see another coach coming with the other bride behind. Marcia nodded brightly to those she knew, and threw flowers from the great nosegay that had been put upon her lap by Harriet. She felt for a few minutes like a girl in a fairy tale, riding in this fine coach in grand attire. She stole a look at David. He certainly looked like a prince, but gravity was already settling about his mouth. Would he always look so now, she wondered? Would he never laugh and joke again as he used to do? Could she manage to make him happy sometimes for a little while and help him to forget? Down through the village they passed, in front of the store and post office where Marcia had bought her frock but three days before, and they turned up the road she had come with Mary Ann. How long ago that seemed! How light her heart was then and how young! All life was before her with its delightful possibilities. Now it seemed to have closed for her, and she was someone else. A great ache came upon her heart. For a moment she longed to jump down and run away from the coach and David and the new clothes that were not hers, away from the new life that had been planned for someone else which she must live now. She must always be a woman, never a girl any more. Out past Granny McVane's they drove, the old lady sitting upon her front porch knitting endless stockings. She stared mildly, unrecognizingly, at Marcia, and paused in her rocking to crane her neck after the coach. The tall corn rustled and waved green arms to them as they passed, and the cows looked up munching from the pasture in mild surprise at the turnout. The little coach dog stepped aside from the road to give them a bark as he passed, and then pattered and pattered his tiny feet to catch up. The old schoolhouse came in sight with its worn playground and dejected summer air, and Marcia's eyes searched out the window where she used to sit to eat her lunch in winters, and the tree under which she used to sit in summers, and the path by which she and Mary Ann used to wander down to the brook, or go in search of butternuts, even the old doorknob that her hand would probably never grasp again. She searched them all out and bade them good-bye with her eyes. Then once she turned a little to see if she could catch a glimpse of the old blackboard through the window where she and Susanna Brown and Miller Thompson used to do arithmetic examples. The dust of the coach, or the bees in the sunshine, or something in her eyes, blurred her vision. She could only see a long slant ray of a sunbeam crossing the wall where she knew it must be. Then the road wound around through a maple grove, and the school was lost to view. They passed the south meadow belonging to the Westons, and Hanford was plowing. Marcia could see him stop to wipe the perspiration from his brow, and her heart warmed even to this boy admirer, now that she was going from him forever. Hanford had caught sight of the coach, and he turned to watch it, thinking to see Kate sitting in the bride's place. He wondered if the bride would notice him, and turned a deeper red under his heavy coat of tan. And the bride did notice him. 
She smiled the sweetest smile the boy had ever seen upon her face, the smile he had dreamed of as he thought of her, at night standing under the stars all alone by his father's gatepost whittling the crossbar of the gate. For a moment he forgot that it was the bridal party passing, forgot the stern-faced bridegroom, and saw only Marcia, his girl love. His heart stood still, and a bright light of response filled his eyes. He took off his wide straw hat and bowed her reverence. He would have called to her and tried three times, but his dry throat gave forth no utterance, and when he looked again the coach was passed, and only the flutter of a white handkerchief came back to him and told him the beginning of the truth. Then the poor boy's face grew white, yes, white, and stricken under the tan, and he tottered to the roadside and sat down with his face in his hands to try and comprehend what it might mean, while the old horse dragged the plow whither he would in search of a bite of tender grass. What could it mean? And why did Marcia occupy that place beside the stranger, obviously the bridegroom? Was she going on a visit? He had heard of no such plan. Where was her sister? Would there be another coach presently, and was this man then not the bridegroom, but merely a friend of the family? Of course that must be it. He got up and staggered to the fence to look down the road, but no one came by save the jogging old gray and carry-all with Aunt Polly grim and offended, and Uncle Joab meek and depressed beside her. Could he have missed the bridal carriage when he was at the other end of the lot? Could they have gone another way? He had a half a mind to call to Uncle Joab to inquire, only he was a timid boy, and shrank back until it was too late. But why had Marcia, as she rode away, wafted that strange farewell that had in it the familiarity of the final? And why did he feel so strange and weak in his knees? Marcia was to help his mother next week at the quilting bee. She had not gone away to stay, of course. He got up and tried to whistle and turn the furrows evenly as before. But his heart was heavy, and, try as he would, he could not understand the feeling that kept telling him Marcia was gone, out of his life forever. At last his day's work was done, and he could hasten to the house. Without waiting for his supper, he slicked up, as he called it, and went at once to the village, where he learned the bitter truth. It was Marianne who told him. Marianne the plain, the awkward, who secretly admired Hanford Weston, as she might have admired an angel, and who as little expected him to speak to her as if he had been one. Mary Ann stood by her front gate in the dusk of the summer evening, the halo of her unusual wedding finery upon her, for she had taken advantage of being dressed up to make two or three visits since the wedding, and so prolong the holiday. The light of the sunset softened her plain features and gave her a gentler look than was her wont. Was it that, and an air of lonesomeness akin to his own that made Hanford stop and speak to her? And then she told him. She could not keep it in long. It was the wonder of her life, and it filled her so that her thought had no room for anything else. To think of Marcia taken in a day, gone from their midst forever, gone to be a grown-up woman in a new world. It was as strange as sudden death, and almost as terrible and beautiful. There were tears in her eyes, and in the eyes of the boy as they spoke about the one who was gone, and the kind dusk hid the sight so that neither knew, but each felt a subtle sympathy with the other and before Hanford started upon his desolate way home under the burden of his first sorrow, he took Mary Ann's slim, bony hand in his and said quite stiffly, "'Well, good night, Miss Mary Ann. I'm glad you told me.' And Mary Ann responded with a deep blush under her freckles in the dark, "'Good night, Mr. Weston, and call again.' Something of the sympathy lingered with the boy as he went on his way, and he was not without a certain sort of comfort." while Mary Ann climbed to her little chamber in the loft with a new wonder to dream over. Meanwhile, the coach drove on, and Marcia passed from her childhood's home into the great world of men and women, changes, heartbreakings, sorrows, and joys. David spoke to her kindly now and then, asked if she was comfortable, if she would prefer to change seats with him, if the cushions were right, and if she had forgotten anything. He seemed nervous and anxious to have this part of the journey over, and asked the coachman frequent questions about the horses and the speed they could make. Marcia thought she understood that he was longing to get away from the painful reminder of what he had expected to be a joyful trip, 
and her young heart pitied him, while yet it felt an undertone of hurt for herself. She found so much unadulterated joy in this charming ride with the beautiful horses, in this luxurious coach, that she could not bear to have it spoiled by the thought that only David's sadness and pain had made it possible for her. Constantly as the scene changed and new sights came upon her view, she had to restrain herself from crying out with happiness over the beauty and calling David's attention. Once she did point out a bird just leaving a stalk of goldenrod, its light touch making the spray to bow and bend. David had looked with unseeing eyes and smiled with uncomprehending assent. Marcia felt she might as well have been talking to herself. He was not even the old friend and brother he used to be. She drew a gentle little sigh and wished this might have been only a happy ride with the ending at home, and a longer girlhood uncrossed by this wall of trouble that Kate had put up in a night for them all. The coach came at last to the town where they were to stop for dinner and a change of horses. Marcia looked about with interest at the houses, streets, and people. There were two girls of about her own age with long hair braided down their backs. They were walking with arms about each other as she and Mary Ann had often done. She wondered if any such sudden changes might be coming to them as had come into her life. They turned and looked at her curiously, enviously it seemed, as the coach drew up to the tavern and she was helped out with ceremony. Doubtless they thought of her as she had thought of Kate but last week. She was shown into the dim parlor of the tavern and seated in a stiff hair-cloth chair. It was all new and strange and delightful. Before a high gilt mirror set on great glass knobs like rosettes, she smoothed her wind-blown hair and looked back at the reflection of her strange self with startled eyes. Even her face seemed changed. She knew the bonnet and arrangement of hair were becoming, but she felt unacquainted with them and wished for her own modest braids and plain bonnet. Even a sunbonnet would have been welcome and have made her feel more like herself. David did not see how pretty she looked when he came to take her to the dining room ten minutes later. His eyes were looking into the hard future, and he was steeling himself against the glances of others. He must be the model bridegroom in the sight of all who knew him. His pride bore him out in this. He had acquaintances all along the way home. They were expecting the bridal party, for David had arranged that a fine dinner should be ready for his bride. Fine it was, with the best cooking and table service the mistress of the tavern could command, and with many a little touch new and strange to Marcia, and therefore interesting. It was all a lovely play till she looked at David. David ate but little, and Marcia felt she must hurry through the meal for his sake. Then, when the carry-all was ready, he put her in, and they drove away. Marcia's keen intuition told her how many little things had been thought of and planned for, for the comfort of the one who was to have taken this journey with David. Gradually the thought of how terrible it was for him, and how dreadful of Kate to have brought this sorrow upon him, overcame all other thoughts. Sitting thus quietly, with her hands folded tight in the faded bunch of roses little Harriet had given her at parting, the last remaining of the flowers she had carried with her, Marcia let the tears come. Silently they flowed in gentle rain, and had not David been borne down with the thought of his own sorrow, he must have noticed long before he did the sadness of the sweet young face beside him. But she turned away from him as much as possible that he might not see, and so they must have driven for half an hour through a dim sweet wood before he happened to catch a sight of the tear-wet face and knew suddenly that there were other troubles in the world beside his own. "'Why, child, what is the matter?' he said, turning to her with grave concern. "'Are you so tired? I'm afraid I have been very dull company,' with a sigh. "'You must forgive me, child, to-day.' "'Oh, David, don't,' said Marcia, putting her face down into her hands and crying now regardless of the roses. "'I do not want you to think of me. It is dreadful, dreadful for you.' I am so sorry for you. I wish I could do something. Dear child, he said, putting his hand upon hers, bless you for that. But do not let your heart be troubled about me. Try to forget me and be happy. It is not for you to bear this trouble. But I must bear it, said Marcia, sitting up and trying to stop crying. She was my sister, and she did an awful thing. 
I cannot forget it. How could she? How could she do it? How could she leave a man like you that— Marcia stopped, her brown eyes flashing fiercely as she thought of Captain Leavenworth's hateful look at her that night in the moonlight. She shuddered and hid her face in her hands once more and cried with all the fervor of her young and undisciplined soul. David did not know what to do with a young woman in tears. Had it been Kate, his alarm would have vied with the delicious sense of his own power to comfort. But even the thought of comforting anyone but Kate was now a bitter thing. Was it always going to be so? Would he always have to start and shrink with sudden remembrance of his pain at every turn of his way? He drew a deep sigh and looked helplessly at his companion. Then he did a hard thing. He tried to justify Kate, just as he had been trying all the morning to justify her to himself. The odd thing about it all was that the very deepest sting of his sorrow was that Kate could have done this thing, his peerless Kate. She cared for him. He breathed the words as if they hurt him. She should have told you so before then. She should not have let you think she cared for you, ever, said Marcia fiercely. Strangely enough, the plain truth was bitter to the man to hear, although he had been feeling it in his soul ever since they had discovered the flight of the bride. Perhaps there was too much pressure brought to bear upon her, he said lamely. Looking back, I can see times when she did not second me with regard to hurrying the marriage so warmly as I could have wished. I laid it to her shyness. Yet she seemed happy when we met. Did you, did, did she, have you any idea she had been planning this for long, or was it sudden? The words were out now, the thing he longed to know. It had been writing its fiery way through his soul. Had she meant to torture him this way all along, or was it the yielding to a sudden impulse that perhaps she had already repented? He looked at Marcia with piteous, almost pleading eyes and her tortured young soul would have given anything to have been able to tell him what he wanted to know. Yet she could not help him. She knew no more than he. She steadied her own nerves and tried to tell all she knew or surmised, tried her best to reveal Kate in her true character before him. Not that she wished to speak ill of her sister, only that she would be true and give this lover a chance to escape some of the pain if possible by seeing the real Kate as she was at home without varnish or furbelows. Yet she reflected that those who knew Kate's shallowness well still loved her in spite of it, and always bowed to her wishes. Gradually their talk subsided into deep silence once more, broken only by the jog-trot of the horse or the stray note of some bird. The road wound into the woods with its fragrant scents of hemlock, spruce, and wintergreen, and out into a broad, hot, sunny way. The bees hummed in the flowers, and the grasshoppers sang hotly along the side of the dusty road. Over the whole earth there seemed to be the sound of a soft simmering, as if nature were boiling down her sweets, the better to keep them during the winter. The strain of the day's excitement and hurry and the weariness of sorrow were beginning to tell upon the two travelers. The road was heavy with dust, and the horse plodded monotonously through it. With the drone of the insects and the glare of the afternoon sun, it was not strange that little by little a great drowsiness came over Marcia, and her head began to droop like a poor wilted flower until she was fast asleep. David noticed that she slept, and drew her head against his shoulder that she might rest more comfortably. Then he settled back to his own pain, a deeper pang coming as he thought how different it would have been if the head resting against his shoulder had been golden instead of brown. Then soon he too fell asleep, and the old horse, going slow, and yet more slowly, finding no urging voice behind her and seeing no need to hurry herself, came at last on the way to the shade of an apple tree, and halted, finding it a pleasant place to remain and think until the heat of the afternoon was past. A while she ate the tender grass that grew beneath the generous shade, and nipped daintily at an apple or two that hung within tempting reach. Then she, too, drooped her white lashes, and nodded and drooped, and took an afternoon nap. A farmer, trundling by in his empty hay wagon, found them so, looked curiously at them, then drew up his team, and came and prodded David in the chest with his long hickory stick. 
wake up there stranger and move on he called as he jumped back into his wagon and took up the reins we don't want no tipsy folks around these parts and with a loud clatter he rode on david whose strong temperance principles had made him somewhat marked in his own neighborhood roused and flushed over the insinuation and started up the lazy horse which flung out guiltily upon the way as if to make up for lost time the driver however was soon lost in his own troubles which returned upon him with redoubled sharpness as new sorrow always does after brief sleep but marcia slept on end of chapter seven chapter eight of marcia schuyler by grace livingston hill this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight owing to the horse's nap by the roadside it was quite late in the evening when they reached the town and david saw the lights of his own neighborhood gleaming in the distance he was glad it was late for now there would be no one to meet them that night his friends would think perhaps that they had changed their plans and stopped overnight on the way or met with some detention marcia still slept david as he drew near the house began to feel that perhaps he had made a mistake in carrying out his marriage just as if nothing had happened and everything was all right it would be too great a strain upon him to live there in that house without kate and come home every night just as he had planned it and not to find her there to greet him as he had hoped oh if he might turn even now and flee from it out into the wilderness somewhere and hide himself from humankind where no one would know and no one ever ask him about his wife he groaned in spirit as the horse drew up to the door and the heavy head of the sweet girl who was his wife reminded him that he could not go away but must stay and face the responsibilities of life which he had taken upon himself and bear the pain that was his it was not the fault of the girl he had married she sorrowed for him truly and he felt deeply grateful for the great thing she had done to save his pride he leaned over and touched her shoulder gently to rouse her but her sleep was deep and healthy the sleep of exhausted youth she did not rouse nor even open her eyes but murmured half audibly david has come kate hurry half guessing what had passed the night he arrived david stooped and tenderly gathered her up in his arms he felt a bond of kindliness far deeper than brotherly love it was a bond of common suffering and by her own choice she had made herself his comrade in his trouble he would at least save her what suffering he could she did not waken as he carried her into the house nor when he took her upstairs and laid her gently upon the white bed that had been prepared for the bridal chamber the moonlight stole in at the small paned windows and fell across the floor showing every object in the room plainly david lighted a candle and set it upon the high mahogany chest of drawers the light flickered and played over the sweet face and marcia slept on david went downstairs and put up the horse and then returned but marcia had not stirred he stood a moment looking at her helplessly it did not seem right to leave her this way yet it was a pity to disturb her sleep she seemed so weary it had been a long ride and the day had been filled with unwonted excitement he felt it himself and what must it be for her she was a woman david had the old-fashioned gallant idea of woman clumsily he untied the gay blue ribbons and pulled the jaunty poke bonnet out of her way the luxuriant hair unused to the confinement of combs fell rich about her sleep flushed face contentedly she nestled down the bonnet out of her way her red lips parted the least bit with a half smile the black lashes lying long upon her rosy cheek one childish hand upon which gleamed the new wedding ring that was not hers lying relaxed and appealing upon her breast rising and falling with her breath a lovely bride david stern true pained and appreciative suddenly awakened to what a dreadful thing he had done here was this lovely woman her womanhood not yet unfolded from the bud but lovely in promise even as her sister had been in truth her charms her dreams her woman's ways her love her very life taken by him as ruthlessly and as thoughtlessly as though she had been but a wax doll and put into a home where she could not possibly be what she ought to be because the place belonged to another thrown away upon a man without a heart that was what she was a sacrifice to his pride there was no other way to put it it fairly frightened him to think of the promises he had made love honor cherish yes all those he had promised 
and in a way he could perform, but not in the sense that the wedding ceremony had meant, not in the way in which he would have performed them had the bride been Kate, the choice of his love. Oh, why, why had this awful thing come upon him? And now his conscience told him he had done wrong to take this girl away from the possibilities of joy and the life that might have been hers, and sacrifice her for the sake of saving his own sufferings, and to keep his friends from knowing that the girl he was to marry had jilted him. As he stood before the lovely defenseless girl, her very beauty and innocence arraigned him. He felt that God would hold him accountable for the act he had so thoughtlessly committed that day, and a burden of responsibility settled upon his weight of sorrow that made him groan aloud. For a moment his soul cried out against it in rebellion. Why could he not have loved this sweet, self-sacrificing girl instead of her fickle sister? Why? Why? She might perhaps have loved him in return, but now nothing could ever be. Earth was filled with a black sorrow, and life henceforth meant renunciation and one long struggle to hide his trouble from the world. But the girl whom he had selfishly drawn into the darkness of his sorrow with him, she must not be made to suffer more than he could help. He must try to make her happy, and keep her as much as possible from knowing what she had missed by coming with him. His lips set in stern resolve and a purpose, half prayer went up on record before God, that he would save her as much as he knew how. Lying helpless so, she appealed to him. Asking nothing, she yet demanded all from him in the name of true chivalry. How readily had she given up all for him! How sweetly she had said she would fill the place left vacant by her sister, just to save him pain and humiliation. A desire to stoop and kiss the fair face came to him, not for affection's sake, but reverently, as if to render to her before God some fitting sign that he knew and understood her act of self-sacrifice, and would not presume upon it. Slowly, as though he were performing a religious ceremony, a sacred duty laid upon him on high, David stooped over her, bringing his face to the gentle sleeping one. Her sweet breath fanned his cheek like the almost imperceptible fragrance of a bud not fully opened yet to give forth its sweetness to the world. His soul, awake and keen through the thoughts that had just come to him, gave homage to her sweetness, sadly, wistfully, half wishing his spirit free to gather this sweetness for his own. And so he brought his lips to hers and kissed her, his bride, yet not his bride, kissed her for the second time. That thought came to him with the touch of the warm lips and startled him. Had there been something significant in the fact that he had met Marcia first and kissed her instead of Kate by mistake? It seemed as though the sleeping lips clung to his lingeringly and half responded to the kiss. As Marcia in her dreams lived over again the kiss she had received by her father's gate in the moonlight. Only the dream lover was her own and not another's. David, as he lifted up his head and looked at her gravely, saw a half-smile illuminating her lips as if the sleeping soul within had felt the touch and answered to the call. With a deep sigh he turned away, blew out the candle, and left her with the moonbeams in her chamber. He walked sadly to a rear room of the house and lay down upon the bed, his whole soul crying out in agony at his miserable state. Kate, the careless one who had made all this heartbreak and misery, had quarreled with her husband already because he did not further some expensive whim of hers. She had told him she was sorry she had not stayed where she was and carried on her marriage with David as she had planned to do. Now she sat sulkily in her room alone, too angry to sleep, while her husband smoked sullenly in the bar room below and drank frequent glasses of brandy to fortify himself against Kate's moods. Kate was considering whether or not she had been a fool in marrying the captain instead of David, though she called herself by a much milder word than that. The romance was already worn away. She wished for her trunk and her pretty furbelows. Her father's word of reconciliation would doubtless come in a few days, also the trunks. After all, there was intense satisfaction to Kate in having broken all bounds and done as she pleased. Of course it would have been a bit more comfortable if David had not been so absurdly in earnest, and believed in her so thoroughly. But it was nice to have someone believe in you no matter what you did, and David would always do that. It began to look doubtful if the captain would. But David would never marry, she was sure, and perhaps by and by, when everything had been forgotten and forgiven, 
she might establish a pleasant relationship with him again. It would be charming to coquette with him. He made love so earnestly, and his great eyes were so handsome when he looked at one with his whole soul in them. Yes, she certainly must keep in with him, for it would be good to have a friend like that when her husband was off at sea with his ship. Now that she was a married woman, she would be free from all such childish trammels as being guarded at home and never going anywhere alone. She could go to New York, and she would let David know where she was, and he would come up on business and perhaps take her to the theater. To be sure, she had heard David express views against theater going, and she knew he was as much of a churchman, almost, as her father, but she was sure she could coax him to do anything for her, and she had always wanted to go to the theater. His scruples might be strong, but she knew his love for her and thought it was stronger. She had read in his eyes that it would never fail her. Yes, she thought, she would begin at once to make a friend of David. She would write him a letter asking forgiveness, and then she would keep him under her influence. There was no telling what might happen with her husband off at sea so much. It was well to be foresighted. Besides, it would be wholesome for the captain to know she had another friend. He might be less stubborn. What a nuisance that the marriage vows had to be taken for life! It would be much nicer if they could be put off as easily as they were put on. Rather hard on some women, perhaps, but she could keep any man as long as she chose, and then— she snapped her pretty thumb and finger in the air to express her utter disdain for the man whom she chose to cast off. It seemed that Kate, in running away from her father's house and her betrothed bridegroom, and breaking the laws of respectable society, had with that act given over all attempt at any principle. So she set herself down to write her letter, with a pout here and a dimple there, and as much pretty gentleness as if she had been talking with her own bewitching face and eyes quite near to his. She knew she could bewitch him if she chose, and she was in the mood just now to choose very much, for she was deeply angry with her husband. She had ever been utterly heartless when she pleased, knowing that it needed but her returning smile, sweet as a May morning, to bring her much-abused subjects fondly to her feet once more. It did not strike her that this time she had sinned not only against her friends, but against heaven and God-given love and that a time of reckoning must come to her, had come indeed. She had never believed they would be angry with her, her father least of all. She had no thought they would do anything desperate. She had expected the wedding would be put off indefinitely, that the servants would be sent out hither and yon in hot haste to unbid the guests, upon some pretext of accident or illness, and that it would be left to rest until the village had ceased to wonder, and her real marriage with Captain Leavenworth could be announced." She had counted upon David to stand up for her. She had not understood how her father's righteous soul would be stirred to the depths of shame and utter disgrace over her wanton action. Not that she would have been in the least deterred from doing as she pleased, had she understood, only that she counted upon too great power with all of them. When the letter was written it sounded quite pathetic and penitent, putting all the blame of her action upon her husband, and making herself out a poor, helpless, sweet thing, bewildered by so much love put upon her, and suggesting, just in a hint, that perhaps after all she had made a mistake not to have kept David's love instead of the wilder, fiercer one. She ended by begging David to be her friend forever, and leaving an impression with him, though it was but slight, that already shadows had crossed her path that made her feel his friendship might be needed some day. It was a letter calculated to drive such a lover as David had been half mad with anguish, even without the fact of his hasty marriage added to the situation. And in due time, by coach, the letter came to David. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The morning sunbeams fell across the floor when Marcia awoke suddenly to a sense of her new surroundings. For a moment she could not think where she was, nor how she came there. She looked about the unfamiliar walls, covered with paper decorated in landscapes, a hill in the distance with a tall castle among the trees, a blue lake in the foreground, and two maidens sitting pensively upon a green bank with their arms about one another. Marcia liked it. She felt there was a story in it. She would like to imagine about the lives of those two girls when she had more time. 
There were no pictures in the room to mar those upon the paper, but the walls did not look bare. Everything was new and stiff and needed a woman's hand to bring the little homey touches, but the newness was a delight to the girl. It was as good as the time when she was a little girl and played house with Mary Ann down on the old flat stone in the pasture, with acorns for cups and saucers and bits of broken china carefully treasured upon the mossy shelves in among the roots of the old elm tree that arched over the stone. She was stiff from the long ride, but her sleep had wonderfully refreshed her, and now she was ready to go to work. She wondered as she rose how she got upon that bed, how the blue bonnet got untied and laid upon the chair beside her. Surely she could not have done it herself and have no memory of it. Had she walked upstairs herself, or did someone carry her? Did David, perhaps? Good, kind David. A bird hopped upon the window seat and trilled a song, perked his head knowingly at her and flitted away. Marcia went to the window to look after him and was held by the new sights that met her gaze. She could catch glimpses of houses through bowers of vines and smoke rising from chimneys. She wondered who lived near and if there were girls who would prove pleasant companions. Then she suddenly remembered that she was a girl no longer and must associate with married women hereafter. But suddenly the clock on the church steeple across the way warned her that it was late and with a sense of deserving reprimand she hurried downstairs. The fire was already lighted and David had brought in fresh water, so much his intuition had told him was necessary. He had been brought up by three maiden aunts who thought that a man in the kitchen was out of his sphere, so the kitchen was an unknown quantity to him. Marcia entered the room as if she were not quite certain of her welcome. She was coming into a kingdom she only half understood. "'Good morning,' she said shyly, and a lovely color stole into her cheeks. Once more David's conscience smote him as her waking beauty intensified the impression made the night before. "'Good morning,' he said gravely, studying her face as he might have studied some poor waif whom he had unknowingly run over in the night and picked up to resuscitate. "'Are you rested? You were very tired last night.' "'What a baby I was,' said Marcia deprecatingly, with a soft little gurgle of a laugh like a merry brook. David was amazed to find she had two dimples located about as Kate's were, only deeper and more gentle in their expression. "'Did I sleep all the afternoon after we left the canal? And did you have hard work to get me into the house and upstairs?' "'You slept most soundly,' said David, smiling in spite of his heavy heart. "'It seemed a pity to waken you, so I did the next best thing and put you to bed as well as I knew how.' "'It was very good of you,' said Marcia, coming over to him with her hands clasped earnestly and I don't know how to thank you. There was something quaint and old-fashioned in her way of speaking, and it struck David pitifully that she should be thanking her husband, the man who had pledged himself to care for her all his life. It seemed that everywhere he turned his conscience would be continually reproaching him. It was a dainty breakfast to which they presently sat down. There was plenty of bread and fresh butter just from the hands of the best butter maker in the county, the eggs had been laid the day before, and the bacon was browned just right. Marcia well knew how to make coffee. There was cream rich and yellow as ever came from the cows at home, and there were blackberries as large and fine every bit as those Marcia picked but a few days before for the purchase of her pink sprig chintz. David watched her deft movements, and all at once keen smiting conscience came to remind him that Marcia was defrauded of all the loving interchange of mirth that would have been if Kate had been here. Also, keener still the thought that Kate had not wanted it, that she had preferred the love of another man to his, and that these joys had not been held in dear anticipation with her as they had with him. He had been a fool. All these months of waiting for his marriage he had thought that he and Kate held feelings in common, joys and hopes and tender thoughts of one another. And behold, he was having these feelings all to himself, fool and blind that he was. A bitter sigh came to his lips, and Marcia, eager in the excitement of getting her first breakfast upon her own responsibility, heard and forgot to smile over the completed work. She could hardly eat what she had prepared. Her heart felt David's sadness so keenly. Shyly she poured the amber coffee and passed it to David. She was pleased that he drank it eagerly and passed his cup back for more. He ate but little, but seemed to approve of all she had done. After breakfast David went down to the office. He had told Marcia that he would step over and tell his aunts of their arrival, and they would probably come over in the course of the day to greet her. He would be back to dinner at twelve. 
he suggested that she spend her time in resting, as she must be weary yet. Then hesitating, he went out and closed the door behind him. He waited again on the doorstone outside and opened the door to ask. "'You won't be lonesome, will you, child?' He had the feeling of troubled responsibility upon him. "'Oh, no,' said Marcia brightly, smiling back. She thought it so kind of him to take the trouble to think of her. She was quite anticipating a trip of investigation over her new domain and the pleasure of feeling that she was mistress and might do as she pleased. Yet she stood by the window after he was gone and watched his easy strides down the street with a feeling of mingled pride and disappointment. It was a very nice play she was going through, and David was handsome, and her young heart swelled with pride to belong to him. But after all, there was something left out. A great lack, a great unknown longing unsatisfied. What was it? What made it? Was it David's sorrow? She turned with a sigh as he disappeared around a curve in the sidewalk and was lost to view. Then, casting aside the troubles which were trying to settle upon her, she gave herself up to a morning of pure delight. She flew about the kitchen putting things to rights, washing the delicate sprig china with its lavender sprays and buff bands, and putting it tenderly upon the shelves behind the glass doors, shoving the table back against the wall demurely with dropped leaves. It did not take long. There was no need to worry about the dinner. There was a leg of lamb beautifully cooked, half a dozen pies, their flaky crusts bearing witness to the culinary skill of the aunts, a fruit cake, a pound cake, a jar of delectable cookies, and another of fat sugary doughnuts, three loaves of bread, and a sheet of puffy rusks with their shining tops dusted with sugar. Besides the preserve closet was rich in all kinds of preserves, jellies, and pickles. No, it would not take long to get dinner. It was into the great parlor that Marcia peeped first, it had been toward that room that her hopes and fears had turned while she washed the dishes. The Schuylers were one of the few families in those days that possessed a musical instrument, and it had been the delight of Marcia's heart. She seemed to have a natural talent for music, and many an hour she spent at the old spinet drawing tender tones from the yellowed keys. The spinet had been in the family for a number of years, and very proud had the Schuyler girls been of it. Kate could rattle off gay waltzes and merry rollicking tunes that fairly made the feet of the sedate village maidens flutter in time to their melody. But Marcia's music had always been more tender and spiritual. Dear old hymns she loved and some of the old classics. Stupid old things without any tune, Kate called them. But Marcia persevered in playing them until she could bring out the beautiful passages in a way that at least satisfied herself. Her one great desire had been to take lessons of a real musician and be able to play the wonderful things that the old masters had composed. It is true that very few of these had come in her way. One somewhat mutilated copy of Haydn's creation, a copy of Handel's Messiah, and a few fragments of an old book of box fugues and preludes. Many of these she could not play at all, but others she had managed to pick out. A visit from a cousin who lived in Boston and told of the concerts given there by the Handel and Haydn Society had served to strengthen her deeper interest in music. The one question that had been going over in her mind ever since she awoke had been whether there was a musical instrument in the house. She felt that if there was not, she would miss the old spinet in her father's house more than any other thing about her childhood's home. So with fear and trepidation she entered the darkened room where the careful aunts had drawn the thick green shades. The furniture stood about in shadowed corners, and every footfall seemed a fearsome thing. Marcia's bright eyes hurried furtively about, noting the great glass knobs that held the lace curtains with heavy silk cords, the round mahogany table with its china vase of everlastings, the high, stiff-backed chairs all decked in elaborate antimacassars of intricate pattern. Then in the furthest corner, shrouded in dark coverings, she found what she was searching for. With a cry she sprang to it, touched its polished wood with gentle fingers, and lovingly felt for the keyboard. It was closed. Marcia pushed up the shade to see better and opened the instrument cautiously. It was a pianoforte of the latest pattern, and with exclamations of delight she sat down and began to strike chords, softly at first, as if half afraid, then more boldly. The tone was sweeter than the old spinet or the harpsichord owned by Squire Hartrant. Marcia marveled at the volume of sound. It filled the room and seemed to echo through the empty halls. She played soft little airs from memory, and her soul was filled with joy. Now she knew she would never be lonely in the new life, for she would always have this wonderful instrument to flee to when she felt homesick. 
Across the hall were two square rooms, the front one furnished as a library. Here were rows of books behind glass doors. Marcia looked at them with awe. Might she read them all? She resolved to cultivate her mind that she might be a fit companion for David. She knew he was wise beyond his years, for she had heard her father say so. She went nearer and scanned the titles, and at once there looked out to her from the rows of bindings a few familiar faces of books she had read and reread. Thaddeus of Warsaw, The Scottish Chiefs, Mysteries of Udolpho, Romance of the Forest, Baker's Livy, Rollins' History, Pilgrim's Progress, and a whole row of Sir Walter Scott's novels. She caught her breath with delight. What pleasure was opening before her, all of Scott, and she had read but one. It was with difficulty she tore herself away from the tempting shelves and went on to the rest of the house. Back of David's library was a sunny sitting-room, or breakfast-room, or dining-room, as it would be called at the present time. In Marcia's time the family ate most of their meals in one end of the large bright kitchen, that end furnished with a comfortable lounge, a few bookshelves, a thick ingrain carpet, and a blooming geranium in the wide window seat. But there was always the other room for company, for high days and holidays. Out of this morning room the pantry opened, with its spicy odors of preserves and fruit cake. Marcia looked about her well pleased. The house itself was a part of David's inheritance, his mother's family homestead. Things were all on a grand scale for a bride. Most brides began in a very simple way and climbed up year by year. How Kate would have liked it all! David must have had in mind her fastidious tastes, and spent a great deal of money in trying to please her. That piano must have been very expensive. Once more Marcia felt how David had loved Kate, and a pang went through her as she wondered how ever he was to live without her. Her young soul had not yet awakened to the question of how she was to live with him, while his heart went continually mourning for one who was lost to him forever. The rooms upstairs were all pleasant, spacious, and comfortably furnished. There was no suggestion of barrenness or anything left unfinished. Much of the furniture was old, having belonged to David's mother, and was in a state of fine preservation, a possession of which to be justly proud. There were four rooms besides the one in which Marcia had slept, a front and back on the opposite side of the hall, a room just back of her own, and one at the end of the hall over the large kitchen. She entered them all and looked about. The three beside her own in the front part of the house were all large and airy, furnished with high four-posted bedsteads and pretty chintz hangings. Each was immaculate in its appointments. Cautiously she lifted the latch of the back room. David had not slept in any of the others, for the bed coverings and pillows were plump and undisturbed. Ah, it was here in the back room that he had carried his heavy heart, as far away from the rest of the house as possible. The bed was rumpled, as if someone had thrown himself heavily down without stopping to undress. There was water in the washbowl, and a towel lay carelessly across a chair, as if it had been hastily used. There was a newspaper on the bureau and a handkerchief on the floor. Marcia looked sadly about at these signs of occupancy, her eyes dwelling upon each detail. It was here that David had suffered, and her loving heart longed to help him in his suffering. But there was nothing in the room to keep her, and remembering the fire she had left upon the hearth, which must be almost spent and need replenishing by this time, she turned to go downstairs. Just at the door something caught her eye under the edge of the chintz valance round the bed. It was but the very tip of the corner of an old daguerreotype, but for some reason Marcia was moved to stoop and draw it from its concealment. Then she saw it was her sister's saucy, pretty face that laughed back at her in defiance from the picture. As if she had touched something red-hot, Marcia dropped it and pushed it with her foot far back under the bed. Then shutting the door quickly, she went downstairs. Was it always to be thus? Would Kate ever blight all her joy from this time forth? End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Marcia's cheeks were flushed when David came home to dinner, for at the last she had to hurry. As he stood in the doorway of the wide kitchen and caught the odor of the steaming platter of green corn she was putting upon the table, David suddenly realized that he had eaten scarcely anything for breakfast. Also he felt a certain comfort from the sweet, steady look of wistful sympathy in Marcia's eyes. 
Did he fancy it, or was there a new look upon her face, a more reserved bearing, less childish, more touched by sad knowledge of life and its bitterness? It was mere fancy, of course, something he had just not noticed. He had seen so little of her before. In the heart of the maiden there stirred a something which she did not quite understand, something brought to life by the sight of her sister's daguerreotype lying at the edge of the valance where it must have fallen from David's pocket without his knowledge as he lay asleep. It had seemed to put into tangible form the solid wall of fact that hung between her and any hope of future happiness as a wife, and for the first time she too began to realize what she had sacrificed and thus impetuously throwing her young life into the breach that it might be healed. But she was not sorry, not yet anyway, only frightened and filled with dreary forebodings. The meal was a pleasant one, though constrained. David roused himself to be cheerful for Marcia's sake, as he would have done with any other stranger, and the girl, suddenly grown sensitive, felt it and appreciated it, yet did not understand why it made her unhappy. She was anxious to please him, and kept asking if the potatoes were seasoned right, and if his corn were tender, and if he wouldn't have another cup of coffee. Her cheeks were quite red with the effort at matronly dignity when David was finally through his dinner and gone back to the office, and two big tears came and sat in her eyes for a moment, but were persuaded with a determined effort to sink back again into those unfathomable wells that lie in the depths of a woman's eyes. She longed to get out of doors and run wild and free in the old south pasture for relief. She did not know how different it all was from the first dinner of the ordinary young married couple. So stiff and formal, with no gentle touches, no words of love, no glances that told more than words. And yet, child as she was, she felt it, a lack somewhere, she knew not what. But training is a great thing. Marcia had been trained to be on the alert for the next duty, and to do it before she gave herself time for any of her own thoughts. The dinner table was awaiting her attention, and there was company coming. She glanced at the tall clock in the hall and found she had scarcely an hour before she might expect David's aunts, for David had brought her word that they would come and spend the afternoon and stay to tea. She shrank from the ordeal and wished David had seen fit to stay and introduce her. It would have been a relief to have had him for a shelter. Somehow she knew that he would have stayed if it had been Kate, and that thought pained her with a quick sharpness like the sting of an insect. She wondered if she were growing selfish, that it should hurt to find herself of so little account. And yet it was to be expected, and she must stop thinking about it. Of course, Kate was the one he had chosen, and Kate would always be the only one to him. It did not take her long to reduce the dinner table to order and put all things in readiness for tea time, and in doing her work Marcia's thoughts flew to pleasanter themes. She wondered what Dolly and Debbie, the servants at home, would say if they could see her pretty china and the nice kitchen. They had always been fond of her, and naturally her new honors made her wish to have her old friends see her. What would Mary Ann say? What fun it would be to have Mary Ann there some time. It would be almost like the days when they had played house under the old elm on the big flat stone, only this would be a real house with real sprigged china instead of bits of broken things. Then she fell into a song, one they sang in school. Sister, thou wast mild and lovely, gentle as the summer breeze, pleasant as the air of evening when it floats among the trees. But the first words set her to thinking of her own sister, and how little the song applied to her and she thought with a sigh how much better it would have been, how much less bitter, if Kate had been that way and had lain down to die, and they could have laid her away in the little hilly graveyard under the weeping willows, and felt about her as they did about the girl for whom that song was written. The work was done, and Marcia, arrayed in one of the simplest of Kate's afternoon frocks, when the brass knocker sounded through the house, startling her with its unfamiliar sound. Breathlessly she hurried downstairs, the crucial moment had come when she must stand to meet her new relatives alone. With her hand trembling, she opened the door, but there was only one person standing on the stoop, a girl of about her own age, perhaps a few months younger. Her hair was red, her face was freckled, and her blue eyes under the red lashes danced with repressed mischief. Her dress was plain, and she wore a calico sunbonnet of chocolate color. "'Let me in quick before Grandma sees me,' she demanded unceremoniously entering at once before there was opportunity for invitation. Grandma thinks I've gone to the store, so she won't expect me for a little while. I was just crazy to see how you looked. I've been watching out of the window all morning, but I couldn't catch a glimpse of you. 
When David came out this morning, I thought you'd be sure at the kitchen door to kiss him goodbye, but you wasn't, and I watched every chance I could get. But I couldn't see you till you run out in the garden for corn. Then I saw you good, for I was out hanging up dish towels. You didn't have a sunbonnet on so I could see real well. And when I saw how young you was, I made up my mind I'd get acquainted in spite of Grandma. You don't mind my coming over this way without being dressed up, do you? There wouldn't be any way to get here without Grandma seeing me, you know, if I put on my Sunday clothes. I'm glad you came, said Marcia impulsively, feeling a rush of something like tears in her throat at the relief of delay from the aunts. Come in and sit down. Who are you, and why wouldn't your grandmother like you to come? The strange girl laughed a mirthless laugh. Me? Oh, I'm Mirandy. Nobody ever calls me anything but Mirandy. My pa left ma when I was a baby and never come back, and ma died and I live with Grandma Heath. And Grandma's mad cause David didn't marry Hannah Heath. She wanted him to, and she did everything she could to make him pay attention to Hannah. Give her fine silk frocks, two of em, and a real pink parasol. But David, he never seemed to know the parasol was pink at all, for he'd never offer to hold it over Hannah, even when Grandma made him walk with her home from church ahead of us. So when it come out that David was really going to marry and wouldn't take Hannah, Grandma got as mad as could be and said we never any of us should step over his door sill. But I've stepped I have, and Grandma can't help herself. And who is Hannah Heath? questioned the dazed young bride. It appeared there was more than a sister to be taken into account. Hannah? Oh, Hannah is my cousin, Uncle Jim's oldest daughter, and she's getting on toward thirty somewhere. She has whitey yellow hair and light blue eyes and is tall and real pretty. She held her head high for a good many years waiting for David, and I guess she feels she made a mistake now. I noticed she bowed real sweet to Herman Worcester last Sunday and let him hold her parasol all the way to Grandma's gate. Hannah was mad as hops when she heard that you had gold hair and blue eyes, for it did seem hard to be beaten by a girl of the same kind. But you haven't, have you? Your hair is almost black, and your eyes are brownie brown. You're years younger than Hannah, too. My, won't she be astonished when she sees you? But I don't understand how it got around about your having gold hair. It was a man that stopped at your father's house once told it. It was my sister, said Marcia, and then blushed crimson to think how near she had come to revealing the truth which must not be known. Your sister? Have you got a sister with gold hair? Yes, he must have seen her, said Marcia confusedly. She was not used to evasion. How funny, said Miranda. Well, I'm glad he did, for it made Hannah so jealous it was funny. But I guess she'll get a setback when she sees how young you are. You're not as pretty as I thought you would be, but I believe I like you better. Miranda's frank speech reminded Marcia of Marianne and made her feel quite at home with her curious visitor. She did not mind being told she was not up to the mark of beauty. From her point of view, she was not nearly so pretty as Kate, and her only fear was that her lack of beauty might reveal the secret and bring confusion to David. But she need not have feared, no one watching the two girls as they sat in the large sunny room and faced each other but would have smiled to think the homely crude girl could suggest that the other calm, cool bud of womanhood was not as near perfection of beauty as a bud could be expected to come. There was always something childlike about Marcia's face, especially her profile, something deep and otherworldlike in her eyes that gave her an appearance so distinguished from other girls that the word pretty did not apply, and surface observers might have passed her by when searching for prettiness but not so those who saw soul beauties. But Miranda's time was limited, and she wanted to make as much of it as possible. Say, I heard you making music this morning. Won't you do it for me? I'd just love to hear you. Marcia's face lit up with responsive enthusiasm, and she led the way to the darkened parlor and folded back the covers of the precious piano. She played some tender little airs she loved, as she would have played them for Marianne, and the two young things stood there together, children in thought and feeling, half a generation apart in position, and neither recognized the difference. "'My land,' said the visitor, "'if I could play like that, I wouldn't care if I had freckles and no father and red hair.' And looking up, Marcia saw tears in the light blue eyes and knew she had a kindred feeling in her heart for Miranda. They had been talking a minute or two when the knocker suddenly sounded through the long hall again, making both girls start. 
Miranda boldly tiptoed over to the front window and peeped between the green slats of the Venetian blind to see who was at the door, while Marcia started guiltily and quickly closed the instrument. "'It's David's aunts,' announced Miranda in a stage whisper hurriedly. "'I might a known they would come this afternoon. Well, I had first tried you anyway, and I like you real well. May I come again and hear you play? You go quick to the door, and I'll slip into the kitchen till they get in, and then I'll go out the kitchen door and round the house out the little gate so Grandma won't see me. I must hurry, for I ought to have been back ten minutes ago.' "'But you haven't been to the store.' said Marcia in a dismayed whisper. Oh, well, that don't matter. I'll tell her they didn't have what she sent me for. Goodbye. You better hurry. So saying, she disappeared into the kitchen, and Marcia, startled by such easy morality, stood dazed until the knocker sounded forth again, this time a little more peremptorily, as the elder aunt took her turn at it. And so at last Marcia was face to face with the Mrs. Spafford. They came in, each with her knitting in a black silk bag on her slim arm, and greeted the flushed, perturbed Marcia with gentle, righteous, rigid inspection. She felt with the first glance that she was being tried in the fire, and that it was to be no easy ordeal through which she was to pass. They had come determined to sift her to the depths and know at once the worst of what their beloved nephew had brought upon himself. If they found aught wrong with her, they meant to be kindly and loving with her, but they meant to take it out of her. This had been the unspoken understanding between them as they wended their dignified, determined way to David's house that afternoon, and this was what Marcia faced as she opened the door for them. She gasped a little, as any girl overwhelmed thus might have done. She did not tilt her chin in defiance as Kate would have done. The thought of David came to support her, and she grasped for her own little part and tried to play it credibly. She did not know whether the aunts knew of her true identity or not, but she was not left long in doubt. "'My dear, we have long desired to know you, of whom we have heard so much,' recited Miss Amelia with slightly agitated mien, as she bestowed a cool kiss of duty upon Marcia's warm cheek. It chilled the girl like the breath from a funeral flower. "'Yes, it is indeed a pleasure to us to at last look upon our dear nephew's wife.' said Miss Hortense, quite precisely, and laid the sister kiss upon the other cheek. In spite of her there flitted through Marcia's brain the verse, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Then she was shocked at her own irreverence and tried to put away a hysterical desire to laugh. The aunts, too, were somewhat taken aback. They had not looked for so girlish a wife. She was not at all what they had pictured. David had tried to describe Kate to them once, and this young, sweet, disarming thing did not in the least fit their preconceived ideas of her. What should they do? How could they carry on a campaign planned against a certain kind of enemy, when, lo, as they came upon the field of action, the supposed enemy had taken another and more bewildering form than the one for whom they had prepared? They were for the moment silent, gathering their thoughts, and trying to fit their intended tactics to the present situation. During this operation, Marcia helped them to remove their bonnets and silk capes, and to lay them neatly on the parlor sofa. She gave them chairs, suggested palm-leaf fans, and looked about, for the moment forgetting that this was not her old home, plentifully supplied with those gracious breeze wafters. They watched her graceful movements, those two angular old ladies, and marveled over her roundness and suppleness. They saw with appalled hearts what a power youth and beauty might have over a man. Perhaps she might be even worse than they had feared, though if you could have heard them talk about their nephew's coming bride to their neighbors for months beforehand, you would have supposed they knew her to be a model in every required direction. But their stately pride required that of them, an outward loyalty at least. Now that loyalty was to be tried and Marcia had two old, narrow, and well-fortified hearts to conquer ere her way would be entirely smooth. Well might Madame Schuyler have been proud of her pupil, as alone and unaided she faced the trying situation and mastered it in a sweet and unassuming way. They began their inquisition at once, so soon as they were seated and the preliminary sentences uttered. The gleaming knitting needles seemed to Marcia like so many swarming, vindictive bees, menacing her peace of mind. "'You look young, child, to have the care of so large a house as this,' said Aunt Amelia, looking at Marcia over her spectacles, as if she were expected to take the first bite out of her. 
It's a great responsibility. She shut her thin lips tightly and shook her head, as if she had said, It's a great impossibility. Have you ever had the care of a house? asked Miss Hortense, going in a little deeper. David likes everything nice, you know, and he has always been used to it. There was something in the tone and in the set of the bow on Aunt Hortense's purple-trimmed cap that roused the spirit in Marcia. "'I think I rather enjoy housework,' she responded coolly. This unexpected statement somewhat mollified the aunts. They had heard to the contrary from someone who had lived in the same town with the Schuylers. Kate's reputation was widely known as that of a spoiled beauty who did not care to work and would do whatever she pleased. The aunts had entertained many forebodings from the few stray hints an old neighbor of Kate's had dared to utter in their hearing. The talk drifted at once into household matters, as though that were the first division of the examination the young bride was expected to undergo. Marcia took early opportunity to still further mollify her visitors by her warmest praise of the good things with which the pantry and store closet had been filled. The expression that came upon the two old faces was that of receiving but what is due. If the praise had not been forthcoming, they would have marked it down against her. But it counted for very little with them, warm as it was. "'Can you make good bread?' The question was flung out by Aunt Hortense like a challenge, and the very set of her nostrils gave Marcia warning. But it was in a relieved voice that ended almost in a ripple of laugh that she answered quite assuredly, "'Oh, yes, indeed. I can make beautiful bread. I just love to make it, too.' "'But how do you make it?' quickly questioned Aunt Amelia like a repeating rifle. If the first shot had not struck home, the second was likely to. Do you use hop yeast, potatoes? I thought so. Don't know how to make salt rising, do you? It's just what might have been expected. David has always been used to salt rising bread, said Aunt Hortense with a grim set of her lips, as though she were delivering a judgment. He was raised on it. If David does not like my bread, said Marcia with a rising color and a nervous little laugh, then I shall try to make some that he does like. There was an assurance about the if that did not please the oracle. David was raised on salt rising bread, said Aunt Hortense again as if that settled it. We can send you down a loaf or two every time we bake until you learn how. I'm sure it's very kind of you, said Marcia, not at all pleased. But I do not think that will be necessary. David has always seemed to like our bread when he visited at home. Indeed, he often praised it. David would not be impolite, said Aunt Amelia, after a suitable pause in which Marcia felt disapprobation in the air. It would be best for us to send it. David's health might suffer if he was not suitably nourished. Marcia's cheeks grew redder. Bread had been one of her stepmother's strong points, well infused into her young pupil. Madame Schuyler had never been able to say enough to sufficiently express her scorn of people who made salt-rising bread. "'My stepmother made beautiful bread,' she said quite childishly. "'She did not think salt-rising was so healthy as that made from hop yeast. She disliked the odor in the house from salt-rising bread.' Now, indeed, the aunts exchanged glances of, "'On to the combat!' Four red spots flamed giddily out in their four sallow cheeks, and eight shiny knitting needles suddenly became idle. The moment was too momentous to work. It was as they feared, even the worst. For be it known, salt-rising bread was one of their most tender points, and for it they would fight to the bitter end. They looked at her with four cold, forbidding, steely-spectacled eyes, and Marcia felt that their looks said volumes. And she so young, too, to be so out of the way, was what they might have expressed to one another. Marcia felt she had been unwise in uttering her honest, indignant sentiments concerning salt-rising bread. The pause was long and impressive, and the bride felt like a naughty little four-year-old. At last Aunt Hortense took up her knitting again with the air that all was over and an unrevocable verdict was passed upon the culprit. "'People have never seen to stay away from our house on that account,' she said dryly. "'I'm sure I hope it will not be so disagreeable that it will affect your coming to see us sometimes with David.' There was an iciness in her manner that seemed to suggest a long line of offended family portraits of ancestors frowning down upon her. Marcia's cheeks flamed crimson, and her heart fairly stopped beating. "'I beg your pardon,' she said quickly. "'I did not mean to say anything disagreeable.' 
I am sure I shall be glad to come as often as you will let me. As she said it, Marcia wondered if that were quite true. Would she ever be glad to go to the home of those two severe-looking aunts? There were three of them. Perhaps the other one would be even more withered and severe than these two. A slight shudder passed over Marcia and a sudden realization of a side of married life that had never come into her thoughts before. For a moment she longed with all the intensity of a child for her father's house and the shelter of his loving protection, amply supported by her stepmother's capable, self-sufficient, comforting countenance. Her heart sank with the fear that she would never be able to do justice to the position of David's wife, and David would be disappointed in her and sorry he had accepted her sacrifice. She roused herself to do better and bit her tongue to remind it that it must make no more blunders. She praised the garden, the house, and the furnishings, in voluble, eager, girlish language, until the thin lines of lips relaxed and the drawn muscles of the aunt's cheeks took on a less severe aspect. They liked to be appreciated, and they certainly had taken a great deal of pains with the house, for David's sake, not for hers. They did not care to have her deluded by the idea that they had done it for her sake. David was to them a young god, and with this one supreme idea of his supremacy they wished to impress his young wife. It was a foregone conclusion in their minds that no mere pretty young girl was capable of appreciating David, as could they, who had watched him from babyhood, and pampered and petted and been severe with him by turns, until if he had not had the temper of an angel, he would surely have been spoiled. "'We did our best to make the house just as David would have wished to have it,' said Aunt Amelia at last, a self-satisfied shadow of what answered for a smile with her passing over her face for a moment." We did not at all approve of this big house, nor indeed of David's setting up in a separate establishment for himself, said Aunt Hortense, taking up her knitting again. We thought it utterly unnecessary and uneconomical when he might have brought his wife home to us, but he seemed to think you would want a house to yourself, so we did the best we could. There was a martyr-like air in Aunt Hortense's words that made Marcia feel herself again a criminal, albeit she knew she was suffering vicariously but in her heart she felt a sudden thankfulness that she was spared the trial of living daily under the scrutiny of these two, and she blessed David for his thoughtfulness, even though it had not been meant for her. She went into pleased ecstasies once more over the house and its furnishings and ended by her pleasure over the piano. There was grim stillness when she touched upon that subject. The aunts did not approve of that musical instrument. That was plain. Marcia wondered if they always paused so long before speaking when they disapproved, in order to show their displeasure. In fact, did they always disapprove of everything? "'You will want to be very careful of it,' said Aunt Amelia, looking at the disputed article over her glasses. "'It cost a good deal of money. It was the most foolish thing I ever knew David to do, buying that.' "'Yes,' said Aunt Hortense. "'You will not want to use it much. It might get scratched. It has a fine polish.' I'd keep it closed up only when I had company. You ought to be very proud to have a husband who could buy a thing like that. There's not many has them. When I was a girl, my grandfather had a spinet, the only one for miles around, and it was taken great care of. The case hadn't a scratch on it. Marcia had started toward the piano, intending to open it and play for her new relatives. But she halted midway in the room and came back to her seat after that speech feeling that she must just sit and hold her hands until it was time to get supper, while these dreadful aunts picked her to pieces, body, soul, and spirit. It was with great relief at last that she heard David's step and knew she might leave the room and put the tea things upon the table. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 They got through the supper without any trouble, and the aunts went home in the early twilight, each with her bonnet strings tied precisely, her lace mitts drawn smoothly over her bony hands, and her little knitting bag over her right arm. They walked dexterously up the shaded, elm-domed street, each mindful of her aristocratic instep, and trying to walk erect as in the days when they were gazed upon with admiration knowing that still an air of former greatness hovered about them wherever they went. They had brightened considerably at the supper-table under the genial influence of David's presence. 
they came as near to worshipping David as one can possibly come to worshipping a human being. David, desirous above all things of blinding their keen, sure to say, I told you so, old eyes, roused to be his former gay self with them and pleased them so that they did not notice how little lover-like reference he made to his bride, who was decidedly in the background for the time. The aunts, perhaps purposely, desiring to show her a wife's true place, at least the true place of a wife of a David. They had allowed her to bring their things and help them on with capes and bonnets, and when they were ready to leave, Aunt Amelia put out a lifeless hand that felt in its silk mitt like a dead fish in a net and said to Marcia, Our sister Clarinda is desirous of seeing David's wife. She wished us most particularly to give you her love and to say to you that she wishes you to come to her at the earliest possible moment. You know she is lame and cannot easily get about. Young folks should always be ready to wait upon their elders, said Aunt Hortense grimly. Come as soon as you can, that is, if you think you can stand the smell of salt rising. Marcia's face flushed painfully, and she glanced quickly at David to see if he had noticed what his aunt had said, but David was already anticipating the moment when he would be free to lay aside his mask and bury his face in his hands and his thoughts in sadness. Marcia's heart sank as she went about clearing off the supper things. Was life always to be thus? Would she be forever under the espionage of those two grim specters of women, who seemed, to her girlish imagination, to have nothing about them warm or loving or womanlike? She seemed to herself to be standing outside of a married life and looking on at it as one might gaze on a panorama, it was all new and painful, and she was one of the central figures, expected to act on through all the pictures, taking another's place, yet doing it as if it were her own. She glanced over at David's pale, grave face set in its sadness, and a sharp pain went through her heart. Would he ever get over it? Would life never be more cheerful than it now was? He spoke to her occasionally in a pleasant, abstract way, as to one who understood him and was kind not to trouble his sadness, and he lighted a candle for her when the work was done, and said he hoped she would rest well, that she must still be weary from the long journey, and so she went up to her room again. She did not go to bed at once, but sat down by the window looking out on the moonlit street. There had been some sort of a meeting at the church across the way, and the people were filing out and taking their various ways home calling pleasant good nights and speaking cheerily of the morrow. The moon, though beginning to wane, was bright and cast sharp shadows. Marcia longed to get out into the night. If she could have gone downstairs without being heard, she would have slipped out into the garden. But downstairs she could hear David pacing back and forth like some hurt, caged thing. Steadily, dully, he walked from the front hall back into the kitchen and back again. There was no possibility of escaping his notice. Marcia felt as if she might breathe freer in the open air, so she leaned far out of her window and looked up and down the street and thought. Finally, her heart swelled to bursting, as young hearts with their first little troubles will do. She leaned down her dark head upon the window seat and wept and wept alone. It was the next morning at breakfast that David told her of the festivities that were planned in honor of their homecoming. He spoke as if they were a great trial through which they both must pass in order to have any peace, and expressed his gratitude once more that she had been willing to come here with him and pass through it. Marcia had the impression, after he was done speaking and had gone away to the office, that he felt that she had come here merely for these few days of ceremony, and after they were passed she was dismissed, her duty done, and she might go home. A great lump arose in her throat, and she suddenly wished very much indeed that it were so. For if it were, how much, how very much, she would enjoy queening it for a few days, except for David's sadness. But already there had begun to be an element to her in that sadness, which in spite of herself she resented. It was a heavy burden, which she began dimly to see would be harder and harder to bear as the days went by. She had not yet begun to think of the time before her in years. They were to go to the aunts to tea that evening, and after tea a company of David's old friends, or rather the old friends of David's aunts, were coming in to meet them. 
This the aunts had planned, but it seemed they had not counted her worthy to be told of the plans and had only divulged them to David. Marcia had not thought that a little thing could annoy her so much, but she found it vexed her more and more as she thought upon it going about her work. There was not so much to be done in the house that morning after the breakfast things were cleared away. Dinners and suppers would not be much of a problem for some days to come, for the house was well stocked with good things. The beds done and the rooms left in dainty order with the sweet summer breeze blowing the green tassels on the window shades, Marcia went softly down like some half-guilty creature to the piano. She opened it and was forthwith lost in delight of the sounds her own fingers brought forth. She had been playing perhaps half an hour when she became conscious of another presence in the room. She looked up with a start, feeling that someone had been there for some time. She could not tell just how long. Peering into the shadowy room lighted only from the window behind her, she made out a head looking in at the door, the face almost hidden by a capacious sunbonnet. She was not long in recognizing her visitor of the day before. It was like a sudden dropping from a lofty mountain height down into a valley of annoyance to hear Miranda's sharp metallic voice. "'Morning!' she courtesied, coming in as soon as she perceived that she was seen. "'At it again? I've been listening some time.' It's as pretty as Silas Drew's harmoniker when he comes home evenings behind the cows. Marcia drew her hands sharply from the keys as if she had been struck. Somehow Miranda and music were inharmonious. She scarcely knew what to say. She felt as if her morning were spoiled, but R Miranda was too full of her own errand to notice the clouded face and cool welcome. Say, you can't guess how I got over here. I'll tell you, you're going over to the Spafford house tonight, ain't you? And there's going to be a lot of folks there. Of course, we all know all about it. It's been planned for months. And my cousin Hannah Heath has an invite. You can't think how fond Miss Amelia and Miss Hortense are of her. They tried their level best to make David pay attention to her, but it didn't work. Well, she was talking about what she'd wear. She's had three new frocks made last week, all frilled and fancy. You see, she don't want to let folks think she is down in the mouth the least bit about David. She'll likely make up to you, to your face, a whole lot, and pretend she's the best friend you've got in the world. But I've just got this to say, don't you be too sure of her friendship. She's smooth as butter, but she can give you a slap in the face if you don't serve her purpose. I don't mind telling you, for she's given me many a one. And the pale eyes snapped in unison with the color of her hair. Well, you see, I heard her talking to Grandma, and she said she'd give anything to know what you were going to wear tonight. How curious, said Marcia, surprised. I'm sure I do not see why she should care. There was the coolness born of utter indifference in her reply, which filled the younger girl with admiration. Perhaps, too, there was the least mite of haughtiness in her manner, born of the knowledge that she belonged to an old and honored family, and that she had in her possession a trunk full of clothes, that could vie with any that Hannah Heath could display. Miranda wished silently that she could convey that cool manner and that wide-eyed indifference to the sight of her cousin Hannah. Hmm, <laughs> giggled Miranda. Well, she does. If you were going to wear blue, you'd see she'd put on her green. She's got one that'll kill any blue that's in the same room with it, no matter if it's on the other side. It's just sickening to see them together. And she looks real well in it, too. So when she said she wanted to know so bad, Grandma said she'd send me over to know if you'd accept a jar of her fresh pickle lily, and maybe I could find out about your clothes. The pickle lily's on the kitchen table. I left it when I came through. It's good, but there ain't any love in it. And Miranda laughed a hard, mirthless laugh, and then settled down to her subject again. Now you needn't be a mite afraid to tell me about it. I won't tell it straight, you know. I'd just like to see what you're going to wear so I could keep her out of her tricks for once. Is your frock blue? Now, it is true that the trunk upstairs contained a goodly amount of the color blue, for Kate Schuyler had been her bonniest in blue, and the particular frock which had been made with reference to this very first significant gathering was blue. Marcia had accepted the fact as unalterable. The garment was made for a purpose, and its mission must be fulfilled, however much she might wish to wear something else. But suddenly, as Miranda spoke, there came to her mind the thought of rebellion. Why should she be bound down to do exactly as Kate would do in her place? If she had accepted the sacrifice of living Kate's life for her, she might at least have the privilege of living it in the pleasantest possible way, 
and surely the matter of dress was one she might be allowed to settle for herself if she was old enough at all to be trusted away from home. Among the pretty things that Kate had made was a sweet rose-pink silk tissue. Madame Schuyler had frowned upon it as frivolous, and besides she did not think it becoming to Kate. She had a fixed theory that people with blue eyes and gold hair should never wear pink or red. But Kate, as usual, had her own way, and with her wild rose complexion had succeeded in looking like the wild rose itself in spite of blue eyes and golden hair. Marcia knew in her heart, in fact she had known from the minute the lovely pink thing had come into the house, that it was the very thing to set her off. Her dark eyes and hair made a charming contrast with the rose, and her complexion was even fresher than Kate's. Her heart grew suddenly eager to don this dainty frilly thing and outshine Hannah Heath beyond any chance of further trying. There were other frocks, too, in the trunk. Why should she be confined to the stately blue one that had been marked out for this occasion? Marcia, with sudden inspiration, answered calmly, just as though all these tumultuous possibilities of clothes had not been whirling through her brain in that half-second's hesitation. "'I have not quite decided what I shall wear. It's not an important matter, I'm sure. Let us go and see the Piccalilli. I'm very much obliged to your grandmother, I'm sure. It was kind of her.' Somewhat awed, Miranda followed her hostess into the kitchen. She could not reconcile this girl's face with the stately little airs that she wore, but she liked her, and forthwith she told her so. "'I like you,' she said fervently. "'You remind me of one of Grandma's stertions, bright and independent and lively, with a spice and a color to em. And Hannah makes you think of one of them tall spikes of gladiolus, all fixed up without any smell.' Marcia tried to smile over the doubtful compliment. Somehow there was something about Miranda that reminded her of Mary Ann. Poor Mary Ann. Dear Mary Ann. For suddenly she realized that everything that reminded her of the precious life of her childhood, left behind forever, was dear. If she could see Mary Ann at this moment, she would throw her arms about her neck and call her Dear Mary Ann and say I love you to her. Perhaps this feeling made her more gentle with the annoying Miranda than she might have been. When Miranda was gone, the precious play hour was gone, too. Marcia had only time to steal hurriedly into the parlor, close the instrument, and then fly about getting her dinner ready. But as she worked, she had other thoughts to occupy her mind. She was becoming adjusted to her new environment, and she found many unexpected things to make it hard. Here, for instance, was Hannah Heath. Why did there have to be a Hannah Heath? And what was Hannah Heath to her? Kate might feel jealous indeed, but not she, not the unloved, unreal wife of David. She should rather pity Hannah that David had not loved her instead of Kate, or pity David that he had not. But somehow she did not, somehow she could not. Somehow Hannah Heath had become a living, breathing enemy to be met and conquered. Marcia felt her fighting blood rising, felt the Schuyler in her coming to the front, However little there was in her wifehood, its name at least was hers. The tale that Miranda had told was enough, if it were true, to put any woman, however young she might be, into battle array. Marcia was puzzling her mind over the question that has been more or less of a weary burden to every woman since the fatal day that Eve made her great mistake. David was silent and abstracted at the dinner table, and Marcia, absorbed in her own problems, did not feel cut by it. She was trying to determine whether to blossom out in pink, or to be crushed and set aside into insignificance in blue, or to choose a happy medium and wear neither. She ventured a timid little question before David went away again. Did he, would he, that is, was there anything, any word he would like to say to her? Would she have to do anything tonight? David looked at her in surprise. Why, no, he knew of nothing. Just go and speak pleasantly to everyone. He was sure she knew what to do. He had always thought her very well behaved. She had manners like any woman. She need not feel shy. No one knew of her peculiar position, and he felt reasonably sure that the story would not soon get around. Her position would be thoroughly established before it did, at least. She need not feel uncomfortable. He looked down at her, thinking he had said all that could be expected of him, but somehow he felt the trouble in the girl's eyes and asked her gently if there was anything more. No, she said slowly, unless, perhaps, I don't suppose you know what it would be proper for me to wear. Oh, that does not matter in the least, he replied promptly. Anything. You always look nice. Why, I'll tell you. Wear the frock you had on the night I came. 
Then he suddenly remembered the reason why that was a pleasant memory to him, and that it was not for her sake at all, but for the sake of one who was lost to him forever. His face contracted with sudden pain, and Marcia, cut to the heart, read the meaning and felt sick and sore too. "'Oh, I could not wear that,' she said sadly. "'It is only chintz. It would not be nice enough, but thank you. I shall be all right. Don't trouble about me.' And she forced a weak smile to light him from the house, and shut from his pained eyes the knowledge of how he had hurt her, for with those words of his had come the vision of herself that happy night, as she stood at the gate in the stillness and moonlight, looking from the portal of her maidenhood into the vista of her womanhood, which had seemed then so far away and bright, and was now upon her in sad reality. Oh, if she could but have caught that sentence of his about her little chintz frock to her heart, with the joy of possession, and known that he said it because he, too, had a happy memory about her in it, as she had always felt the coming, misty, dream-expected lover would do. She spread the available frocks out upon the bed after the other things were put neatly away in closet and drawer, and sat down to decide the matter. David's suggestion, while impossible, had given her an idea, and she proceeded to carry it out. There was a soft, sheer white muslin, whereon Kate had expended her daintiest embroidering, edged with the finest of little lace frills. It was quaint and simple and girlish, the sweetest, most simple affair in all of Kate's elaborate wardrobe, and yet, perhaps, from an artistic point of view, the most elegant. Marcia soon made up her mind. She dressed herself early, for David had said he would be home by four o'clock, and they would start as soon after as he could get ready. His aunts wished to show her the old garden before dark. When she came to the arrangement of her hair, she paused. Somehow her soul rebelled at the style of Kate. It did not suit her face. It did not accord with her feeling. It made her seem unlike herself or unlike the self she would ever wish to be. It suited Kate well, but not her. With sudden determination she pulled it all down again from the top of her head, and loosened its rich waves about her face, then loosely twisted it behind, low on her neck, falling over her delicate ears, until her head looked like that of an old Greek statue. It was not fashion, it was pure instinct the child was following out, and there was enough conformity to one of the fashionable modes of the day to keep her from looking odd. It was lovely. Marcia could not help seeing herself that it was much more becoming than the way she had arranged it for her marriage, though then she had had the wedding veil to soften the tightly drawn outlines of her head. She put on the sheer white embroidered frock then, and as a last touch pinned the bit of black velvet about her throat with a single pearl that had been her mother's. It was the bit of black velvet she had worn the night David came. It gave her pleasure to think that in so far she was conforming to his suggestion. She had just completed her toilet when she heard David's step coming up the walk. David, coming in out of the sunshine and beholding this beautiful girl in the coolness and shadow of the hall awaiting him shyly, almost started back as he rubbed his eyes and looked at her again. She was beautiful. He had to admit it to himself, even in the midst of his sadness, and he smiled at her and felt another pang of condemnation that he had taken this beauty from some other man's lot, perhaps, and appropriated it to shield himself from the world's exclamation about his own lonely life. "'You have done it admirably. I do not see that there is anything left to be desired,' he said in his pleasant voice that used to make her girl heart flutter with pride that her new brother-to-be was pleased with her. It fluttered now, but there was a wider sweep to its wings and a longer flight ahead of the thought. Quite demurely the young wife accepted her compliment and then she meekly folded her little white muslin cape with its dainty frills about her pretty shoulders, drew on the new lace mitts, and tied beneath her chin the white strings of a sheared gauze bonnet with tiny rosebuds nestling in the ruching of tulle about the face. Once more the bride walked down the world, the observed of all observers, the gazed at of the town. Only this time it was brick pavement, not oaken stairs she trod, and most of the eyes that looked upon her were sheltered behind green jealousies. None the less, however, was she conscious of them as she made her way to the house of solemn feasting with David by her side. Her eyes rested upon the ground, or glanced quietly at things in the distance, when they were not lifted for a moment in wifely humility to her husband's face at some word of his. Just as she imagined a hundred times in her girlish thoughts that her sister Kate would do, so did she 
and after what seemed to her an interminable walk, though in reality it was but four village blocks, they arrived at the house of Spafford. End of chapter 11「Twelve of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. This is your aunt Clarinda. There was challenge in the severely spoken pronoun Aunt Hortense used. It seemed to Marcia that she wished to remind her that all her old life and relations were passed away, and she had nothing now but David's, especially David's relatives. She shrank from lifting her eyes, expecting to find the third aunt, who was older, as much sourer and sharper in proportion to the other two. But she controlled herself and lifted her flower face to meet a gentle, meek, old face set in soft white frills of a cap, with white ribbons flying, and though the old lady leaned upon a crutch, she managed to give the impression that she had fairly flown in her gladness to welcome her new niece. There was the lighting of a repressed nature let free in her kind old face as she looked with true pleasure upon the lovely young one, and Marcia felt herself folded in truly loving arms in an embrace which her own passionate, much repressed, loving nature returned with heartiness. At last she had found a friend. She felt it every time she spoke, more and more. They walked out into the garden almost immediately, and Aunt Clorinda insisted upon hobbling along by Marcia's side, though her sisters both protested that it would be too hard for her that warm afternoon. Every time that Marcia spoke, she felt the kind old eyes upon her, and she knew that at least one of the aunts was satisfied with her as a wife for David, for her eyes would travel from David to Marcia and back again to David, and when they met Marcia's there was not a shade of disparagement in them. It was rather a tiresome walk through a tiresome old garden, laid out in the ways of the past generation, and bordered with much funeral box. The sisters, Amelia and Hortense, took the new member of the family conscientiously through every path, and faithfully told how each spot was associated with some happening in the family history. Occasionally there was a solemn pause for the purpose of properly impressing the new member of the house, and Amelia wiped her eyes with her carefully folded handkerchief. Marcia felt extremely like laughing. She was sure that if Kate had been obliged to pass through this ordeal, she would have giggled out at once and said some shockingly funny thing that would have horrified the aunts beyond forgiveness. The thought of this nerved her to keep a sober face. She wondered what David thought of it all, but when she looked at him she wondered no longer. For David stood as one waiting for a certain ceremony to be over, a ceremony which he knew to be inevitable, but which was wholly and familiarly uninteresting. He did not even see how it must strike the girl who was going through it all for him. For David's thoughts were out on the flood tide of sorrow, drifting against the rocks of the might have been. They went in to tea presently, just when the garden was growing loveliest, with a tinge of the setting sun, and Marcia longed to run up and down the little paths like a child and call to them all to catch her if they could. The house was dark and stately and gloomy. "'You are coming up to my room for a few minutes after supper.' whispered Aunt Clarinda encouragingly as they passed into the dark hall. The supper-table was alight with a fine old silver candelabra, whose many wavering lights cast a solemn, grotesque shadow on the different faces. Beside her plate the young bride saw an ostentatious plate of puffy soda biscuits, and involuntarily her eyes searched the table for the bread-plate. Aunt Clarinda almost immediately pounced upon the bread-plate and passed it with a smile to Marcia, and as Marcia, with an answering smile, took a generous slice, she heard the other two aunts exclaim in chorus, "'Oh, don't pass her the bread, Clorinda. Take it away, sister, quick. She does not like salt rising. It is unpleasant to her.' Then with blazing cheeks the girl protested that she wished to keep the bread, that they were mistaken. She had not said it was obnoxious to her, but had merely given them her stepmother's opinion when they asked. They must excuse her for her seeming rudeness, for she had not intended to hurt them. She presumed salt-rising bread was very nice. It looked beautiful. This was a long speech for shy Marcia to make before so many strangers, but David's wondering, troubled eyes were upon her, questioning what it all might mean, and she felt she could do anything to save David from more suffering or annoyance of any kind. David said little. He seemed to perceive that there had been an unpleasant prelude to this, and perhaps knew from former experience, 
that the best way to do was to change the subject. He launched into a detailed account of their wedding journey. Marcia, on her part, was grateful to him, for when she took the first brave bite into the very puffy, very white slice of bread she had taken, she perceived that it was much worse than that which had been baked for their homecoming, and not only justified all her stepmother's execrations, but in addition it was sour. For an instant, perceiving down the horoscope of time whole calendars full of such suppers with the aunts and this bread, her soul shuddered and shrank. Could she ever learn to like it? Impossible. Could she ever tolerate it? Could she? She doubted. Then she swallowed bravely and perceived that the impossible had been accomplished once. It could be again, but she must go slowly, else she might have to eat two slices instead of one. David was kind. He had roused himself to help his helper. Perhaps something in her girlish beauty and helplessness, helpless here for his sake, appealed to him. At least his eyes sought hers often with a tender interest to see if she were comfortable, and once when Aunt Amelia asked if they stopped nowhere for rest on their journey, his eyes sought Marcia's with a twinkling reminder of their roadside nap, and he answered, Once, Aunt Amelia. No, it was not a regular inn. It was quieter than that. Not many people stopping there. Marcia's merry laugh almost bubbled forth, but she suppressed it just in time, horrified to think what Aunt Hortense would say. But somehow after David had said that, her heart felt a trifle lighter, and she took a big bite from the salt rising and smiled as she swallowed it. There were worse things in the world, after all, than salt rising, and when one could smother it in Aunt Amelia's peach preserves, it was quite bearable. Aunt Clorinda slipped her off to her own room after supper and left the other two sisters with their beloved idol, David. In their stately parlor, lighted with many candles in honor of the occasion, they sat and talked in low tones with him their voices suggesting condolence with his misfortune of having married out of the family, and disapproval with the married state in general. Poor souls! How their hard, loving hearts would have been wrung could they but have known the true state of the case! And strange anomaly, how much deeper would have been their antagonism toward poor, self-sacrificing, loving Marcia! Just because she had dared to think herself fit for David, belonging as she did to her renegade sister Kate— but they did not know, and for this fact David was profoundly thankful. Those were not the days of rapid transit, of telegraph and telephone, nor even of much letter-writing, else the story would probably have reached the aunts even before the bride and bridegroom arrived at home. As it was, David had some hope of keeping the tragedy of his life from the ears of his aunts forever. Patiently he answered their questions concerning the wedding, questions that were intended to bring out facts, showing whether David had received his due amount of respect, and whether the family he had so greatly honored felt the burden of that honor sufficiently. Upstairs in a quaint old-fashioned room, Aunt Clorinda was taking Marcia's face in her two wrinkled hands, and looking lovingly into her eyes. Then she kissed her on each rosy cheek and said, Dear child, you look just as I did when I was young. You wouldn't think it from me now, would you? But it's true. I might not have grown to be such a dried-up old thing if I had had somebody like David. I'm so glad you've got David. He'll take good care of you. He's a dear boy. He's always been good to me. But you mustn't let the others crush those roses out of your cheeks. They crushed mine out. They wouldn't let me have my life the way I wanted it, and the pink in my cheeks all went back into my heart and bursted a good many years ago. But they can't spoil your life, for you've got David, and that's worth everything. Then she kissed her on the lips and cheeks and eyes and let her go but that one moment had given Marcia a glimpse into another life story, and put her in touch forever with Aunt Clorinda, setting athrob the cord of loving sympathy. When they came into the parlor, the other two aunts looked up with a quick, suspicious glance from one to the other, and then fastened disapproving eyes upon Marcia. They rather resented it that she was so pretty. Hannah had been their favorite, and Hannah was beautiful in their eyes. They wanted no other to outshine her albeit they would be proud enough before their neighbors to have it said that their nephew's wife was beautiful. After a chilling pause in which David was wondering anew at Marcia's beauty, Aunt Hortense asked, as though it were an omission from the former examination, Did you ever make a shirt? Oh, plenty of them, said Marcia with a merry laugh, so relieved that she fairly bubbled. I think I could make a shirt with my eyes shut. Aunt Clorinda beamed on her with delight. A shirt was something she had never succeeded in making right, 
It was one of the things which her sisters had against her that she could not make good shirts. Any one who could not make a shirt was deficient. Clorinda was deficient. She could not make a shirt. Meekly had she tried year after year. Humbly had she ripped out gusset and seam and band, having put them on upside down or inside out. Never could she learn the ins and outs of a shirt. But her old heart trembled with delight that the new girl, who was going to take the place in her heart of her old dead self, and live out all the beautiful things which had been lost to her, had mastered this one great accomplishment in which she had failed so supremely. But Aunt Hortense was not pleased. True, it was one of the seven virtues in her mind which a young wife should possess, and she had carefully instructed Hannah Heath for a number of years back while Hannah bungled out a couple for her father occasionally. But Aunt Hortense had been sure that if Hannah ever became David's wife, she might still have the honor of making most of David's shirts. That had been her happy task ever since David had worn a shirt, and she hoped to hold the position of shirt-maker to David until she left this mortal clay. Therefore, Aunt Hortense was not pleased, even though David's wife was not lacking, and, too, even though she foreheard herself telling her neighbors next day how many shirts David's wife had made. "'Well, David will not need any for some time,' she said grimly. "'I made him a dozen just before he was married.' Marcia reflected that it seemed to be impossible to make any headway into the good graces of either Aunt Hortense or Aunt Amelia. Aunt Amelia then took her turn at a question. Hortense, said she, and there was an ominous inflection in the word as if the question were portentous. Have you asked our new niece by which name she desires us to call her? I have not, said Miss Hortense solemnly. But I intend to do so immediately and then both pairs of steely eyes were leveled at the girl. Marcia suddenly was face to face with a question she had not considered, and David started upright from his position on the haircloth sofa. But if a thunderbolt had fallen from heaven and rendered him utterly unconscious, David would not have been more helpless than he was for the time being. Marcia saw the mingled pain and perplexity in David's face, and her own courage gathered itself to brave it out in some way. The color flew to her cheeks and rose slowly in David's, through heavy veins that swelled in his neck, till he could feel their pulsation against his stock. But his smooth, shaven lips were white. He felt that a moment had come which he could not bear to face. Then, with a hesitation that was but pardonable, and with a shy, sweet look, Marcia answered, and though her voice trembled just the least bit, her true, dear eyes looked into the battalion of steel ones bravely. I would like you to call me Marcia, if you please. Marcia? Miss Hortense snipped the word out as if with scissors of surprise. But there was a distinct relaxation about Miss Amelia's mouth. She heaved a relieved sigh. Marcia was so much better than Kate, so much more classical, so much more to be compared with Hannah, for instance. Well, I'm glad, she allowed herself to remark. David has been calling you Kate till it made me sick. Such a frivolous name and no sense in it either. Marcia sounds quite sensible. I suppose Catherine is your middle name. Do you spell it with a K or a C? But the knocker sounded on the street door, and Marcia was spared the torture of a reply. She dared not look at David's face, for she knew that there must be pain and mortification mingling there, and she hoped that the trying subject would not come up again for discussion. The guests began to arrive. Old Mrs. Heath and her daughter-in-law and granddaughter came first. Hannah's features were handsome, and she knew exactly how to manage her shapely hands with their long white fingers. The soft, delicate undersleeves fell away from arms white and well-molded, and she carried her height gracefully. Her hair was elaborately stowed upon the top of her head in many puffs, ending in little ringlets carelessly and coquettishly straying over temple or ears or gracefully curved neck. She wore a frock of green, and its color sent a pang through the bride's heart, to realize that perhaps it had been worn with an unkindly purpose. Nevertheless, Hannah Heath was beautiful and fascinated Marcia. She resolved to try to think the best of her and to make her a friend if possible. Why, after all, should she be to blame for wanting David? Was he not a man to be admired and desired? It was unwomanly, of course, that she had let it be known, but perhaps her relatives were more to blame than herself. At least Marcia made up her mind to try and like her. Hannah's frock was of silk, not a common material in those days, soft and shimmery and green enough to take away the heart from anything blue that was ever made. 
but Hannah was stately, and her skin as white as the lily she resembled in her bright leaf green. Hannah chose to be effusive and condescending to the bride, giving the impression that she and David had been like brother and sister all their lives, and that she might have been his choice if she had chosen, but as she had not chosen, she was glad that David had found someone wherewith to console himself. She did not say all this in so many words, but Marcia found that impression left after the evening was over. With sweet dignity, Marcia received her introductions, given in Miss Amelia's most commanding tone. Our niece, Marcia. Marcy, Marcy, the bride heard old Mrs. Heath murmur to Miss Spafford. Why, I thought twas to be Kate. Her name is Marcia, said Miss Amelia in a most satisfied tone. You must have misunderstood. Marcia caught a look in Miss Heath's eyes, alert, keen, questioning, which flashed all over her like something searching and bright, but not friendly. She felt a painful shyness stealing over her and wished that David were by her side. She looked across the room at him. His face had recovered its usual calmness, though he looked pale. He was talking on his favorite theme with old Mr. Heath, the newly invented steam engine and its possibilities. He had forgotten everything else for the time, and his face lighted with animation as he tried to answer William Heath's arguments against it. "'Have you read what the Boston Courier said, David? Long in June it was, I think,' Marcia heard Mr. Heath ask. Indeed, his voice was so large that it filled the room, and for the moment Marcia had been left to herself while some new people were being ushered in. "'It says, David, that the project of a railroad from Boston to Albany is impracticable.' as everybody knows who knows the simplest rule of arithmetic and the expense would be little less than the market value of the whole territory of massachusetts and which if practicable every person of common sense knows would be as useless as a railroad from boston to the moon there david what do you think of that and william heath slapped david on the knee with his broad fat fist and laughed heartily as though he had him in a tight corner Marcia would have given a good deal to slip in beside David on the sofa and listen to the discussion. She wanted with all her heart to know how he would answer this man who could be so insufferably wise, but there was other work for her, and her attention was brought back to her own uncomfortable part by Hannah Heath's voice. "'Come right over here, Mr. Skinner, if you want to meet the bride. You must speak very nice to me, or I shan't introduce you at all.' A tall, lanky man with stiff, sandy hair and a rubicund complexion was making his way around the room. He had a small mouth puckered a little as if he might be going to whistle, and his chin had the look of having been pushed back out of the way. A stiff fuzz of sandy whiskers made a hedge down either cheek, and but for that he was clean-shaven. The skin over his high cheekbones was stretched smooth and tight, as if it were a trifle too close a fit for the genial cushion beneath. He did not look brilliant, and he certainly was not handsome, but there was an inoffensive desire to please about him. He was introduced as Mr. Lemuel Skinner. He bowed low over Marcia's hand, said a few embarrassed, stiff sentences, and turned to Hannah Heath with relief. It was evident that Hannah was in his eyes a great and shining light, to which he fluttered as naturally as does the moth to the candle. But Hannah did not scruple to singe his wings whenever she chose. Perhaps she knew, no matter how badly he was burned, he would only flutter back again whenever she scintillated. She had turned her back upon him now, and left him to Marcia's tender mercies. Hannah was engaged in talking to a younger man. Harry Temple from New York, Lemuel explained to Marcia. The young man, Harry Temple, had large, lazy eyes and heavy, dark hair. There was a discontented look in his face, and a looseness about the set of his lips that Marcia did not like, although she had to admit that he was handsome. Something about him reminded her of Captain Leavenworth, and she instinctively shrank from him. But Harry Temple had no mind to talk to anyone but Marcia that evening, and he presently so managed it that he and she were ensconced in a corner of the room away from others. Marcia felt perturbed. She did not feel flattered by the man's attentions, and she wanted to be at the other end of the room listening to the conversation. She listened as intently as she might between sentences, and her keen ears could catch a word or two of what David was saying. After all, it was not so much the new railroad project that she cared about, though that was strange and interesting enough, but she wanted to watch and listen to David. Harry Temple said a great many pretty things to Marcia. She did not half hear some of them at first, but after a time she began to realize that she must have made a good impression, 
and the pretty flush in her cheeks grew deeper. She did little talking. Mr. Temple did it all. He told her of New York. He asked if she were not dreadfully bored with this little town and its doings, and bewailed her lot when he learned that she had not had much experience there. Then he asked if she had ever been to New York and began to tell of some of its attractions. Among other things he mentioned some concerts, and immediately Marcia was all attention. Her dark eyes glowed, and her speaking face gave eager response to his words. Seeing he had interested her at last, he kept on, for he was a possessor of a glib tongue, and what he did not know he could fabricate without the slightest compunction. He had been about the world and gathered up superficial knowledge enough to help him do this admirably. Therefore he was able to use a few musical terms, and to bring before Marcia's vivid imagination the scene of the performance of Haydn's great creation given in Boston, and of certain musical events that were to be attempted soon in New York. He admitted that he could play a little upon the harpsichord, and when he learned that Marcia could play also, and that she was the possessor of a piano, one of the latest improved makes, he managed to invite himself to play upon it. Marcia found to her dismay that she actually seemed to have invited him to come some afternoon when her husband was away. She had only said politely that she would like to hear him play some time, and expressed her great delight in music, and he had done the rest. But in her inexperience somehow it had happened, and she did not know what to do. It troubled her a good deal, and she turned again toward the other end of the room where the attention of most of the company was riveted upon the group who were discussing the railroad, its pros and cons. David was the center of that group. "'Let us go over and hear what they are saying,' she said, turning to her companion eagerly. "'Oh, it is all stupid politics and arguments about that ridiculous fairy tale of a railroad scheme. You would not enjoy it,' answered the young man disappointedly. He saw in Marcia a beautiful young soul, the only one who had really attracted him since he had left New York, and he wished to become intimate enough with her to enjoy himself. It mattered not to him that she was married to another man. He felt secure in his own attractions. He had ever been able to while away the time with whom he chose. Why should a simple village maiden resist him? And this was an unusual one. The contour of her head was like a Greek statue. Nevertheless, he was obliged to stroll after her. Once she had spoken. She had suddenly become aware that they had been in their corner together a long time, and that Aunt Amelia's cold eyes were fastened upon her in disapproval. "'The farmers would be ruined, man alive,' Mr. Heath was saying. "'Why, all the horses would have to be killed, because they would be wholly useless if this new fandango came in, and then would where be a market for the wheat and oats?' "'Yes, and I've heard some say the hens wouldn't lay on account of the noise,' ventured Lemuel Skinner in his high voice and think of the fires from the sparks of the engine. I tell you it would be dangerous. He looked over at Hannah triumphantly, but Hannah was endeavoring to signal Harry Temple to her side and did not see nor hear. I tell you, put in Mr. Heath's heavy voice again, I tell you, Dave, it can't be done. It's impractical. Why, no car could advance against the wind. They told Columbus he couldn't sail around the earth, but he did it. There was sudden stillness in the room, for it was Marcia's clear, grave voice that had answered Mr. Heath's excited tones, and she had not known she was going to speak aloud. It came before she realized it. She had been used to speak her mind sometimes with her father, but seldom when there were others by, and now she was covered with confusion to think what she had done. The aunts, Amelia and Hortense, were shocked. It was so unladylike. A woman should not speak on such subjects. She should be silent and leave such topics to her husband. Dear me, she's strong-minded, isn't she? Giggled Hannah Heath to Lemuel, who had taken the signals to himself and come to her side. Quite so, quite so, murmured Lemuel, his lips looking puffier and more cherryfied than ever, and his chin flattened itself back till he looked like a frustrated old hen who did not understand the perplexities of life and was clucking to find out, after having been startled half out of its senses. But Marcia was not wholly without consolation, for David had flashed a look of approval at her, and had made room for her to sit down by his side on the sofa. It was almost like belonging to him for a minute or two. Marcia felt her heart glow with something new and pleasant. Mr. William Heath drew his heavy gray brows together and looked at her grimly over his spectacles, poking his bristly underlip out in astonishment, bewildered that he should have been answered by a gentle pretty woman, all frills and sparkle like his own daughter. He had been wont to look upon a woman as something like a kitten, that is, a young woman, 
and suddenly the kitten had lifted a velvet paw and struck him squarely in the face. He had felt there were claws in the blow, too, for there had been a truth behind her words that set the room a-mocking him. "'Well, Dave, you've got your wife well-trained already,' <laughs> he laughed, concluding it was best to put a smiling front upon the defeat. "'She knows just when to come in and help when your side's getting weak.' They served cake and raspberry vinegar then, and a little while after everybody went home. It was later than the hours usually kept in the village, and the lights in most of the houses were out, or burning dimly in upper stories. The voices of the guests sounded subdued in the misty waning moonlight air. Marcia could hear Hannah Heath's voice ahead, giggling affectedly to Harry Temple and Lemuel Skinner as they walked one on either side of her, while her father and mother and grandmother came more slowly. David drew Marcia's hand within his arm and walked with her quietly down the street, making their steps hushed instinctively that they might so seem more removed from the others. They were both tired with the unusual excitement and the strain they had been through, and each was glad of the silence of the other. But when they reached their own doorstep, David said, "'You spoke well, child. You must have thought about these things.' Marcia felt a sob rising in a tide of joy into her throat. Then he was not angry with her, and he did not disapprove as the two aunts had done. Aunt Clorinda had kissed her good night and murmured, "'You are a bright little girl, Marcia, and you will make a good wife for David. You will come soon to see me, won't you?' And that had made her glad. But these words of David's were so good and so unexpected that Marcia could hardly hide her happy tears. "'I was afraid I had been forward,' murmured Marcia in the shadow of the front stoop. Not at all, child. I like to hear a woman speak her mind. That is, allowing she has any mind to speak. That can't be said of all women. There's Hannah Heath, for instance. I don't believe she would know a railroad project from an essay on ancient art. After that, the house seemed a pleasant place, aglow as they entered it, and Marcia went up to her rest with a lighter heart. But the child knew not that she had made a great impression that night upon all who saw her as being beautiful and wise. The aunts would not express it even to each other, for they felt in duty bound to discountenance her boldness in speaking out before the men and making herself so prominent, joining in their discussions. But each, in spite of her convictions, felt a deep satisfaction that their neighbors had seen what a beautiful and bright wife David had selected. They even felt triumphant over their favorite Hannah and thought secretly that Marcia compared well with her in every way but they would not have told this even to themselves, no, not for worlds. So the kindly gossipy town slept, and the young bride became a part of its daily life. End of chapter 12Life began to take on a more familiar and interesting aspect to Marcia after that. She had her daily round of pleasant household duties, and she enjoyed them. There were many other gatherings in honor of the bride and groom, tea drinkings and evening calls, and a few called into a neighbor's house to meet them. It was very pleasant to Marcia as she became better acquainted with the people and grew to like some of them. Only there was the constant drawback of feeling that it was all a pain and weariness to David. But Marcia was young, and it was only natural that she should enjoy her sudden promotion to the privileges of a matron, and the marked attention that was paid her. It was a mercy that her head was not turned, living as she did to herself, and with no one in whom she could confide. For David had shrunk within himself to such an extent that she did not like to trouble him with anything. It was only two days after the evening at the old Spafford house that David came home to tea with ashen face, haggard eyes, and white lips. He scarcely tasted his supper and said he would go and lie down, that his head ached. Marcia heard him sigh deeply as he went upstairs. It was that afternoon that the post had brought him Kate's letter. Sadly, Marcia put away the tea things, for she could not eat anything either, though it was an unusually inviting meal she had prepared. Slowly she went up to her room and sat looking out into the quiet, darkening summer night, wondering what additional sorrow had come to David. David's face looked like death the next morning when he came down. He drank a cup of coffee feverishly, then took his hat as if he would go to the office, but paused at the door and came back saying he would not go if Marcia would not mind taking a message for him. His head felt badly. She need only tell the man to go on with things as they had planned and say he was detained. 
Marcia was ready at once to do his bidding with quiet sympathy in her manner. She delivered her message with the frank, straightforward look of a schoolgirl, mingled with a touch of matronly dignity she was trying to assume which added to her charm, and she smiled her open smile of comradeship, such as she would have dispensed about the old red schoolhouse at home, upon boys and girls alike, leaving the clerk and typesetters in a most subjected state, and ready to do anything in the service of their master's wife. It is to be feared that they almost envied David. They watched her as she moved gracefully down the street, and their eyes had a reverent look as they turned away from the window to their work, as though they had been looking upon something sacred. Harry Temple watched her come out of the office. She impressed him again as something fresh and different from the common run of maidens in the village. He lazily stepped from the store where he had been lounging, and walked down the street to intercept her as she crossed and turned the corner. "'Good morning, Mrs. Spafford,' he said with a courtly grace that was certainly captivating. "'Are you going to your home? Then our ways lie together. May I walk beside you?' Marcia smiled and tried to seem gracious, though she would rather have been alone just then, for she wanted to enjoy the day and not be bothered with talking. Harry Temple mentioned having a letter from a friend in Boston who had lately heard a great chorus rendered. He could not be quite sure of the name of the composer because he had read the letter hurriedly, and his friend was a blind writer. But that made no difference to Harry. He could fill in facts enough about the grandeur of the music from his own imagination to make up for the lack of a little matter like the name of a composer. He was keen enough to see that Marcia was more interested in music than in anything he said. Therefore he racked his brains for all the music talk he had ever heard, and made up what he did not know, which was not hard to do, for Marcia was very ignorant on the subject. At the door they paused. Marcia was eager to get in. She began to wonder how David felt, and she longed to do something for him. Harry Temple looked at her admiringly, noted the dainty set of chin, the clear curve of cheek, the lovely sweep of eyelashes, and resolved to get better acquainted with this woman so young and so lovely. "'I have not forgotten my promise to play for you,' he said lightly, watching to see if the flush of rose would steal into her cheek and that deep light into her expressive eyes. "'How about this afternoon? Shall you be at home and disengaged?' But welcome did not flash into Marcia's face as he had hoped. Instead, a troubled look came into her eyes. "'I am afraid it will not be possible this afternoon,' said Marcia, the trouble in her eyes creeping into her voice. "'That is... I expect to be at home, but I am not sure of being disengaged. Ah, I see, he raised his eyebrows archly, looking her meanwhile straight in the eyes. Someone else more fortunate than I. Someone else coming? Although Marcia did not in the least understand his insinuation, the color flowed into her cheeks in a hurry now, for she instinctively felt that there was something unpleasant in his tone, something below her standard of morals or culture. She did not quite know what, but she felt she must protect herself at any cost. She drew up a little mantle of dignity. Oh, no, she said quickly. I'm not expecting anyone at all. But Mr. Spafford had a severe headache this morning, and I am not sure but the sound of the piano would make it worse. I think it would be better for you to come another time, although he may be better by that time. Oh, I see. Your husband's at home, said the young man with relief. His manner implied that he had a perfect understanding of something that Marcia did not mean nor comprehend. "'I understand perfectly,' he said with another meaning smile, as though he and she had a secret together. "'I'll come some other time.' And he took himself very quickly away, much to Marcia's relief. But the trouble did not go out of her eyes as she saw him turn the corner. Instead, she went in and stood at the dining-room window a long time, looking out on the Heath's hollyhocks beaming in the sun behind the picket fence, and wondered what he could have meant, and why he smiled in that hateful way. She decided she did not like him, and she hoped he would never come. She did not think she would care to hear him play. There was something about him that reminded her of Captain Leavenworth, and now that she saw it in him, she would dislike to have him about." With a sigh, she turned to the getting of a dinner which she feared would not be eaten. Nevertheless, she put more dainty thought in it than usual, and when it was done and steaming upon the table, she went gently up and tapped on David's door. A voice hoarse with emotion and weariness answered. Marcia scarcely heard the first time. "'Dinner is ready. 
Isn't your head any better? David? There was caressing in his name. It wrung David's heart. Oh, if it were but Kate, his Kate, his little bride that were calling him, how his heart would leap with joy, how his headache would disappear and he would be with her in an instant. For Kate's letter had had its desired effect. All her wrongdoings, her crowning outrage of his noble intentions had been forgotten in the one little plaintive appeal she had managed to breathe in a minor wail throughout that treacherous letter, treacherous alike to her husband and to her lover. Just as Kate had always been able to do with everyone about her, she had blinded him to her faults and managed to put herself in the light of an abused, troubled maiden who was in a predicament through no fault of her own and sat in sorrow and a baby innocence that was bewilderingly sweet. There had been times when David's anger had been hot enough to waft away this filmy mist of fancies that Kate had woven about herself and let him see the true Kate as she really was. At such times David would confess that she must be wholly heartless. That bright as she was, it was impossible for her to have been so easily persuaded into running away with a man she did not love. He had never found it so easy to persuade her against her will. Did she love him? Had she truly loved him, and was she suffering now? His very soul writhed in agony to think of his bride, the wife of another, against her will. If he might but go and rescue her, if he might but kill that other man, then his soul would be confronted with the thought of murder. Never before had he felt hate, such hate, for a human being. Then again his heart would soften toward him as he felt how the other must have loved her, Kate, his little wild rose, and there was a fellow-feeling between them too, for had she not let him see that she did not half care aright for that other one? Then his mind would stop in a whirl of mingled feeling and he would pause and pray for steadiness to think and know what was right. Around and around through this maze of arguing he had gone through the long hours of the morning, always coming sharp against the thought that there was nothing he could possibly do in the matter but bear it, and that Kate, after all, the Kate he loved with his whole soul had done it, and must therefore be to blame. Then he would read her letter over, burning every word of it upon his brain, until the piteous minor appeal would torture him once more, and he would begin again to try to get hold of some thread of thought that would unravel this snarl and bring peace. Like a sound from another world came Marcia's sweet voice, its very sweetness reminding him of that other lost voice whose tantalizing music floated about his imagination like a string of phantom silver bells that all but sounded and then vanished into silence. And while all this was going on, this spiritual torture, his living, suffering physical self was able to summon its thoughts, to answer gently that he did not want any dinner, that his head was no better, that he thanked her for her thought of him, and that he would take the tea she offered if it was not too much trouble." Gladly, with hurried breath and fingers that almost trembled, Marcia hastened to the kitchen once more and prepared a dainty tray, not even glancing at the dinner table all so fine and ready for its guest, and back again she went to his door, an eager light in her eyes, as if she had obtained audience to a king. He opened the door this time and took the tray from her with a smile. It was a smile of ashen hue, and fell like a pall upon Marcia's soul. It was as if she had been permitted for a moment to gaze upon a martyred soul upon the rack. Marcia fled from it and went to her own room where she flung herself on her knees beside her bed and buried her face in the pillows. There she knelt, unmindful of the dinner waiting downstairs, unmindful of the bright day that was droning on its hours. Whether she prayed she knew not, whether she was weeping she could not have told. Her heart was crying out in one great longing to have this cloud of sorrow that had settled upon David lifted. She might have knelt there until night, had there not come the sound of a knock upon the front door. It startled her to her feet in an instant, and she hastily smoothed her rumpled hair, dashed some water on her eyes, and ran down. It was the clerk from the office with a letter for her. The post-chase had brought it that afternoon, and he had thought perhaps she would like to have it at once, as it was postmarked from her home. Would she tell Mr. Spafford when he returned? He seemed to take it for granted that David was out of town for the day. 
that everything had been going on all right at the office during his absence, and the paper was ready to send to press. He took his departure with a series of bows and smiles, and Marcia flew up to her room to read her letter. It was in the round, unformed hand of Mary Ann. Marcia tore it open eagerly. Never had Mary Ann's handwriting looked so pleasant as at that moment. A letter in those days was a rarity at all times, and this one to Marcia in her distress of mind seemed little short of a miracle. It began in Mary Ann's abrupt way, and opened up to her the world of home since she had left it. But a few short days had passed, scarcely yet numbering into weeks since she left, yet it seemed half a lifetime to the girl promoted so suddenly into womanhood without the accompanying joy of love and close companionship that usually makes desolation impossible. Dear Marsh, the letter ran, I expect you think queer of me to write you so soon. I ain't much on writing, you know, but something happened right after you leaving and it's kept right on happening that made me feel I kinder like to tell you. Don't you mind the mistakes I make. I'm thankful to goodness you ain't the school teacher, or I'd never write so long as I'm living. But anyhow, I'm going to tell you all about it. The night you went away, I was standing down by the gate under the old elm. I had on my best things yet from the wedding, and I hated to go in and have the day over, and have to begin putting on my old calico tomorrow morning again, and washing dishes just the same. Seemed as if I couldn't bear to have the world just the same now you was gone away. Well, I heard someone coming down the street, and who do you think it was? Why, Hanford Weston. He came right up to the gate and stopped. I don't know's he ever spoke two words to me in my life, except that time he stopped the big boys from snowballing me and told me to run along quick and get in the schoolhouse while he fit em. Well, he stopped and spoke, and he looked so sad. Seemed like I knew just what he was feeling sad about. And I told him all about you getting married instead of your sister. He looked at me like he couldn't move for a while, and his face was as white as that marble man in the cemetery over Squire Hancock's grave. He grabbed the gate real hard, and I thought he was going to fall. He couldn't even move his lips for a while. I felt just awful sorry for him. Something came in my throat like a big stone, and my eyes got all blurred with the moonlight. He looked real handsome. I just couldn't help thinking you ought to see him. By and by he got his voice back again, and we talked a lot about you. He told me how he used to watch you when you was a little girl wearing pantalets. You used to sit in the church pew across from his father's, and he could just see your big eyes over the top of the door. He says he always thought to himself he would marry you when he grew up. Then when you began to go to school and was so bright, he tried hard to study and keep up just to have you think him good enough for you. He owned up he was a bad speller, and he'd tried his level best to do better, but it didn't seem to come natural, and he thought maybe ef he was a good farmer, you wouldn't mind about the spelling. He hired out to his father for the summer, and he was trying with all his might to get to be the kind of man t'would suit you, and then when he was plowing and planning all what kind of a house with big columns to the front he would build, here comes the coach driving by and you in it. He said he thought the sky and fields was all mixed up, and his heart was going out of him. He couldn't work any more, and he started out after supper to see what it all meant. That wasn't just the exact way he told it, Marsh. It was more like poetry, that kind in our reader about Lord Ullen's daughter, you know. We used to recite it on examination exhibition. I didn't know Hanford could talk like that. His words were real pretty, kind of sorrowful, you know. And it all come over me that you ought to know about it. You're married, of course, and can't help it now. But taint every girl that has a boy care for her like that from the time she's a baby with a red hood on. And you ought to know about it, for it wasn't Hanford's fault he didn't have time to tell you. He's just been living for you for a number of years, and it's kind of hard on him. Course you may not care, being you're married and have a fine house and lots of clothes of your own and a good time, but it does seem hard for him. It seems as if somebody ought to comfort him. I'd like to try, if you don't mind. He does seem to like to talk about you to me, and I feel so sorry for him, I guess I could comfort him a little. 
for it seems as if it would be the nicest thing in the world to have someone like you that way for years, just as they do in books. Only every time I think about being a comfort to him, I think he belongs to you and it ain't right. So, Marsh, you just speak out and say if you're willing I should try to comfort him a little and make up to him for what he lost in you, being as you're married and fixed so nice yourself. Of course I know I ain't pretty like you, nor can't hold my head proud and step high as you always did, even when you was little, but I can feel, and perhaps that's something. Anyhow, Hanford's been down three times to talk about you to me, and if you don't mind, I'm going to let him come some more. But if you mind the leastest little bit, I want you should say so, for things are mixed in this world, and I don't want to get to trampling on any other person's feelings, much less you who have always been my best friend and always will be as long as I live, I guess. Remember how we used to play house on the old flat stone in the orchard, and you give me all the prettiest pieces of china with sprigs on em? I ain't forgot that and never will. I shall always say you made the prettiest bride I ever saw, no matter how many more I see, and I hope you won't forget me. It's lonesome here without you. If it wasn't for comforting Hanford, I shouldn't care much for anything. I can't think of you a grown-up woman. Do you feel any different? I suppose you wouldn't climb a fence nor run through the pasture lot for anything now. Have you got a lot of new friends? I wish I could see you. And now, Marsh, I want you to write right off and tell me what to do about comforting Hanford. And if you've any message to send to him, I think it would be real nice. I hope you've got a good husband and are happy. From your devoted and loving schoolmate, Mary Ann Fothergill. Marcia laid down the letter and buried her face in her hands. To her, too, had come a thrust which must search her life and change it. So while David wrestled with his sorrow, Marcia entered upon the knowledge of her own heart. There was something in this revelation by Mary Ann of Hanford Weston's feelings toward her that touched her immeasurably. Had it all happened before she left home, had Hanford come to her and told her of his love, she would have turned from him in dismay, almost disgust and have told him that they were both but children. How could they talk of love? She could never have loved him. She would have felt it instantly, and her mocking laugh might have done a good deal toward saving him from sorrow. But now, with miles between them, with the wall of the solemn marriage vows to separate them forever, with her own youth locked up, as she supposed, until the day of eternity should perhaps set it free, with no hope of any bright dream of life such as girls have, could she turn from even a schoolboy's love without a passing tenderness, such as she would never have felt if she had not come away from it all? Told in Mary Ann's blunt way, with her crude attempts at pathos, it reached her as it could not otherwise. With her own new view of life, she could sympathize better with another's disappointments. Perhaps her own loneliness gave her pity for another. Whatever it was, Marcia's heart suddenly turned toward Hanford Weston with a great throb of gratitude. She felt that she had been loved, even though it had been impossible for that love to be returned, and that whatever happened, she would not go unloved down to the end of her days. Suddenly, out of the midst of the perplexity of her thoughts, there formed a distinct knowledge of what was lacking in her life, a lack she had never felt before, and probably would not have felt now had she not thus suddenly stepped into a place much beyond her years. It seemed to the girl, as she sat in the great chintz chair and read and re-read that letter, as if she lived years that afternoon, and all her life was to be changed henceforth. It was not that she was sorry that she could not go back, and live out her girlhood and have it crowned with Hanford Weston's love. Not at all. She knew, as well now as she had ever known, that he could never be anything to her. But she knew also, or thought she knew, that he could have given her something, in his clumsy way, that now she could never have from any man, seeing she was David's, and David could not love her that way, of course. Having come to this conclusion, she arose and wrote a letter, giving and bequeathing to Mary Ann Fothergill all right, title, and claim to the affections of Hanford Weston, past, present, and future, sending him a message calculated to smooth his ruffled feelings, with her pretty thanks for his youthful adoration, comfort his sorrow with the thought that it must have been a hallucination, that some day he would find his true ideal, which he had only thought he had found in her, and send him on his way rejoicing with her blessings and good wishes for a happy life. As for Marianne, 
for once she received her meed of Marcia's love, for homesick Marcia felt more tenderness for her than she had ever been able to feel before. And Marcia's loving messages set Mary Ann in a flutter of delight as she laid her plans for comforting Hanford Weston. End of chapter 13「David slowly recovered his poise. Faced by that terrible, impenetrable wall of impossibility, he stood helpless, his misery eating in upon his soul, but there still remained the fact that there was nothing, absolutely nothing, which he could possibly do. At times the truth rose to the surface, the wretched truth, that Kate was at fault, that having done the deed she should abide by it, and not try to keep a hold upon him. But it was not often he was able to think in this way. Most of the time he mourned over and for the lovely girl he had lost. As for Marcia, she came and went unobtrusively, making quiet comfort for David, which he scarcely noticed. At times he roused himself to be polite to her, and made a labored effort to do something to amuse her, just as if she had been visiting him as a favor, and he felt in duty bound to make the time pass pleasantly. But she troubled him so little with herself that nearly always he forgot her. Whenever there was any public function to which they were bidden, he always told her apologetically, as though it must be as much of a bore to her as to him, and he regretted that it was necessary to go in order to carry out their mutual agreement. Marcia, hailing with delight every chance to go out in search of something which would keep her from thinking the new thoughts which had come to her, demurely covered her pleasure and dressed herself dutifully in the robes made for her sister, hating them secretly the while, and was always ready when he came for her. David had nothing to complain of in his wife, so far as outward duty was concerned, but he was too busy with his own heart's bitterness to even recognize it. One afternoon, of a day when David had gone out of town not expecting to return until late in the evening, there came a knock at the door. There was something womanish in the knock, Marcia thought, as she hastened to answer it, and she wondered, hurriedly smoothing her shining hair, if it could be the aunts come to make their fortnightly afternoon penance visit. She gave a hasty glance into the parlor, hoping all was right, and was relieved to make sure she had closed the piano. The aunts would consider it a great breach of housewifely decorum to allow a moment's dust to settle upon its sacred keys. But it was not the aunts who stood upon the stoop, smiling and bowing with a handsome assurance of his own welcome. It was Harry Temple. Marcia was not glad to see him. A sudden feeling of unreasoning alarm took possession of her. "'You're all alone this time, sweet lady, aren't you?' he asked with easy nonchalance as he lounged into the hall without waiting her bidding. "'Sir!' said Marcia, half frightened, half wondering. But he smiled reassuringly down upon her and took the doorknob in his own hands to close the door. "'Your good man is out this time, isn't he?' he smiled again most delightfully. His face was very handsome when he smiled. He knew this fact well. Marcia did not smile. Why did he speak as if he knew where David was, and seemed to be pleased that he was away? "'My husband is not in at present,' she said guardedly, her innocent eyes searching his face. "'Did you wish to see him?' She was beautiful as she stood there in the wide hall, with only the light from the high transom over the door, shedding an afternoon glow through its pleated Swiss oval. She looked more sweet and little girlish than ever and he felt a strong desire to take her in his arms and tell her so. Only he feared from something he saw in those wide sweet eyes that she might take alarm and run away too soon. So he only smiled and said that his business with her husband could wait until another time, and meantime he had called to fulfill his promise to play for her. She took him into the darkened parlor, gave him the stiffest and stateliest haircloth chair, but he walked straight over to the instrument, and with not at all the reverence she liked to treat it, flung back the coverings, threw the lid open, and sat down. He had white fingers, and he ran them over the keys with an air of being at home among them, light little airs dripping from his touch like dew from a glistening grass blade. Marcia felt there were butterflies in the air, and buzzing bees, and fairy flowers dancing on the slightest of stems, with a sky so blue it seemed to be filled with the sound of lily-bells. 
The music he played was of the nature of what would be styled today popular, for this man was master of nothing but having a good time. Quick music with a jingle he played. That to the puritanic bred girl suggested nothing but a heart bubbling over with gladness. But he meant it should make her heart flutter and her foot beat time to the tripping measure. In his world feet were attuned to gay music. But Marcia stood with quiet dignity, a little away from the instrument, her lips parted, her eyes bright with the pleasure of the melody, her hands clasped, and her breath coming quickly. She was all absorbed with the music. All unknowingly, Marcia had placed herself where the light from the window fell full across her face, and every flitting expression as she followed the undulant sounds was visible. The young man gazed, almost as much pleased with the lovely face as Marcia was with the music. At last he drew a chair quite near his own seat. "'Come and sit down,' he said, "'and I will sing to you. "'You did not know I could sing too, did you? "'Oh, but I can. "'But you must sit down, "'for I couldn't sing right when you are standing.' He ended with his fascinating smile, and Marcia shyly sat down, though she drew the chair a bit back from where he had placed it, and sat up quite straight and stiff with her shoulders erect and her head up. She had forgotten her distrust of the man in what seemed to her his wonderful music. It was all new and strange to her, and she could not know how little there really was to it. She had decided as he played that she liked the kind best that made her think of the birds and the sunny sky, rather than the wild whirly kind that seemed all a mad scramble. She meant to ask him to play over again what he had played at the beginning, but he struck into a Scotch love ballad. The melody intoxicated her fancy, and her face shone with pleasure. She had not noticed the words particularly, save that they were of love, and she thought with pain of David and Kate, and how the pleading tenderness might have been his heart calling to hers not to forget his love for her. But Harry Temple mistook her expression for one of interest in himself. With his eyes still upon hers, as a cat might mesmerize a bird, he changed into a minor wail of heartbroken love, whose sadness brought great tears to Marcia's eyes, and deep color to her already burning cheeks, while the music throbbed out her own half-realized loneliness and sorrow. It was as if the sounds painted for her a picture of what she had missed out of love, and set her sorrow flowing tangibly. The last note died away in an impressive diminuendo, and the young man turned toward her. His eyes were languishing, his voice gentle, persuasive, as though it had but been the song come a little nearer. "'And that is the way I feel toward you, dear,' he said, and reached out his white hands to where hers lay forgotten in her lap. But his hands had scarcely touched hers before Marcia sprang back, in her haste knocking over the chair. Erect, her hands snatched behind her, frightened, alert, she stood a moment bewildered, all her fears to the front. Ah, but he was used to shy maidens, he was not to be baffled thus. A little coaxing, a little gentle persuasion, a little boldness, that was all he needed. He had conquered hearts before. Why should he not this unsophisticated one? Don't be afraid, dear. There is no one about. And surely there is no harm in telling you I love you, and letting you comfort my poor broken heart, to think that I have found you too late. He had arisen, and with a passionate gesture put his arms about Marcia, and before she could know what was coming had pressed a kiss upon her lips. But she was aroused now. Every angry force within her was fully awake. Every sense of right and justice inherited and taught came flocking forward. Horror unspeakable filled her, and wrath that such a dreadful thing should come to her. There was no time to think. She brought her two strong, supple hands up and beat him in the face, mouth, cheeks, and eyes with all her might, until he turned blinded, and then she struggled away, crying, "'You are a wicked man!' and fled from the room. Out through the hall she sped to the kitchen, and flinging wide the door before her, the nearest one at hand, she fairly flew down the garden walk, past the nodding dahlias, past the basking pumpkins, past the whispering corn, down through the berry bushes, at the lower end of the lot, and behind the currant bushes. She crouched a moment, looking back to see if she were pursued. Then imagining she heard a noise from the open door, she scrambled over the low back fence, the high comb with which her hair was fastened falling out unheeded behind her, 
and all her dark waves of hair coming about her shoulders in wild disarray. She was in a field of wheat now, and the tall shocks were like waves all about her, thick and close, kissing her as she passed with their bended stalks. Ahead of her it looked like an endless sea to cross before she could reach another fence and a bare field, and then another fence and the woods. She knew not that in her wake she left a track as clear as if she had set up signals all along the way. She felt that the kind wheat would flow back like real waves and hide the way she had passed over. She only sped on to the woods. In all the wide world there seemed no refuge but the woods. The woods were home to her. She loved the tall shadows, the whispering music in the upper branches, the quiet places underneath, the hushed silence like a city of refuge with cool wings whereunder to hide. And to it, as her only friend, she was hastening. She went to the woods as she would have flown to the minister's wife at home, if she only had been near, and buried her face in her lap and sobbed out her horror and shame. Breathless she sped, without looking once behind her, now over the next fence, and still another. They were nothing to her. She forgot that she was wearing Kate's special sprigged muslin, and that it might tear on the rough fences. She forgot that she was a matron and must not run wild through strange fields. She forgot that someone might be watching her. She forgot everything save that she must get away and hide her poor shamed face. At last she reached the shelter of the woods, and with one wild furtive look behind her to assure herself that she was not pursued, she flung herself into the lap of Mother Earth and buried her face in the soft moss at the foot of a tree. There she sobbed out her horror and sorrow and loneliness, sobbed until it seemed to her that her heart had gone out with great shudders sobbed and sobbed and sobbed for a time she could not even think clearly her brain was confused with the magnitude of what had come to her she tried to go over the whole happening that afternoon and see if she might have prevented anything she blamed herself most unmercifully for listening to the foolish music and too after her own suspicions had been aroused though how could she dream any man in his senses would do a thing like that not even Captain Leavenworth would stoop to that, she thought. Poor child, she knew so little of the world, and her world had been kept so sweet and pure and free from contamination. She turned cold at the thought of her father's anger if he should hear about this strange young man. She felt sure he would blame her for allowing it. He had tried to teach his girls that they must exercise judgment and discretion, and surely, surely she must have failed in both, or this would not have happened. Oh, why had not the aunts come that afternoon? Why had they not arrived before this man came? And yet, oh, horror, if they had come after he was there, how disgusting he seemed to her with his smirky smile and slim white fingers! How utterly unfit beside David did he seem to breathe the same air, even! David! Her David! No, Kate's David! Oh, pity! What a pain the world was! There was nowhere to turn that she might find a trace of comfort, for what would David say, and how could she ever tell him? Would he find it out if she did not? What would he think of her? Would he blame her? Oh, the agony of it all! What would the aunts think of her? Ah, that was worse than all, for even now she could see the tilt of Aunt Hortense's head and the purse of Aunt Amelia's lips. How dreadful if they should have to know of it! They would not believe her, unless perhaps Aunt Clorinda might. She did not look wise, but she seemed kind and loving. If it had not been for the other two, she might have fled to Aunt Clorinda. Oh, if she might but flee home to her father's house! How could she ever go back to David's house? How could she ever play on that dreadful piano again? She would always see that hateful, smiling face sitting there, and think how he had looked at her. Then she shuddered and sobbed harder than ever and Mother Earth, true to all her children, received the poor child with open arms. There she lay upon the resinous pine needles, at the foot of the tall trees, and the trees looked down tenderly upon her and consulted in whispers with their heads bent together. The winds blew sweetness from the buckwheat fields in the valley about her, murmuring delicious music in the air above her, and even the birds hushed their loud voices and peeped curiously at the tired, sorrowful creature of another kind that had come among them. Marcia's overwrought nerves were having their revenge. Tears had their way until she was worn out, and then the angel of sleep came down upon her. 
There upon the pine needle bed, with tear wet cheeks, she lay, and slept like a tired child come home to its mother from the tumult of the world. Harry Temple, recovering from his rebuff and left alone in the parlor, looked about him with surprise. Never before in all his short and brilliant career as a heartbreaker had he met with the like, and this from a mere child. He could not believe his senses. She must have been in play. He would sit still, and presently she would come back with eyes full of mischief and beg his pardon. But even as he sat down to wait her coming, something told him he was mistaken, and that she would not come. There had been something beside mischief in the smart raps whose tingle even now his cheeks and lips felt. The house, too, had grown strangely hushed, as though no one else besides himself were in it. She must have gone out. Perhaps she had been really frightened and would tell somebody— how awkward if she should presently return with one of those grim aunts or that solemn puritan-like husband of hers perhaps he had better decamp while the coast was still clear she did not seem to be returning and there was no telling what the little fool might do with a deliberation which suddenly became feverish in his haste to be away he compelled himself to walk slowly nonchalantly out through the hall Still as a thief, he opened and closed the front door and got himself down the front steps, but not so still but that a quick ear caught the sound of the latch as it flew back into place, and the scrape of a boot on the path, and not so invisibly nor so quickly but that a pair of keen eyes saw him. When Harry Temple had made his way toward the Spafford house that afternoon, with his dauntless front and conceited smile, Miranda had been sent out to pick raspberries along the fence that separated the Heath Garden from the Spafford Garden. Harry Temple was too new in the town not to excite comment among the young girls wherever he might go, and Miranda was always having her eye out for anything new. Not for herself, bless you, no. Miranda never expected anything from a young man for herself, but she was keenly interested in what befell other girls. So Miranda, crouched behind the berry bushes, watched Harry Temple saunter down the street, and saw with surprise that he stopped at the house of her new admiration. Now, although Marcia was a married woman, Miranda felt pleased that she should have the attention of others, and a feeling of pride in her idol, and of triumph over her cousin Hannah, that he had not stopped to see her, swelled in her brown calico breast. She managed to bring her picking as near to the region of the Spafford parlor windows as possible, and much did her ravished ear delight itself in the music that tinkled through the green-shaded window, for Miranda had tastes that were greatly appealed to by the gay dance music. She fancied that her idol was the player, but then she heard a man's voice, and her picking stopped short, insomuch that her grandmother's strident tones mingled with the liquid tenor of Mr. Temple, calling to Miranda to be spry there or the sun'll catch you for you get a quart. All at once the music ceased, and then in a minute or two Miranda heard the Spafford kitchen door thrown violently open and saw Marcia rush forth. She gazed in astonishment, too surprised to call out to her or to remember to keep on picking for a moment. She watched her as she fairly flew down between the rows of currant bushes, saw the comb fly from her hair, saw the glow of excitement on her cheek and the fire in her eye, saw her mount the first fence. Then suddenly a feeling of protection arose within her, and with a hasty glance toward her grandmother's window to satisfy herself that no one else saw the flying figure, she fell to picking with all her might, but what went into her pail, whether raspberries or green leaves or briars, she did not know. Her eyes were on the flying figure through the wheat, and she progressed in her picking very fast toward the lower end of the lot where nothing but runty old sour berries ever grew, if any at all. Once hidden behind the tall corn that grew between her and her grandmother's vigilant gaze, she hastened to the end of the lot and watched Marcia, watched her as she climbed the fences, held her breath at the daring leaps from the top rails, expecting to see the delicate muslin catch on the rough fence and send the flying figure to the ground senseless, perhaps. It was like a theater to Miranda, this watching the beautiful girl in her flight, the long dark hair in the wind, the graceful untrammeled bounds. Miranda watched with unveiled admiration until the dark of the green-blue wood had swallowed her up. Then slowly her eyes traveled back over the path which Marcia had taken, back through the meadow and the wheat, to the kitchen door left standing wide. Slowly, painfully, Miranda set herself to understand it. Something had happened. That was flight with fear behind it. 
fear that left everything else forgotten. What had happened? Miranda was wiser in her generation than Marcia. She began to put two and two together. Her brows darkened and a look of cunning came into her honest blue eyes. Stealthily she crept with cat-like quickness along the fence near to the front, and there she stood like a red-haired nemesis in a sunbonnet, with irate red face, confronting the unsuspecting man as he sauntered forth from the unwelcoming roof where he had whiled away a mistaken hour. "'What you been saying to her?' It was as if a serpent had stung him, so unexpected, so direct. He jumped aside and turned deadly pale. She knew her chance arrow had struck the truth. But he recovered himself almost immediately when he saw what a harmless-looking creature had attacked him. "'Why, my dear girl,' he said patronizingly, "'you quite startled me. I'm sure you must have made some mistake.' "'I ain't your girl, thank goodness,' snapped Miranda, "'and I guess by your looks there ain't anybody dear to you but yourself. "'But I ain't made a mistake. It's you I was asking. "'What you been in there for?' "'There was a blaze of defiance in Miranda's eyes, "'and her stubby forefinger pointed at him like a shotgun. "'Before her the bold black eyes quailed for an instant. "'The young man's hand sought his pocket, "'brought out a piece of money, and extended it. "'Look here, my friend,' he said, trying another line. "'You take this and say nothing more about it. "'That's a good girl. No harm's been done.' "'Miranda looked him in the face with noble scorn "'and with a sudden motion of her brown hand "'sent the coin flying on the stone pavement. "'I tell you I'm not your friend, and I don't want your money. "'I wouldn't trust its goodness any more than your face. "'As for keeping still, I'll do as I see fit about it. "'I intend to know what this means, and if you've made her any trouble— "'You'd better leave this town, for I'll make it too unpleasant for you to stay here.' With a stealthy glance about him, cautious, concerned, the young man suddenly hurried down the street. He wanted no more parley with this loud-voiced avenging maiden. His fear came back upon him in double force, and he was seen to glance at his watch and quicken his pace almost to a run, as though a forgotten engagement had suddenly come to mind. Miranda, scowling, stood and watched him disappear around the corner, then she turned back and began to pick raspberries with a diligence that would have astonished her grandmother, had she not been for the last hour engaged with a calling neighbor in the room at the other side of the house, where they were overhauling the character of a fellow church member. Miranda picked on and thought on, and could not make up her mind what she ought to do. From time to time she glanced anxiously toward the woods, and then at the lowering sun in the west, and half meditated going after Marcia but a wholesome fear of her grandmother held her hesitating. At length she heard a firm step coming down the street. Could it be? Yes, it was David Spafford. How was it he happened to come home so soon? Miranda had heard in a roundabout way, as neighbors hear and know these things, that David had taken the stage that morning, presumably on business to New York, and was hardly expected to return for several days. She had wondered if Marcia would stay all night alone in the house, or if she would go to the aunt's but now here was David. Miranda looked again over the wheat, half expecting to see the flying figure returning in haste, but the parted wheat waved on and sang its song of the harvest, unmindful and alone, with only a fluttering butterfly to give life to the landscape. A little rusty-throated cricket piped a doleful sentence now and then between the silences. David Spafford let himself in at his own door and went in search of Marcia. He wanted to find Marcia for a purpose, the business which had taken him away in the morning, and which he had hardly expected to accomplish before late that night, had been partly transacted at a little tavern where the coach horses had been changed that morning, and where he had met, most unexpectedly, the two men whom he had been going to see, who were coming straight to his town. So he turned him back with them and came home, and they were at this minute attending to some other business in the town, while he had come home to announce to Marcia that they would take supper with him and perhaps spend the night. Marcia was nowhere to be found. He went upstairs and timidly knocked at her door, but no answer came. Then he thought she might be asleep and knocked louder. But only the hummingbird and the honeysuckle outside her window sent back a little humming answer through the latch hole. Finally he ventured to open the door and peep in, but he saw that quiet loneliness reigned there. He went downstairs again and searched in the pantry and kitchen and then stood still. The back door was stretched open as though it had been thrown back in haste. He followed its suggestion and went out, looking down the little brick path that led to the garden. Ah, 
What was that? Something gleamed in the sun with a spot of blue behind it. The bit of blue ribbon she had worn at her throat, with a tiny gold brooch unclasped sticking in. Miranda caught sight of him coming and crouched behind the currants. David came on, searching the path on every side. A bit of a branch had been torn from a succulent, tender plant that leaned over the path and was lying in the way. It seemed another blaze along the trail. Further down, where the bushes almost met a single fragment of a thread, waved on a thorn as though it had snatched for more in the passing, and had caught only this. David hardly knew whether he was following these little things or not, but at any rate they were apparently not leading him anywhere, for he stopped abruptly in front of the fence, and looked both ways behind the bushes that grew along in front of it. Then he turned to go back again. Miranda held her breath. Something touched David's foot in turning, and looking down he saw Marcia's large shell comb lying there in the grass. Curiously he picked it up and examined it. It was like finding fragments of a wreck along the sand. All at once Miranda arose from her hiding place and confronted him timidly. She was not the same Miranda who came down upon Harry Temple, however. "'She ain't in the house,' she said hoarsely. "'She's gone over there.' David Spafford turned surprised. "'Is that you, Miranda? Oh, thank you. Where do you say she has gone? Where?' "'Through there, don't you see?' and again the stubby forefinger pointed to the rift in the wheat. David gazed stupidly at the path in the wheat, but gradually it began to dawn upon him that there was a distinct line through it where someone must have gone. "'Yes, I see,' he said, thinking aloud. "'But why should she have gone there? There is nothing over there.' "'She went on further. She went to the woods,' said Miranda, looking fearfully around lest even now her grandmother might be upon her. "'And she was scared, I guess.' She looked it. Her hair all come tumbling down when she clumb the fence, and she just went flying over like some bird, didn't care a feather if she did fall, and she never once had looked behind her till she come to the woods. David's bewilderment was growing uncomfortable. There was a shade of alarm in his face, and of the embarrassment one feels when a neighbor divulges news about a member of one's own household. Why, surely, Miranda, you must be mistaken. Maybe it was someone else you saw. I do not think Mrs. Spafford would be likely to run over there that way, and what in the world would she have to be frightened at? No, I ain't mistaken, said Miranda, half sullenly, nettled at his unbelief. It was her all right. She came flying out the kitchen door when I was picking raspberries, and down that path to the fence and never stopped for fence, nor wheat, nor met her lot, but went into them woods there, right up to the left of them tall pines, and she— she looked plumb scared to death as if a whole circus menagerie was after her, lions and elephants and all, and I guess she had plenty to be scared at, if I ain't mistaken. That dandy temple feller went there to call on her, and I heard him tinkling that music box, and it's my opinion he needs a wallopin'. You better go after her. It's getting late, and you'll have hard times finding her in the dark. Just you follow her path in the wheat, and then make for them pines. I'd have gone after her myself, only Grandma'd make such a fuss and have to know it all. You needn't be afraid of me. I'll keep still. By this time David was thoroughly alive to the situation and much alarmed. He mounted the fence with alacrity, gave one glance with thank you at Miranda, and disappeared through the wheat. Miranda watched him till she was sure he was making for the right spot. Then with a sigh of relief she hastened into the house with her now brimming pail of berries. End of chapter 14
Did the young man then have a purpose in coming to the house during his absence? A great anger rose within him at the thought. There was one strange thing about David's thoughts. For the first time he looked at himself in the light of Marcia's natural protector, her husband. He suddenly saw a duty from himself to her, aside from the mere feeding and clothing her. He felt a personal responsibility and an actual interest in her. Out of the whole world now he was the only one she could look to for help. It gave him a feeling of possession that was new and almost seemed pleasant. He forgot entirely the errand that had made him come to search for Marcia in the first place, and the two men who were probably at that moment preparing to go to his house, according to their invitation. He forgot everything but Marcia, and strode into the purpley-blue shadows of the wood and stopped to listen. The hush there seemed intense. There were no echoes lingering of flying feet down that pine-padded pathway of the Isle of the Woods. It was long since he had had time to wander in the woods, and he wondered at their silence. So much whispering above, the sky so far away, the breeze so quiet, the bird notes so subdued it seemed almost uncanny. He had not remembered that it was thus in the woods. It struck him in passing that here would be a good place to bring his pain some day, when he had time to face it again and wish to be alone with it. He took his hat in his hand and stepped firmly into the vast solemnity as if he had entered a great church when the service was going on, on an errand of life and death that gave excuse for profaning the holy silence. He went a few paces and stopped again, listening. Was that a long-drawn sighing breath he heard, or only the wind soughing through the waving tassels overhead? He summoned his voice to call. It seemed a great effort, and sounded weak and feeble under the grandeur of the vaulted green dome. Marcia, he called, and Marcia, realizing as he did so that it was the first time he had called her by her name, or sought after her in any way. He had always said you to her, or child, or spoken of her in company as Mrs. Spafford, a strange and far-off mythical person whose very intangibility had separated her from himself immeasurably. He went further into the forest, called again and yet again, and stood to listen. All was still about him, but in the far distance he heard the faint report of a gun. With a new thought of danger coming to mind, he hurried further into the shadows. The gun sounded again more clearly. He shuddered involuntarily and looked about in all directions, hoping to see the gleam of her gown. It was not likely there were any wild beasts about these parts so near the town, and yet they had been seen occasionally, a stray fox or even a bear, and the sun was certainly very low. He glanced back, and the low line of the horizon gleamed the gold of intensified shining that is the sun's farewell for the night. The gun again. Stray shots had been known to kill people wandering in the forest. He was growing nervous as a woman now, and went this way and that, calling, but still no answer came. He began to think he was not near the clump of pines of which Miranda spoke, and went a little to the right, and then turned to look back to where he had entered the wood, and there, almost at his feet, she lay. She slept as soundly as if she had been lying on a couch of velvet, one round white arm under her cheek. Her face was flushed with weeping, and her lashes still wet. Her tender, sensitive mouth still quivered slightly as she gave a long-drawn breath with a catch in it that seemed like a sob, and all her lovely dark hair floated about her as if it were spread upon a wave that upheld her. She was beautiful indeed as she lay there sleeping, and the man, thus suddenly come upon her, anxious and troubled and every nerve quivering stopped awed with the beauty of her as if she had been some heavenly being suddenly confronting him he stepped softly to her side and bending down observed her first anxiously to make sure she was alive and safe then searchingly as though he would know every detail of the picture there before him because it was his and he not only had a right but a duty to possess it and to care for it she might have been a statue or a painting as he looked upon her and noted the lovely curve of her flushed cheek. But when his eyes reached the firm little brown hand and the slender finger on which gleamed the wedding ring that was not really hers, something pathetic in the tear-wet lashes and the whole sorrowful, beautiful figure touched him with a great tenderness, and he stooped down gently and put his arm about her. Marcia, child! he said in a low, almost crooning voice, as one might wake a baby from its sleep. Marcia, open your eyes, child, and tell me if you are all right. At first she only stirred uneasily and slept on, the sleep of utter exhaustion, 
but he raised her, and sitting down beside her, put her head upon his shoulder, speaking gently. Then Marcia opened her eyes, bewildered, and with a start sprang back and looked at David, as though she would be sure it was he and not that other dreadful man from whom she had fled. "'Why, child, what's the matter?' said David, brushing her hair back from her face. Bewildered still, Marcia scarcely knew him. His voice was so strangely sweet and sympathetic. The tears were coming back, but she could not stop them. She made one effort to control herself and speak, but her lips quivered a moment, and then the floodgates opened again, and she covered her face with her hands and shook with sobs. How could she tell David what a dreadful thing had happened, now, when he was kinder to her than he had ever thought of being before? He would grow grave and stern when she had told him, and she could not bear that. He would likely blame her, too, and how could she endure more? but he drew her to him again and laid her head against his coat, trying to smooth her hair with unaccustomed passes of his hand. By and by the tears subsided and she could control herself again. She hushed her sobs and drew back a little from the comforting rough coat where she had lain. "'Indeed, indeed, I could not help it, David,' she faltered, trying to smile like a bit of rainbow through the rain. "'I know you couldn't, child.' His answer was wonderfully kind, and his eyes smiled at her as they had never done before. Her heart gave a leap of astonishment and fluttered with gladness over it. It was so good to have David care. She had not known how much she wanted him to speak to her as if he saw her and thought a little about her. "'And now what was it? Remember, I do not know. Tell me quick, for it is growing late and damp, and you will take cold out here in the woods with that thin frock on. You are chilly already.' "'I better go at once,' she said reservedly, willing to put off the telling as long as possible, peradventure to avoid it altogether. "'No, child,' he said firmly, drawing her back again beside him. "'You must rest a minute yet before taking that long walk. You are weary and excited, and besides it will do you good to tell me. What made you run off up here? Are you homesick?' He scanned her face anxiously. He began to fear with sudden compunction that the sacrifice he had accepted so easily had been too much for the victim, and it suddenly began to be a great comfort to him to have Marcia with him, to help him hide his sorrow from the world. He did not know before that he cared. "'I was frightened,' she said with drooping lashes. She was trying to keep her lips and fingers from trembling, for she feared greatly to tell him all. But though the woods were growing dusky, he saw the fluttering little fingers and gathered them firmly in his own. "'Now, child,' he said in that tone that even his aunts obeyed, "'tell me all. What frightened you, and why did you come up here away from everybody, instead of calling for help?' Brought to bay, she lifted her beautiful eyes to his face and told him briefly the story, beginning with the night when she had first met Harry Temple. She said as little about music as possible— because she feared that the mention of the piano might be painful to David, but she made the whole matter quite plain in a few words, so that David could readily fill in between the lines. Scoundrel, he murmured, clenching his fists. He ought to be strung up. Then quite gently again, poor child, how frightened you must have been. You did right to run away, but it was a dangerous thing to run out here. Why, he might have followed you. Oh, said Marcia, turning pale, I never thought of that. I only wanted to get away from everybody. It seemed so dreadful. I did not want anybody to know. I did not want you to know. I wanted to run away and hide and never come back. She covered her face with her hands and shuddered. David thought the tears were coming back again. Child, child, he said gently. You must not talk that way. What would I do if you did that? And he laid his hand softly upon the bowed head. It was the first time that anything, like a personal talk, had passed between them, and Marcia felt a thrill of delight at his words. It was like heavenly comfort to her wounded spirit. She stole a shy look at him under her lashes and wished she dared say something, but no words came. They sat for a moment in silence, each feeling a sort of comforting sense of the other's presence, and each clasping the hand of the other with clinging pressure, yet neither fully aware of the fact. The last rays of the sun, which had been lying for a while at their feet, upon the pine needles, suddenly slipped away unperceived, and, behold, the world was in gloom, and the place where the two sat was almost utterly dark. David became aware of it first, and with sudden remembrance of his expected guests, he started in dismay. "'Child,' said he, but he did not let go of her hand, nor forget to put the tenderness in his voice. 
The sun has gone down, and here have I been forgetting what I came to tell you in the astonishment over what you had to tell me. We must hurry and get back. We have guests tonight to supper, two gentlemen, very distinguished in their lines of work. We have business together, and I must make haste. I doubt not they are at the house already, and what they think of me I cannot tell. Let us hurry as fast as possible. Oh, David, she said in dismay, and you had to come out here after me and have stayed so long. What a foolish girl I have been, and what a mess I have made. They will perhaps be angry and go away, and I will be to blame. I am afraid you can never forgive me. Don't worry, child, he said pleasantly. It couldn't be helped, you know, and is in no wise your fault. I am only sorry that these two gentlemen will delay me in the pleasure of hunting up that scoundrel of a temple and suggesting that he leave town by the early morning stage. I should like to give him what Miranda suggested, a good wallopin', but perhaps it would be undignified. He laughed as he said it, a hearty laugh with a ring to it like his old self. Marcia felt happy at the sound. How wonderful it would be if he would be like that to her all the time. Her heart swelled with the great thought of it. He helped her to her feet, and taking her hand, led her out to the open field where they could walk faster. As he walked, he told her about Miranda waiting for him behind the currant bushes. They laughed together and made the way seem short. It was quite dark now, with the faded moon trembling feebly in the west, as though it meant to retire early, and wished they would hurry home while she held her light for them. David had drawn Marcia's arm within his, and then noticing that her dress was thin, he pulled off his coat and put it firmly about her, despite her protest that she did not need it. And so, warmed, comforted, and cheered, Marcia's feet hurried back over the path she had taken in such sorrow and fright a few hours before. When they could see the lights of the village twinkling close below them, David began to tell her about the two men who were to be their guests, if they were still waiting. And so interesting was his brief story of each that Marcia hardly knew they were at home before David was helping her over their own back fence. Oh, David, there seems to be a light in the kitchen. Do you suppose they have gone in and are getting their own supper? What shall I do with my hair? I cannot go in with it this way. How did that light get there? Here, said David, fumbling in his pocket. Will this help you? And he brought out the shell comb he had picked up in the garden. By the light of the feeble old moon, David watched her coil the long wavy hair and stood to pass his criticism upon the effect before they should go in. They were just back of the tall sunflowers and talked in whispers. It was all so cheery and camaraderie and merry that Marcia hated to go in and have it over, for she could not feel that this sweet evening hour could last. Then they took hold of hands and swiftly, cautiously stole up to the kitchen window and looked in. The door still stood open, as both had left it that afternoon, and there seemed to be no one in the kitchen. A candle was burning on the high little shelf over the table, and the tea kettle was singing on the crane by the hearth, but the room was without occupant. Cautiously, looking questioningly at one another, they stole into the kitchen, each dreading lest the aunts had come by chance and discovered their laps. There was a light in the front part of the house, and they could hear voices. Two men were earnestly discussing politics. They listened longer, but no other presence was revealed. David, in pantomime, outlined the course of action, and Marcia, understanding perfectly, flew up the back stairs as noiselessly as a mouse to make her toilette after her nap in the woods, while David, with much show and to-do of opening and shutting the wide-open kitchen door, walked obviously into the kitchen and hurried through to greet his guests, wondering, not suspecting in the least, what good angel had been there to let them in. Good fortune had favored Miranda. The neighbor had stayed longer than usual, perhaps in hopes of an invitation to stay to tea and share in the gingerbread she could smell being taken from the oven by Hannah, who occasionally varied her occupations by a turn at the culinary art. Hannah could make delicious gingerbread. Her grandmother had taught her when she was but a child. Miranda stole into the kitchen when Hannah's back was turned and picked over her berries so fast that when Hannah came into the pantry to set her gingerbread to cool, Miranda had nearly all her berries in the big yellow bowl ready to wash, and Hannah might conjecture, if she pleased, that Miranda had been some time picking them over. It is not stated just how thoroughly those berries were picked over, but Miranda cared little for that. Her mind was upon other things. The pantry window overlooked the hills and the woods. She could see if David and Marcia were coming back soon. She wanted to watch her play till the close, and had no fancy for having the curtain fall in the middle of the most exciting act the rescue of the princess. 
but the talk in the sitting room went on and on. By and by Hannah Heath washed her hands, untied her apron, and taking her sunbonnet slipped over to Ann Bertram's for a pattern of her new sleeve. Miranda took the opportunity to be off again. Swiftly down behind the currants she ran, and standing on the fence behind the corn she looked off across the wheat, but no sign of anybody yet coming out of the woods was granted her. She stood so long a time. It was growing dusk. She wondered if Harry Temple had shut the front door when he went out. But then David went in that way, and he would have closed it, of course. Still, he went away in a hurry. Maybe it would be as well to go and look. She did not wish to be caught by her grandmother, so she stole along like a cat close to the dark berry bushes, and the gathering dusk hid her well. She thought she could see from the front of the fence whether the door looked as if it were closed, but there were people coming up the street. She would wait till they had passed before she looked over the fence. They were two men coming, slowly, and in earnest conversation upon some deeply interesting theme. Each carried a heavy carpet bag, and they walked wearily, as if their business were nearly over for the day, and they were coming to a place of rest. "'This must be the house, I think,' said one. "'He said it was exactly opposite the Seceder Church. "'That's the church, I believe. I was here once before.' "'There doesn't seem to be a light in the house,' said the other, looking up to the windows over the street. "'Are you sure?' "'Brother Spafford said he was coming directly home to let his wife know of our arrival. "'A little strange there's no light yet, for it is quite dark now, but I'm sure this must be the house. "'Maybe they are all in the kitchen and not expecting us quite so soon. "'Let's try anyhow,' said the other, setting down his carpet-bag on the stoop and lifting the big brass knocker. "'Miranda stood still, debating but a moment. "'The situation was made plain to her in an instant.' Not for nothing had she stood at Grandma Heath's elbow for years, watching the movements of her neighbors, and interpreting exactly what they meant. Miranda's wits were sharpened, for situations of all kinds. Miranda was ready and loyal to those she adored. Without further ado, she hastened to a sheltered spot she knew, and climbed the picket fence which separated the Heath garden from the Spafford side yard. Before the brass knocker had sounded through the empty house the second time, Miranda had crossed the side porch thrown her sunbonnet upon a chair in the dark kitchen, and was hastening with noisy, encouraging steps to the front door. She flung it wide open, saying in a breezy voice, "'Just wait till I get a light, won't you? The wind blew the candle out.' There wasn't a particle of wind about that soft September night, but that made little difference to Miranda. She was part of a play, and she was acting her best. If her impromptu part was a little irregular, it was at least well meant, boldly and bravely presented." Miranda found a candle on the shelf, and stooping to the smoldering fire upon the hearth, blew and coaxed it into flame enough to light it. "'This is Mr. Spafford's home, is it not?' questioned the old gentleman, whom Miranda had heard speak first on the sidewalk. "'Oh, yes, indeed,' said the girl glibly. "'Just come in and set down. Here, let me take your hat. Just put your bags right there on the floor.' "'You are—are are you, Mrs. Spafford?' hesitated the courtly old gentleman. "'Oh, landy sakes, no, I ain't her,' laughed Miranda, well pleased. "'Miss Spafford had just stepped out a bit when her husband come home, and he's gone after her. "'You see, she didn't expect her husband home till late tonight. "'But you set down. They'll be home real soon now. "'They'd oughter been here before this. "'I suppose she'd gone on further than she thought she'd go when she stepped out.' "'It's all right,' said the other gentleman. "'No harm done, I'm sure. "'I hope we shan't inconvenience Mrs. Spafford any coming so unexpectedly.' "'No, indeedy,' said quick-witted Miranda. "'You can't catch Miss Spafford unprepared if you come in the middle of the night. "'She's allus ready for company.' Miranda's eyes shone. She felt she was getting on finely doing the honors. "'Well, that's very nice. I'm sure it makes one feel at home. "'I wonder now if she would mind if we were to go right up to our room and wash our hands. "'I feel so travel-stained. I'd like to be more presentable before we meet her,' said the first gentleman, who looked very weary. But Miranda was not dashed. "'Why, that's all right. Of course you can go right up. Just you set in the keepin' room a minute while I run up and be sure the water pitcher's filled. I ain't quite sure about it. I won't be long.' Miranda seated them in the parlor with great gusto and hastened up the back stairs to investigate. She was not at all sure which room would be called the guest room and whether the two strangers would have a room apiece or occupy the same together. At least it would be safe to show them one till the mistress of the house returned. She peeped into Marsh's room and knew it instinctively before she caught sight of a cameo brooch on the pincushion and a rose-colored ribbon neatly folded lying on the foot of the bed where it had been forgotten. That question settled, she thought any other room would do, and chose the large front room across the hall, 
with its high four-poster and the little ball fringe on the valance and canopy. Having lighted the candle which stood in a tall glass candlestick on the high chest of drawers, she hurried down to bid her guests come up. Then she hastened back into the kitchen and went to work with swift, skillful fingers. Her breath came quickly, and her cheeks grew red with the excitement of it all. It was like playing fairy. She would get supper for them and have everything all ready when the mistress came, so that there would be no bad breaks. She raked the fire and filled the tea kettle, swinging it from the crane. Then she searched where she thought such things should be and found a tablecloth and set the table. Her hands trembled as she put out the sprigged china that was kept in the corner cupboard. Perhaps this was wrong, and she would be blamed for it. But at least it was what she would have done, she thought, if she were mistress of this house, and had two nice gentlemen come to stay to tea. It was not often that Grandmother Heath allowed her to handle her sprigged china, to be sure. So Miranda felt the joy and daring of it all the more. Once a delicate cup slipped and rolled over on the table and almost reached the edge. A little more and it would have rolled off to the floor and been shivered into a dozen fragments. But Miranda spread her apron in front and caught it fairly as it started and then hugged it in fear and delight for a moment as she might have done a baby that had been in danger. It was a great pleasure to her to set that table. In the first place she was not doing it to order, but because she wanted to please and surprise someone whom she adored. And in the second place it was an adventure. Miranda had longed for an adventure all her life, and now she thought it had come to her. When the table was set it looked very pretty. She slipped into the pantry and searched out the stores. It was not hard to find all that was needed. Cold ham, cheese, pickles, seed cakes, gingerbread, fruit cake, preserves and jelly, bread and raised biscuit. Then she went down cellar and found the milk and cream and butter. She had just finished the table and set out the teapot and caddy of tea when she heard the two gentlemen coming down the stairs. They went into the parlor and sat down, remarking that their friend had a pleasant home and then Miranda heard them plunge into a political discussion again, and she felt that they were safe for a while. She stole out into the dewy dark to see if there were yet signs of the homecomers. A screech howl hooted across the night. She stood a while by the back fence looking out across the dark sea of whispering wheat. By and by she thought she heard subdued voices above the soft swish of the parting wheat, and by the light of the stars she saw them coming. Quick as a wink, she slid over the fence into the heath backyard and crouched in her old place behind the currant bushes. So she saw them come up together, saw David help Marcia over the fence, and watched them till they had passed up the walk to the light of the kitchen door. Then swiftly she turned and glided to her own home, well knowing the reckoning that would be in store for her for this daring bit of recreation. There was about her, however, an air of triumphant joy as she entered. "'Where have you been to, Miranda Griscom, and what on earth you been up to now?' was the greeting she received as she lifted the latch of the old green kitchen door of her grandmother's house. Miranda knew that the worst was to come now, for her grandmother never mentioned the name of Griscom, unless she meant business. It was a hated name to her because of the man who had broken the heart of her daughter. Grandma Heath always felt that Miranda was an out-and-out -out Griscom with not a streak of Heath about her. The Griscoms all had red hair— but Miranda lifted her chin high and felt like a princess in disguise. "'Been hunting hen's eggs down in the grass,' she said, taking the first excuse that came into her head. "'Is it time to get supper?' "'Hen's eggs? This time of night and dark as pitch? Miranda Griscom, you can go up to your room and not come down till I call you.' It was a dire punishment, or would have been if Miranda had not had her head full of other things, for the neighbor had been asked to tea and there would have been much to hear at the table. Besides, it was apparent that her disgrace was to be made public. However, Miranda did not care. She hastened to her little attic window, which looked down, as good fortune would have it, upon the dining-room windows of the Spafford house. With joy, Miranda observed that no one had thought to draw down the chaise, and she might sit and watch the supper served over the way, the supper she had prepared, and might think how delectable the doughnuts were, and let her mouth water over the currant jelly and the quince preserves, and pretend she was a guest and forget the supper downstairs she was missing. End of chapter 15David made what apology he could for his absence on the arrival of his guests, and pondered in his heart, who it could have been that they referred to as the maid, until he suddenly remembered Miranda, and inwardly blessed her for her kindliness. 
It was more than he would have expected from any member of the Heath household. Miranda's honest face among the currant bushes when she had said, "'You needn't be afraid of me. I'll keep still,' came to mind. Miranda had evidently scented out the true state of the case and filled in the breach, taking care not to divulge a word. He blessed her kindly heart and resolved to show his gratitude to her in some way. Could poor Miranda, sitting supperless in the dark, have but known his thought, her lonely heart would have fluttered happily. But she did not, and virtue had to bring its own reward in a sense of duty done. Then, too, there was a spice of adventure to Miranda's monotonous life in what she had done, and she was not altogether sad, as she sat and let her imagination revel in what the Spaffords had said and thought, when they found the house lighted and supper ready. It was better than playing house down behind the barn when she was a little girl. Marcia was the most astonished when she slipped down from her hurried toilet and found the table decked out in all the house afforded, fairly groaning under its weight of pickles, preserves, doughnuts, and pie. In fact, everything that Miranda had found she had put upon that table, and it is safe to say that the result was not quite as it would have been had the preparation of the supper been left to Marcia. She stood before it and looked, and could not keep from laughing softly to herself at the array of little dishes of things. Marcia thought at first that one of the aunts must be here in the parlor, probably entertaining the guests and that the supper was a reproof to her for being away when she should have been at home attending to her duties. But still she was puzzled. It scarcely seemed like the aunts to set a table in such a peculiar manner. The best china was set out, it is true, but so many little bits of things were in separate dishes. There was half a mold of currant jelly in a large china plate. There was a fresh mold of quince jelly quivering on a common dish. All over the table, in every available inch, there was something— it would not do to call the guests out to a table like that. What would David say? And yet, if one of the aunts had said it and was going to stay to tea, would she be hurt? She tiptoed to the door and listened, but heard no sound save of men's voices. If an aunt had been here, she was surely gone now, and would be none the wiser if a few dishes were removed. With swift fingers, Marcia weeded out the things and set straight those that were to remain, and then made the tea. She was so quick about it David had scarcely time to begin to worry because supper was not announced before she stood in the parlor door, shy and sweet, with a brilliant color in her cheeks. His little comrade David felt her to be, and again it struck him that she was beautiful as he arose to introduce her to the guests. He saw their open admiration as they greeted her, and he found himself wondering what they would have thought of Kate, Wild Rose Kate, with her graceful, witching ways. A tinge of sadness came into his face, but something suggested to him the thought that Marcia was even more beautiful than Kate, more like a half-blown bud of a thing. He wondered that he had never noticed before how her eyes shone. He gave her a pleasant smile as they passed into the hall, which set the color flaming in her cheeks again. David seemed different somehow, and that lonely, set-apart feeling that she had had ever since she came here to live was gone. David was there, and he understood at least a little bit, and they had something, just something, even though it was but a few minutes in a lonely woods and some gentle words of his, to call their very own together. At least that experience did not belong to Kate, never had been hers, and could not have been borrowed from her. Marcia sighed a happy sigh as she took her seat at the table. The talk ran upon Andrew Jackson and some utterances of his in his last message to Congress, the elder of the two gentlemen expressed grave fears that a mistake had been made in policy and that the country would suffer. Governor Clinton was mentioned and his policy discussed, but all this talk was familiar to Marcia. Her father had been interested in public affairs always, and she had been brought up to listen to discussions deep and long and to think about such things for herself. When she was quite a little girl, her father had made her read the paper aloud to him, from one end to the other as he lay back in his big chair with his eyes closed and his shaggy brows drawn thoughtfully into a frown. Sometimes, as she read, he would burst forth with a tirade against this or that man or set of men who were in opposition to his own pronounced views, and he would pour out a lengthy reply to little Marcia as she sat patient, waiting for a chance to go on with her reading. As she grew older, she became proud of the distinction of being her father's confidant politically and she was able to talk on such matters as intelligently and as well, if not better, than most of the men who came to the house. It was a position which no one disputed with her. 
Kate had been much too full of her own plans, and Madam Schuyler too busy with household affairs to bother with politics and newspapers, so Marcia had always been the one called upon to read when her father's eyes were tired. As a consequence, she was far beyond other girls of her age in knowledge on public affairs. Well, she knew what Andrew Jackson thought about the tariff, and about the system of canals, and about improvements in general. She knew which men in Congress were opposed to and which in favor of certain bills. All through the struggle for improvements in New York State she had been an eager observer. The minutest detail of the Erie Canal project had interested her, and she was never without her own little private opinion in the matter, which, however, seldom found voice except in her eager eyes, whose listening lights would have been an inspiration to the most eloquent speaker. Therefore, Marcia, as she sat behind her sprigged china teacups and demurely poured tea, was taking in all that had been said, and she drew her breath quickly in a way she had when she was deeply excited, as at last the conversation neared the one great subject of interest which to her seemed of most importance in the country at the present day, the project of a railroad run by steam. Nothing was too great for Marcia to believe. Her father had been inclined to be conservative in great improvements. He had favored the Erie Canal, though had feared it would be impossible to carry so great a project through, and Marcia, in her girlish mind, had rejoiced with a joy that to her was unspeakable when it had been completed, and news had come that many packets were traveling day and night upon the wonderful new waterway. There had been a kind of triumph in her heart to think that men who could study out these big schemes and plan it all had been able against so great odds to carry out their project and prove to all unbelievers that it was not only possible, but practicable. Marcia's brain was throbbing with the desire for progress. If she were a man with money and influence, she felt she would so much like to go out into the world and make stupid people do the things for the country that ought to be done. Progress had been the keynote of her upbringing, and she was teeming with energy, which she had no hope could ever be used to help along that for which she felt her ambitions rising. She wanted to see the world alive and busy, the great cities connected with one another. She longed to have free access to cities, to great libraries, to pictures, to wonderful music. She longed to meet great men and women, the men and women who were making the history of the world, writing, speaking, and doing things that were molding public opinion. Reforms of all sorts were what helped along and made possible her desires. Why did not the people want a steam railroad? Why were they so ready to say it could never succeed, that it would be an impossibility, that the roads could not be made strong enough to bear so great weights and so constant wear and tear? Why did they interpose objections to every suggestion made by inventors and thinking men? Why did even her dear father, who was so far in advance of his times in many ways, why did even he, too, shake his head and say that he feared it would never be in this country? at least not in his day, that it was impracticable? The talk was very interesting to Marcia. She ate bits of her biscuit without knowing, and she left her tea untasted till it was cold. The younger of the two guests was talking. His name was Jervis. Marcia thought she had heard the name somewhere, but had not yet placed him in her mind. Yes, said he with an eager look on his face. It is coming. It is coming sooner than they think. Oliver Evans said, you know, that good roads were all we could expect one generation to do. The next must make canals. The next might build a railroad, which should run by horsepower. And perhaps the next would run a railroad by steam. But we shall not have to wait so long. We shall have steam, moving railway carriages before another year. What? said David. You don't mean it. Have you really any foundation for such a statement? He leaned forward, his eyes shining, and his whole attitude one of deep interest. Marcia watched him, and a great pride began to glow within her that she belonged to him. She looked at the other men. Their eyes were fixed upon David with heightening pleasure and pride. The older man watched the little tableau a moment, and then he explained. The Mohawk and Hudson Company have just made an engagement with Mr. Jervis as chief engineer of their road. He expects to run that road by steam. He finished his fruit cake and preserves under the spell of astonishment he had cast upon his host and hostess. David and Marcia turned simultaneously toward Mr. Jervis for a confirmation of this statement. Mr. Jervis smiled in affirmation. But will it not be like all the rest, no funds? asked David a trifle sadly. It may be years even yet before it is really started. 
but Mr. Jervis' face was reassuring. The contract is let for the grading. In fact, work has already begun. I expect to begin laying the track by next spring, perhaps sooner. As soon as the track is laid, we shall show them. David's eyes shone, and he reached out and grasped the hand of the man who had the will and apparently the means of accomplishing this great thing for the country. It will make a wonderful change in the whole land, said David musingly. He had forgotten to eat. His face was aglow, and a side of his nature which Marcia did not know was uppermost. Marcia saw the man, the thinker, the writer, the former of public opinion, the idealist. Heretofore, David had been to her in the light of her sister's lover, a young man of promise, but that was all. Now she saw something more earnest, and at once it was revealed to her what a man he was, a man like her father. David's eyes were suddenly drawn to meet hers. He looked on Marcia and seemed to be sharing his thought with her, and smiled a smile of comradeship. He felt all at once that she could and would understand his feelings about this great new enterprise, and would be glad, too. It pleased him to feel this. It took a little of his loneliness away. Kate would never have been interested in these things. He had never expected such sympathy from her. She had been something beautiful and apart from his world, and as such he had adored her but it was pleasant to have some one who could understand and feel as he did. Just then he was not thinking of his lost Kate. So he smiled, and Marcia felt the glow of warmth from his look and returned it, and the two visitors knew that they were among friends who understood and sympathized. "'Yes, it will make a great change,' said the older man. "'I hope I may live to see at least a part of it.' "'If you succeed, there will be many others to follow.' The land will soon be a network of railroads, went on David, still musing. We shall succeed, said Mr. Jervis, closing his lips firmly in a way that made one sure he knew whereof he spoke. And now tell me about it, said David, with his most engaging smile, as a child will ask to have a story. David could be most fascinating when he felt he was in a sympathetic company. At other times he was wont to be grave, almost to severity but those who knew him best and had seen him thus melted into childlike enthusiasm felt his lovableness as the others never dreamed. The table talk launched into a description of the proposed road, the road bed, the manner of laying the rails, their thickness and width, and the way of bolting them down to the heavy timbers that lay underneath. It was all intensely fascinating to Marcia. Mr. Jervis took knives and forks to illustrate and then showed by plates and spoons how they were fastened down. David asked a question now and then, took out his notebook, and wrote down some things. The two guests were eager and plain in their answers. They wanted David to write it up. They wanted the information to be accurate and full. The other day I saw a question in a Baltimore paper sent in by a subscriber. What is a railroad? said the old gentleman, and the editor's reply was, Can any of our readers answer this question and tell us what is a railroad? There was a hearty laugh over the unenlightened unbelievers, who seemed to be only too willing to remain in ignorance of the march of improvement. David finally laid down his notebook, feeling that he had gained all the information he needed at present. I have much faith in you and your skill, but I do not quite see how you are going to overcome all the obstacles. How, for instance, are you going to overcome the inequalities in the road? Our country is not a flat, even one like those abroad where the railroad has been tried. There are sharp grades, and many curves will be necessary, said he. Mr. Jervis had shoved his chair back from the table, but now he drew it up again sharply and began to move the dishes back from his place, a look of eagerness gleaming in his face. Once again the dishes and cups were brought into requisition as the engineer showed a crude model in china and cutlery of an engine he proposed to have constructed, illustrating his own idea about a truck for the forward wheels, which should move separately from the back wheels, and enable the engine to conform to curves more readily. Marcia sat with glowing cheeks watching the outline of history that was to be, not knowing that the little model before her, made from her own teacups and saucers, was to be the model for all the coming engines of the many railroads of the future. Finally the chairs were pushed back, and yet the talk went on. Marcia slipped silently about, conveying the dishes away, and still the guests sat talking. She could hear all they said even when she was in the kitchen washing the china, for she did it very softly, and never a clink hid a word. They talked of Governor Clinton again, and of his attitude toward the railroad. 
They spoke of Thurlow Weed and a number of others whose names were familiar to Marcia in the papers she had read to her father. They told how lately on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, Peter Cooper had experimented with a little locomotive and had beaten a gray horse attached to another car. Marcia smiled brightly as she listened and laid the delicate china teapot down with care lest she should lose a word. But ever with her interest in the march of civilization, there were other thoughts mingling. Thoughts of David and of how he would be connected with it all. He would write it up and be identified with it. He was brave enough to face any new movement. David's paper was a temperance paper. There were not many temperance papers in those days. David was brave. He had already faced a number of unpleasant circumstances in consequence. He was not afraid of sneers or sarcasms, nor of being called a fanatic. He had taken such a stand that even those who were opposed had to respect him. Marcia felt the joy of a great pride in David tonight. She sang a happy little song at the bottom of her heart as she worked. The new railroad was an assured thing, and David was her comrade. That was the song, and the refrain was, David, David, David. Later, after the guests had talked themselves out and taken their candles to their rooms, David, with another comrade's smile and a look in his eyes that saw visions of the country's future, and for this one night at least promised not to dream of the past, bade her good night. She went up to her white chamber and lay down upon the pillow, whose case was fragrant of lavender blossoms, dreaming with a smile of tomorrow. She thought she was riding in a strange new railroad train with David's arm about her, and Harry Temple running along at his very best pace to try to catch them, but he could not. Miranda, at her supperless window, watched the evening hours and thought many thoughts. She wondered why they stayed in the dining room so late, and why they did not go into the parlor and make Marcia play the music box, as she called it, and why there was a light so long in that back chamber over the kitchen. Could it be they had put one of the guests there? Surely not. Perhaps that was David's study. Perhaps he was writing. Ah, she had guessed aright. David was sitting up to write while the inspiration was upon him. But Miranda slept and ceased to wonder long before David's light was extinguished, and when he finally lay down it was with a body healthily weary, and a mind for the time free from any intruding thought of himself and his troubles. He had written a most captivating article that would appear in his paper in a few days, and which must convince many doubters that a railroad was at last an established fact among them. There were one or two points which he must ask the skilled engineer in the morning, but as he reviewed what he had written he felt a sense of deep satisfaction and a true delight in his work. His soul thrilled with the power of his gift. He loved it, exulted in it. It was pleasant to feel that delight in his work once more. He had thought since his marriage that it was gone forever but perhaps by and by it would return to console him, and he would be able to do greater things in the world because of his suffering. Just as he dropped to sleep there came a thought of Marcia, pleasantly, as one remembers a flower. He felt that there was a comfort about Marcia, a something helpful in her smile. There was more to her than he had supposed. She was not merely a child. How her face had glowed as the men talked of the projected railroad, and almost she seemed to understand as they described the proposed engine with its movable trucks. She would be a companion who would be interested in his pursuits. He had hoped to teach Kate to understand his life work and perhaps help him some, but Kate was by nature a butterfly, a bird of gay colors, always on the wing. He would not have wanted her to be troubled with deep thoughts. Marcia seemed to enjoy such things. What if he should take pains to teach her, read with her, help cultivate her mind? It would at least be an occupation for leisure hours, something to interest him and keep away the awful pall of sadness. How sweet she had looked as she lay asleep in the woods with the tears on her cheek, like the dewdrops upon a rose petal. She was a dear little girl, and he must take care of her and protect her. That scoundrel temple! What were such men made for? He must settle him tomorrow. And so he fell asleep. End of chapter 16 Chapter Seventeen of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. Harry Temple sat in his office the next morning with his feet upon the table and his wooden armchair tilted back against the wall. 
He had letters to write, a number of them, that should go out with the afternoon coach to reach the night packet. There were at least three men he ought to go and see at once if he would do the best for his employers, and the office he sat in was by no means in the best of order, but his feet were elevated comfortably on the table, and he was deep in the pages of a story of the French court, its loves and hates and intrigues. It was therefore with annoyance that he looked up at the opening of the office door. But the frown changed to apprehension as he saw who was his visitor. He brought the chair legs suddenly to the floor, and his own legs followed them swiftly. David Spafford was not a man before whom another would sit with his feet on a table, even to transact business. There was a look of startled inquiry on Harry Temple's face. For an instant, his self-complacency was shaken. He hesitated, wondering what tack to take. Perhaps, after all, his alarm was unnecessary. Marcia likely had been too frightened to tell of what had occurred. He noticed the broad shoulder, the lean, active body, the keen eye, and the grave poise of his visitor, and thought he would hardly care to fight a duel with that man. It was natural for him to think at once of a duel on account of the French court life from which his mind had just emerged. A flash of wonder passed through his mind whether it would be swords or pistols, and then he set himself to face the other man. David Spafford stood for a full minute and looked into the face of the man he had come to shame. He looked at him with a calm eye and brow, but with a growing contempt that did not need words to express it. Harry Temple felt the color rise in his cheek, and his soul quaked for an instant. Then his habitual conceit arose, and he tried to parry with his eye that keen, piercing gaze of the other. It must have lasted a full minute, though it seemed to Mr. Temple it was five at the least. He made an attempt to offer his visitor a chair, but it was not noticed. David Spafford looked his man through and through and knew him for exactly what he was. At last he spoke, quietly, in a tone that was too courteous to be contemptuous, but it humiliated the listener more even than contempt. "'It would be well for you to leave town at once.' That was all. The listener felt that it was a command. His wrath arose hotly and beat itself against the calm exterior of his visitor's gaze in a look that was brazen enough to have faced a whole town of accusers. Harry Temple could look innocent and handsome when he chose. "'I do not understand you, sir,' he said. "'That is a most extraordinary statement.' "'It would be well for you to leave town at once.' This time the command was imperative. Harry's eyes blazed. "'Why?' He asked it with that impertinent tilt to his chin which usually angered his opponent in any argument. Once he could break that steady iron self-control, he felt he would have the best of things. He could easily persuade David Spafford that everything was all right if he could get him off his guard and make him angry. An angry man could do little but bluster. "'You understand very well,' replied David, his voice still, steady, and his gaze not swerving. "'Indeed?' "'Well, this is most extraordinary,' said Harry, losing control of himself again. "'Of what do you accuse me, may I inquire?' "'Of nothing that your own heart does not accuse you,' said David. And somehow there was more than human indignation in the gaze now. There was pity, a sense of shame for another soul who could lower himself to do unseemly things. Before that look, the blood crept into Harry's cheek again. An uncomfortable sensation entirely new was stealing over him. A sense of sin. No, not that exactly. A sense that he had made a mistake, perhaps. He never was very hard upon himself, even when the evidence was clear against him. It angered him to feel humiliated. What a fuss to make about a little thing. What a tiresome old cad to care about a little flirtation with his wife. He wished he had let the pretty baby alone entirely. She was of no finer stuff than many another who had accepted his advances with pleasure. He stiffened his neck and replied with much haughtiness. "'My heart accuses me of nothing, sir. I assure you I consider your words an insult. I demand satisfaction for your insulting language, sir.' Harry Temple had never fought a duel, and had never been present when others fought, but that was the language in which a challenge was usually delivered in French novels." "'It is not a matter for discussion,' said David Spafford, utterly ignoring the other's blustering words. "'I am fully informed as to all that occurred yesterday afternoon, and I tell you once more, it would be well for you to leave town at once. I have nothing further to say.' 
David turned and walked toward the door, and Harry stood, ignored, angry, crestfallen, and watched him until he reached the door. "'You would better ask your informant further of her part in the matter,' he hissed suddenly, an open sneer in his voice and a covert implication of deep meaning. David turned, his face flashing with righteous indignation. The man who was withered by the scorn of that glance wished heartily that he had not uttered the false sentence. He felt the smallness of his own soul during the instant of silence in which his visitor stood looking at him. Then David spoke deliberately. "'I knew you were a knave,' said he, "'but I did not suppose you were also a coward. A man who is not a coward will not try to put the blame upon a woman, especially upon an innocent one. You, sir, will leave town this evening. Any business further than you can settle between this and that, I will see properly attended to. I warn you, sir, it will be unwise for you to remain longer than till the evening coach. Perfectly courteous were David's tones, keen command was in his eye, and determination in every line of his face. Harry could not recover himself to reply, could not master his frenzy of anger and humiliation to face the righteous look of his accuser. Before he realized it, David was gone. He stood by the window and watched him go down the street with rapid, firm tread and upright bearing. Every line in that erect form spoke of determination. The conviction grew within him that the last words of his visitor were true, and that it would be wise for him to leave town. He rebelled at the idea. He did not wish to leave, for business matters were in such shape, or rather in such chaos, that it would be extremely awkward for him to meet his employers and explain his desertion at that time. Moreover, there were several homes in the town open to him whenever he chose, where were many attractions. It was a lazy, pleasant life he had been leading here, fully trusted and wholly disloyal to the trust, troubled by no uneasy overseers, not even his own conscience, dined and smiled upon with lovely, languishing eyes. He did not care to go, even though he had decried the town as dull and monotonous. But, on the other hand, things had occurred. Not the unfortunate little mistake of yesterday, of course, but others, more serious things, that he would hardly care to have brought to the light of day, especially through the keen, sarcastic columns of David Spafford's paper. He had seen other sinners brought to a bloodless retribution in those columns by dauntless weapons of sarcasm and wit, which in David Spafford's hands could be made to do valiant work. He did not care to be humiliated in that way. He could not brazen it out. He was convinced that the man meant what he said, and from what he knew of his influence he felt that he would leave no stone unturned till he had made the place too hot to hold him. Only Harry Temple himself knew how easy that would be to do, for no one else knew how many mistakes Harry had made, and he, unfortunately for himself, did not know how many of them were not known by any who could harm him. He stood a long time clinking some sixpences and shillings together in his pocket, and scowling down the street after David had disappeared from sight. "'Blame that little pink cheap, baby-eyed fool!' he said at last, turning on his heel with a sigh. I might have known she was too goody-goody. Such people ought to die young before they grow up to make fools of other people. Bah! Think of a wife like that with no spirit of her own. A baby, merely a baby. Nevertheless, in his secret heart, he knew he honored Marcia and felt a true shame that she had looked into his tarnished soul. Then he looked round about upon his papers that represented a whole week's hard work and maybe more before they were cleared away and reflected how much easier after all it would be to get up a good excuse and go away, leaving all this to some poor drudge who should be sent here in his place. He looked around again, and his eyes lighted upon his book. He remembered the exciting crisis in which he had left the heroine, and down he sat to his story again. At least there was nothing demanding attention this moment. He need not decide what he would do. If he went, there were few preparations to make. He would toss some things into his carpet-bag, and pretend to have been summoned to see a sick and dying relative, a long-lost brother or something. It would be easy to invent one when the time came. Then he could leave directions for the rest of his things to be packed if he did not return, and get rid of the trouble of it all. As for the letters, if he was going, what use to bother with them? Let them wait till his successor should come. It mattered little to him whether his employer suffered for his negligence or not, so long as he finished his story. Besides, it would not do to let that cad think he had frightened him. He would pretend he was not going, at least during his hours of grace. So he picked up his book and went on reading. 
At noon he sauntered back to his boarding house as usual for his dinner, having professed an unusually busy morning to those who came into the office on business and made appointments with them for the next day. This had brought him much satisfaction as the morning wore away and he was left free to his book, and so before dinner he had come to within a very few pages of the end. After a leisurely dinner he sauntered back to the office again, rejoicing in the fact that circumstances had so arranged themselves that he had passed David Spafford in front of the newspaper office and given him a most elaborate and friendly bow in the presence of four or five bystanders. David's look in return had meant volumes, and decided Harry Temple to do as he had been ordered, not, of course, because he had been ordered to do so, but because it would be an easier thing to do. In fact, he made up his mind that he was weary of this part of the country. He went back to his book. About the middle of the afternoon he finished the last pages. He rose up with alacrity, then, and began to think what he should do. He glanced around the room, sought out a few papers, took some daguerreotypes of girls from a drawer of his desk, gave a farewell glance around the dismal little room that had seen so much shirking for the past few months, and then went out and locked the door. He paused at the corner. Which way should he go? He did not care to go back to the office, for his book was done, and he scarcely needed to go to his room at his boarding place yet either, for the afternoon was but half over, and he wished his departure to appear to be entirely unpremeditated. A daring thought came into his head. He would walk past David Spafford's house. He would let Marcia see him if possible. He would show them that he was not afraid in the least. He even meditated going in and explaining to Marcia that she had made a great mistake, that he had been merely admiring her, and that there was no harm in anything he had said or done yesterday, that he was exceedingly grieved and mortified that she should have mistaken his meaning for an insult, and so on and so on. He knew well how to make such honeyed talk when he chose but the audacity of the thing was a trifle too much for even his bold nature, so he satisfied himself by strolling in a leisurely manner by the house. When he was directly opposite to it, he raised his eyes casually and bowed and smiled with his most graceful air. True, he did not see any one, for Marcia had caught sight of him as she was coming out upon the stoop and had fled into her own room with the door buttoned. She was watching unseen from behind the folds of her curtain, but he made the bow as complete as though a whole family had been greeting him from the windows. Marcia, poor child, thought he must see her, and she felt frozen to the spot, and stared wildly through the little fold of her curtain with trembling hands and weak knees till he was passed. Well pleased at himself, the young man walked on, knowing that at least three prominent citizens had seen him bow and smile, and that they would be witnesses against anything David might say to the contrary, that he was on friendly terms with Mrs. Spafford. Hannah Heath was sitting on the front stoop with her knitting. She often sat there dressed daintily of an afternoon. Her hands were white and looked well against the blue yarn she was knitting. Besides, there was something domestic and sentimental in a stocking. It gave a cozy, homey air to a woman, Hannah considered. So she sat and knitted and smiled at whomsoever passed by, luring many in to sit and talk with her so that the stockings never grew rapidly, but always kept at about the same stage. If it had been Miranda, Grandmother Heath would have made some sharp remarks about the length of time it took to finish that blue stocking, but as it was Hannah, it was all right. Hannah sat upon the stoop and knitted as Harry Temple came by. Now, Hannah was not so great a favorite with Harry as Harry was with Hannah. She was of the kind who was conquered too easily, and he did not consider it worth his while to waste time upon her simperings usually. But this afternoon was different. He had nowhere to go for a little while, and Hannah's appearance on the stoop was opportune and gave him an idea. He would lounge there with her. Perchance fortune would favor him again, and David Spafford would pass by and see him. There would be one more opportunity to stare insolently at him and defy him, before he bent his neck to obey. David had given him the day in which to do what he would, and he would make no move until the time was over and the coach he had named departed but he knew that then he would bring down retribution. In just what form that retribution would come he was not quite certain, but he knew it would be severe. So when Hannah smiled upon him, Harry Temple stepped daintily across the mud in the road and came and sat down beside her. He toyed with her knitting, caught one of her plump white hands, the one on the side away from the street, and held it, while Hannah pretended not to notice, and drooped her long eyelashes in a telling way. Hannah knew how. She had been at it a good many years. 
So he sat toward five o'clock when David came by and bowed gravely to Hannah, but seemed not to see Harry. Harry let his eyes follow the tall figure in an insolent stare. "'What a dough-faced cad that man is,' he said lazily. "'No wonder his little pink-cheeked wife seeks other society. Handsome baby, though, isn't she?' Hannah pricked up her ears. Her loss of David was too recent not to cause her extreme jealousy of his pretty young wife. Already she fairly hated her. Her upbringing in the atmosphere of Grandmother Heath's sarcastic, ill-natured gossip had prepared her to be quick to see meaning in any insinuation. She looked at him keenly, archly for a moment, then replied with drooping gaze and coquettish manner, "'You should not blame anyone for enjoying your company.' Hannah stole sly glances to see how he took this, but Harry was an old hand and proof against such scrutiny. He only shrugged his shoulder carelessly as though he dropped all blame like a garment that he had no need for. "'And what's the matter with David?' asked Hannah, watching David as he mounted his own steps, and thinking how often she had watched that tall form go down the street, and thought of him as destined to belong to her. The mortification that he had chosen someone else was not yet forgotten. It amounted almost to a desire for revenge. Harry lingered longer than he intended. Hannah begged him to remain to supper, but he declined, and when she pressed him to do so, he looked troubled, and said he was expecting a letter and must hurry back to see if it came in the afternoon coach. He told her that a dear friend, a beloved cousin, was lying very ill, and he might be summoned at any moment to his bedside, and Hannah said some comforting little things in a caressing voice, and hoped he would find the letter saying the cousin was better. Then he hurried away. It was easy at his boarding-house to say he had been called away, and he rushed up to his room and threw some necessaries into his carpet-bag, scattering things around the room and helping out the impression that he was called away in a great hurry. When he was ready, he looked at his watch. It was growing late. The evening coach left in half an hour. He knew its route well. It started at the village inn and went down the old turnpike, stopping here and there to pick up passengers. There was always a convocation when it started. Perhaps David Spafford would be there and witness his obedience to the command given him. He set his lips and made up his mind to escape that at least. He would cheat his adversary of that satisfaction. It would involve a sacrifice. He would have to go without his supper, and he could smell the frying bacon coming up the stairs. But it would help the illusion, and he could perhaps get something on the way when the coach stopped to change horses. He rushed downstairs and told his landlady that he must start at once as he must see a man before the coach went, and she, poor lady, had no chance to suggest that he leave her a little deposit on the sum of his board which he already owed her. There was perhaps some method in his hurry for that reason also. It always bothered him to pay his bills. He had so many other ways of spending his money. So he hurried away and caught a ride in a farm wagon going toward the crossroads. When it turned off, he walked a little way until another wagon came along finally crossed several fields at a breathless pace and caught the coach just as it was leaving the crossroads, which was the last stopping place anywhere near the village. He climbed up beside the driver, still in a breathless condition, and detailed to him how he had received word just before the coach started by a messenger who came across country on horseback that his cousin was dying. After he had answered the driver's minutest questions, he sat back and reflected upon his course with satisfaction. He was off and he had not been seen nor questioned by a single citizen, and by tomorrow night his story as he had told it to the driver would be fully known and circulated through the place he had just left. The stage driver was one of the best means of advertisement. It was well to give him full particulars. The driver, after he had satisfied his curiosity about the young man by his side, and his reasons for leaving town so hastily, began to wax eloquent upon the one theme which now occupied his spare moments, and his fluent tongue, the subject of a projected railroad. Whether some of the sentiments he uttered were his own, or whether he had but borrowed from others, they were at least uttered with force and apparent conviction, and many a traveler sat and listened as they were retailed and viewed the subject from the standpoint of the loud-mouthed coachman. A little later, Tony Weller, called by someone the best beloved of all coachmen, uttered much the same sentiments in the following words. "'I consider that the railroad is unconstitutional,' and an invader of privileges. As to the comfort, as an old coachman, I may say it, there's the comfort of sitting in a harm chair, a looking at brick walls and heaps of mud, never coming to a public house, never seeing a glass of ale, never going through a pike, never meeting a change of no kind, hosses or otherwise, 
but always come into a place when you comes to one at all, the wary picker o' the last. As to the honor and dignity o' travelin', where can that be without a coachman, and what's the rail to sich coachmen as is sometimes forced to go by it, but an outrage, and an insult. As to the engine, a nasty wheezin', gaspin', puffin', bustin' monster, always out o' breath, with a shiny green and gold back like an unpleasant beetle. As to the engine, as is always a pourin' out red-hot coals at night, and black smoke in the day, the sensiblest thing it does, in my opinion, is ven there's something in the vay, it sets up that ear frightful scream which seems to say, Now, ears two hundred and forty passengers in the wery greatest extremity of danger, and ears there two hundred and forty screams in vun. But such sentiments as these troubled Harry Temple not one whit. He cared not whether the present century had a railroad or whether it traveled by foot. He would not lift a white finger to help it along or hinder. As the talk went on, he was considering how and where he might get his supper. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 the weather turned suddenly cold and raw that fall, and almost in one day the trees that had been green or yellowing in the sunshine put on their autumn garments of defeat, flaunted them for a brief hour, and dropped them early in despair. The pleasant woods to which Marcia had fled in her dismay became a mass of finely penciled branches against a wintry sky, save for the one group of tall pines that hung out heavy above the rest, and seemed to defy even snowy blasts. Marcia could see those pines from her kitchen window, and sometimes as she worked, if her heart was heavy, she would look out and away to them and think of the day she laid her head down beneath them to sob out her trouble, and awoke to find comfort. Somehow the memory of that little talk that she and David had then grew into vast proportions in her mind, and she loved to cherish it. There had come letters from home. Her stepmother had written a stiff, not unloving letter, full of injunctions to be sure to remember this and not do that, and on no account to let any relative or neighbor persuade her out of the ways in which she had been brought up. She was attempting to do as many mothers do, when they see the faults in the child they have brought up, try to bring them up over again. At some of the sentences a wild homesickness took possession of her, some little homely phrase about one of the servants, or the mention of a pet hen or cow, would bring the longing tears to her eyes, and she would feel that she must throw away this new life and run back to the old one. School was begun at home. Mary Ann and Hanford would be taking the long walk back and forth together twice a day to the old schoolhouse. She half envied them their happy, carefree life. She liked to think of the shy courting that she had often seen between scholars and the upper classes. Her imagination pleased itself sometimes when she was going to sleep, trying to picture out the school goings and homecomings and their sober talk. Not that she ever looked back to Hanford Weston with regret, not she. She knew always that he was not for her, and perhaps even so early as that in her new life, if the choice had been given her whether she would go back to her girlhood again and be as she was before Kate had run away, or whether she would choose to stay here in the new life with David, it is likely she would have chosen to stay. There were occasional letters from Squire Schuyler. He wrote of politics and sent many messages to his son-in-law, which Marcia handed over to David at the tea-table to read, and which always seemed to soften David and bring a sweet sadness into his eyes. He loved and respected his father-in-law. It was as if he were bound to him by the love of someone who had died. Marcia thought of that every time she handed David a letter and sat and watched him read it. Sometimes little Harriet or the boys printed out a few words about the family cat or the neighbor's children, and Marcia laughed and cried over the poor little attempts at letters and longed to have the eager childish faces of the writers to kiss. But in all of them there was never a mention of the bright, beautiful, selfish girl around whom the old home life used to center, and whom seemed now, judging from the home letters, to be worse than dead to them all. But since the afternoon upon the hill, a new and pleasant intercourse had sprung up between David and Marcia. True, it was confined mainly to discussions of the new railroad, the possibilities of its success, and the construction of engines, tracks, etc. David was constantly writing up the subject for his paper and he fell into the habit of reading his articles aloud to Marcia when they were finished. She would listen with breathless admiration, sometimes combating a point ably, with the old vim she had used in her discussion over the newspaper with her father, but mainly agreeing with every word he wrote, and always eager to understand it down to the minutest detail. 
He always seemed pleased at her praise, and wrote on while she put away the tea things with a contented expression as though he had passed a high critic and need not fear any other. Once he looked up with a quizzical expression and made a jocose remark about our article, taking her into a sort of partnership with him in it, which set her heart to beating happily, until it seemed as if she were really in some part at least growing into his life. But after all their companionship was a shy distant one, more like that of a brother and sister who had been separated all their lives and were just beginning to get acquainted, and ever there was a settled sadness about the lines of David's mouth and eyes. They sat around one table now, the evenings when they were at home, for there were still occasional tea drinkings at their friends' houses, and there was one night a week held religiously for a formal supper with the aunts, which David kindly acquiesced in, more for the sake of his aunt Clorinda than the others, whenever he was not detained by actual business. Then, too, there was the weekly prayer meeting held at early candlelight in the dim old shadowed church. They always walked down the twilighted streets together, and it seemed to Marcia there was a sweet solemnity about that walk. They never said much to each other on the way. David seemed preoccupied with holy thoughts, and Marcia walked softly beside him, as if he had been the minister, looking at him proudly and reverently now and then. David was often called upon to pray in meeting, and Marcia loved to listen to his words. He seemed to be more intimate with God than the others, who were mostly old men and prayed with long, rolling, solemn sentences that put the whole community down into the dust and ashes before their Creator. Marcia rather enjoyed the hour spent in the somberness of the church, with the flickering candlelight making grotesque forms of shadows on the wall and among the tall pews. The old minister reminded her of the one she had left at home, though he was more learned and scholarly, and when he had read the scripture passages he would take his spectacles off and lay them across the great Bible, where the candlelight played at glances with the steel bows, and say, Let us pray. Then would come that soft stir and hush as the people took the attitude of prayer. Marcia sometimes joined in the prayer in her heart, uttering shy little petitions that were vague and indefinite, and had to do mostly with the days when she was troubled and homesick, and felt that David belonged wholly to Kate. Always her clear voice joined in the slow hymns that quavered out now and again, lined out to the worshippers. Marcia and David went out from that meeting down the street to their home with the hush upon them that must have been upon the Israelites of old after they had been to the solemn congregation. But once David had come in earlier than usual and had caught Marcia reading the Scottish chiefs, and while she started guiltily to be found thus employed, he smiled indulgently. After supper he said, Get your book, child, and sit down. I have some writing to do, and after it is done I will read it to you. So after that, more and more often, it was a book that Marcia held in her hands in the long evenings when they sat together instead of some useful employment, and so her education progressed. Thus she read Epictetus, Rasselas, The Deserted Village, The Vicar of Wakefield, Paradise Lost, The Mysteries of the Human Heart, Marshall's Life of Columbus, The Spy, The Pioneers, and The Last of the Mohicans. She had been asked to sing in the village choir. David sang a sweet high tenor there, and Marcia's voice was clear and strong as a blackbird's, with the plaintive sweetness of the wood robins. Hannah Heath was in the choir also, and jealously watched her every move, but of this Marcia was unaware until informed of it by Miranda. With her inherited sweetness of nature she scarcely credited it, until one Sunday, a few weeks after the departure of Harry Temple, Hannah leaned forward from her seat among the altos and whispered quite distinctly, so that those around could hear. It was just before the service. "'I've just had a letter from your friend, Mr. Temple. I thought you might like to know that his cousin got well, and he has gone back to New York. He won't be returning here this year. On some accounts he thought it was better not.' It was all said pointedly, with double emphasis upon the your friend and some accounts. Marcia felt her cheeks glow, much to her vexation, and tried to control her whisper to seem kindly as she answered indifferently enough. "'Oh, indeed. But you must have made a mistake. Mr. Temple is a very slight acquaintance of mine. I have met him only a few times, and I know nothing about his cousin. I was not aware, even, that he had gone away.' Hannah raised her speaking eyebrows and replied, quite loud now, for the choir leader had stood up already with his tuning fork in hand, and one could hear it faintly twang. Indeed, using Marcia's own word, and quite coldly, I should have thought differently from what Harry himself told me, and there was that in her tone which deepened the color in Marcia's cheeks, 
and caused it to stay there during the entire morning service as she sat puzzling over what Hannah could have meant. It rankled in her mind during the whole day. She longed to ask David about it, but could not get up the courage. She could not bear to revive the memory of what seemed to be her shame. It was at the minister's donation party that Hannah planted another thorn in her heart. Hannah, in a green plaid silk with delicate undersleeves of lace and a tiny black velvet jacket. She selected a time when Lemuel was near and when Aunt Amelia and Aunt Hortense, who believed that all the young men in town were hovering about David's wife, sat one on either side of Marcia, as if to guard her for their beloved nephew, who was discussing politics with Mr. Heath, and who never seemed to notice, so blind he was in his trust of her. So Hannah paused and posed before the three ladies, and with Lemuel smiling just at her elbow, began in her affected way. "'I've had another letter from New York, from your friend, Mr. Temple,' she said it with the slightest possible glance over her shoulder to get the effect of her words upon the faithful Lemuel. "'And he tells me he has met a sister of yours. "'By the way, she told him that David used to be very fond of her before she was married. "'I suppose she'll be coming to visit you now she's so near as New York?' Two pairs of suspicious steely eyes flew like stinging insects to gaze upon her, "'one on either side, and Marcia's heart stood still for just one instant. "'But she felt that here was her trying time.' and if she would help David and do the work for which she had become his wife, she must protect him now from any suspicions or disagreeable tongues. By very force of will she controlled the trembling of her lips. "'My sister will not likely visit us this winter, I think,' she replied as coolly as if she had had a letter to that effect that morning, and then she deliberately looked at Lemuel Skinner and asked if he had heard of the offer of prizes of four thousand dollars in cash— that the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had just made for the most approved engine delivered for trial before June first, 1831, not to exceed three and a half tons in weight and capable of drawing, day by day, fifteen tons inclusive of weight of wagons, fifteen miles per hour. Lemuel looked at her blankly and said he had not heard of it. He was engaged in thinking over what Hannah had said about a letter from Harry Temple. He cared nothing about railroads. The second prize is thirty-five hundred dollars, stated Marcia eagerly, as though it were of the utmost importance to her. Are you thinking of trying for one of the prizes? sneered Hannah, piercing her with her eyes, and now indeed the ruddy color flowed into Marcia's face. Her ruse had been detected. If I were a man and understood machinery, I believe I would. What a grand thing it would be to be able to invent a thing like an engine— that would be of so much use to the world, she answered bravely. They are most dangerous machines, said Aunt Amelia disapprovingly. No right-minded Christian who wishes to live out the life his creator has given him would ever ride behind one. I have heard that boilers always explode. They are most unnecessary, said Aunt Hortense severely, as if that settled the question for all time in all railroad corporations. But Marcia was glad for once of their disapproval and entered most heartily into a discussion of the pros and cons of engines and steam, quoting largely from David's last article for the paper on the subject, until Hannah and Lemuel moved slowly away. The discussion served to keep the aunts from inquiring further that evening about the sister in New York. Marcia begged them to go with her into the kitchen and see the store of good things that had been brought to the minister's house by his loving parishioners. Bags of flour and meal, pumpkins, corn in the ear, eggs, and nice little pats of butter. A great wooden tub of doughnuts, baskets of apples and quinces, pounds of sugar and tea, barrels of potatoes, whole hams, a side of pork, a quarter of beef, hanks of yarn, and strings of onions. It was a goodly array. Marcia felt that the minister must be beloved by his people. She watched him and his wife as they greeted their people and wished she knew them better and might come and see them sometimes and perhaps eventually feel as much at home with them as with her own dear minister. She avoided Hannah during the remainder of the evening. When the evening was over and she went upstairs to get her wraps from the high four-poster bedstead, she had almost forgotten Hannah and her ill-natured prying remarks. But Hannah had not forgotten her. She came forth from behind the bed curtains where she had been searching for a lost glove, and remarked that she should think Marcia would be lonely this first winter away from home and want her sister with her a while. But the presence of Hannah always seemed a mental stimulus to the spirit of Marcia. 
Oh, I'm not in the least lonely, she laughed merrily. I have a great many interesting things to do, and I love music and books. Oh, yes, I forgot you are very fond of music. Harry Temple told me about it, said Hannah. Again there was that disagreeable hint of something more behind her words that aggravated Marcia almost beyond control. For an instant a cutting reply was upon her lips, and her eyes flashed fire. Then it came to her how futile it would be, and she caught the words in time and walked swiftly down the stairs. David, watching her come down, saw the admiring glances of all who stood in the hall below, and took her under his protection with a measure of pride in her youth and beauty that he did not himself at all realize. All the way home he talked with her about the new theory of railroad construction, quite contented in her companionship, while she, poor child, much perturbed in spirit, wondered how he would feel if he knew what Hannah had said. David fell into a deep study with a book and his papers about him after they had reached home. Marcia went up to her quiet, lonely chamber, put her face in the pillow, and thought and wept and prayed. When at last she lay down to rest, she did not know anything she could do but just to go on living day by day and helping David all she could. At most there was nothing to fear for herself, save a kind of shame that she had not been the first sister chosen, and she found to her surprise that that was growing to be deeper than she had supposed. She wished as she fell asleep that her girl dreams might have been left to develop and bloom like other girls, and that she might have had a real lover, like David in every way, yet of course not David, because he was Kate's, but a real lover who would meet her as David had done that night when he thought she was Kate, and speak to her tenderly. One afternoon, David, being wearied with an unusual round of taxing cares, came home to rest and study up some question in his library. Finding the front door fastened, and remembering that he had left his key in his other pocket, he came around to the back door, and much preoccupied with thought, went through the kitchen and nearly to the hall, before the unusual sounds of melody penetrated to his ears. He stopped for an instant, amazed, forgetting the piano, then comprehending he wondered who was playing. Perhaps some visitor was in the parlor. He would listen and find out. He was weary and dusty with the soil of the office upon his hands and clothes. He did not care to meet a visitor, so under cover of the music he slipped into the door of his library across the hall from the parlor and dropped into his great armchair. Softly and tenderly stole the music through the open door all about him, like the gentle dropping of some tender psalms or comforting chapter in the Bible to an aching heart. It touched his brow like a soft, soothing hand, and seemed to know and recognize all the agonies his heart had been passing through, and all the weariness his body felt. He put his head back and let it float over him and rest him, tinkling brooks and gentle zephyrs, waving of forest trees and twitterings of birds, calm lazy clouds floating by, a sweetness in the atmosphere, bells far away, lowing herds, music of the angels high in heaven, the soothing strain from each extracted and brought to heal his broken heart. It fell like dew upon his spirit. Then, like a fresh breeze with zest and life borne on, came a new strain, grand and fine and high, calling him to better things. He did not know it was a strain of Handel's music grown immortal, but his spirit recognized the higher call, commanding him to follow, and straightway he felt strengthened to go onward in the course he had been pursuing. Old troubles seemed to grow less. Anguish fell away from him. He took new lease of life. Nothing seemed impossible. Then she played by ear one or two of the old tunes they sang in church, touching the notes tenderly and almost making them speak the words. It seemed a benediction. Suddenly the playing ceased, and Marcia remembered it was nearly supper time. He met her in the doorway with a new look in his eyes, a look of high purpose and exultation. He smiled upon her and said, "'That was good, child. I did not know you could do it. You must give it to us often.' Marcia felt a glow of pleasure in his kindliness, albeit she felt that the look in his eyes set him apart and above her, and made her feel the child she was. She hurried out to get the supper between pleasure and a nameless unrest. She was glad of this much, but she wanted more, a something to meet her soul and satisfy. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen. 
The world had not gone well with Mistress Kate Leavenworth, and she was ill pleased. She had not succeeded in turning her father's heart toward herself as she had confidently expected to do when she ran away with her sea captain. She had written a gay letter home, taking for granted, in a pretty way, the forgiveness she did not think it necessary to ask. But there had come in return a brief, harsh statement from her father, that she was no longer his daughter and must cease from further communication with the family in any way, that she should never enter his house again, and not a penny of his money should ever pass to her. He also informed her plainly that the trousseau made for her had been given to her sister, who was now the wife of the man she had not seen fit to marry. Over this letter Mistress Kate at first stormed, then wept, and finally sat down to frame epistle after epistle in petulant, penitent language. These epistles, following each other by daily mail coaches, still brought nothing further from her irate parent, and my lady was at last forced to face the fact that she must bear the penalty of her own misdeeds, a lesson she should have learned much earlier in life. The young captain, who had always made it appear that he had plenty of money, had spent his salary and most of his mother's fortune, which had been left in his keeping as administrator of his father's estate, so he had really very little to offer the spoiled and petted beauty, who simply would not settle down to the inevitable and accept the fate she had brought upon herself and others. Day after day she fretted and blamed her husband, until he heartily wished her back from whence he had taken her wished her back with her straight-laced lover from whom he had stolen her, wished her anywhere save where she was. Her brightness and beauty seemed all gone. She was a sulky child, insisting upon the moon or nothing. She wanted to go to New York and be established in a fine house with plenty of servants and a carriage and horses, and the young captain had not the wherewithal to furnish these accessories to an elegant and luxurious life. He had loved her so far as his shallow nature could love, and perhaps she had returned it in the beginning. He wanted to spend his furlough in quiet places where he might have a honeymoon of his ideal, bantering Kate's sparkling sentences, looking into her beautiful eyes, touching her rosy lips with his own as often as he chose. But Mistress Kate had lost her sparkle. She would not be kissed until she had gained her point. Her lovely eyes were full of disfiguring tears and angry flashes and her speech scintillated with cutting sarcasms which were none the less hard to bear that they pressed home some disagreeable truths to the easy, careless spendthrift. The rose had lost its dew and was making its thorns felt. And so they quarreled through their honeymoon, and Captain Leavenworth was not sorry when a hasty and unexpected end came to his furlough, and he was ordered off with his ship for an indefinite length of time. Even then Kate thought to get her will before he left, and held on her sullen ways and her angry, blameful talk until the last minute, so that he hurried away without even one good-bye kiss, and with her angry sentences sounding in his ears. True, he repented somewhat on board the ship and sent her back more money than she could reasonably have expected under the circumstances, but he sent it without one word of gentleness, and Kate's heart was hard toward her husband. Then, with bitterness and anguish, that was new and fairly astonishing that it had come to her who had always had her way, she sat down to think of the man she had jilted. He would have been kind to her. He would have given her all she asked and more. He would even have moved his business to New York to please her, she felt sure. Why had she been so foolish? And then, like many another sinner who is made at last to see the error of his ways, she cast hard thoughts at a fate which had allowed her to make so great a mistake and pitied her poor little self out of all recognition of the character she had formed. But she took her money and went to New York, for she felt that there only could she be at all happy, and have some little taste of the delights of true living. She took up her abode with an ancient relative of her own mother's, who lived in a quiet, respectable part of the city, and who was glad to piece out her small annuity with the modest sum that Kate agreed to pay for her board. It was not long before Mistress Kate, with her beautiful face and the pretty clothes which she took care to provide at once for herself, spending lavishly out of the diminishing sum her husband had sent her and thinking not of the morrow, nor the day when the board bills would be due, became well known. The musty little parlor of the ancient relative was daily filled with visitors, and every evening Kate held court, with the old aunt nodding in her chair by the fireside. Neither did the poor old lady have a very easy time of it, in spite of the promise of weekly pay. Kate laughed at the old furniture and the old ways. 
She demanded new things and got them, too, until the old lady saw little hope of any help from the board money, when Kate was constantly saying, "'I saw this in a shop downtown, Auntie, and as I knew you needed it, I just bought it. My board this week will just pay for it.' As always, Kate ruled. The little parlor took on an air of brightness, and Kate became popular. A few women of fashion took her up, and Kate launched herself upon a gay life, her one object to have as good a time as possible, regardless of what her husband or anyone else might think. When Kate had been in New York about two months, it happened one day that she went out to drive with one of her new acquaintances, a young married woman of about her own age, who had been given all in a worldly way that had been denied to Kate. They made some calls in Brooklyn and returned on the ferry boat, carriage and all, just as the sun was setting. The view was marvelous. The water a flood of pink and green and gold, the sails of the vessels along the shore lit up resplendently, the buildings of the city beyond sent back occasional flashes of reflected light from window glass or church spire. It was a picture worth looking upon, and Kate's companion was absorbed in it. Not so Kate. She loved display above all things. She sat up statelily, aware that she looked well in her new frock with the fine lace collar she had extravagantly purchased the day before and her leghorn bonnet with its real ostrich feather, which was becoming in the extreme. She enjoyed sitting back of the colored coachman, her elegant friend by her side, and being admired by the two ladies and the little girl who sat in the lady's cabin and occasionally peeped curiously at her from the window. She drew herself up haughtily and let her soul delight itself in fatness. Borrowed fatness, perhaps, but still the long desired. She told herself she had a right to it, for was she not a Schuyler? That name was respected everywhere. She bore a grudge at a man and woman who stood by the railing absorbed in watching the sunset haze that lay over the river, showing the white sails in gleams like flashes of white birds here and there. A young man, well set up and fashionably attired, sauntered up to the carriage. He spoke to Kate's friend and was introduced. Kate felt in her heart it was because of her presence there he came. His bold black eyes told her as much, and she was flattered. They fell to talking. "'You say you spent the summer near Albany, Mr. Temple,' said Kate presently. "'I wonder if you happen to know any of my friends. Did you meet a Mr. Spafford? David Spafford?' "'Of course I did. Knew him well,' said the young man with guarded tone. But a quick flash of dislike and perhaps fear had crossed his face at the name. Kate was keen. She analyzed that look. She parted her charming red lips and showed her sharp little teeth like the treacherous pearls in a white kitten's pink mouth. "'He was once a lover of mine,' said Kate carelessly, wrinkling her piquant little nose as if the idea were comical, and laughing out a sweet ripple of mirth that would have cut David to the heart. "'Indeed,' said the ever-ready Harry. "'And I do not wonder. Is not every one that, at once they see you, Madam Leavenworth. How kind of your husband to stay away at sea for so long a time and give us other poor fellows a chance to say pleasant things. Then Kate pouted her pretty lips in a way she had and tapped the delighted Harry with her carriage parasol across the fingers of his hand that had taken familiar hold of the carriage beside her arm. Oh, you naughty man, she exclaimed prettily. How dare you? Yes, David Spafford and I were quite good friends. I almost gave in at one time and became Mrs. Spafford but he was too good for me. She uttered this truth in a mocking tone, and Harry saw her lead and hastened to follow. Here was a possible chance for revenge. He was ready for any. He studied the lady before him keenly. Of what did that face remind him? Had he ever seen her before? I should judge him a little straight-laced for your merry ways, he responded gallantly. But he's like all the rest. Fickle, you know. He's married. Have you heard? Kate's face darkened with something hard and cruel, but her voice was soft as a cat's purr. Yes, she sighed. I know. He married my sister. Poor child. I am sorry for her. I think he did it out of revenge, and she was too young to know her own mind. But they, poor things, will have to bear the consequences of what they have done. Isn't it a pity that that has to be, Mr. Temple? It is dreadful to have the innocent suffer. I have been greatly anxious about my sister. She lifted her large eyes, swimming in tears, and he did not perceive the insincerity in her purring voice just then. He was thanking his lucky stars that he had been saved from any remarks about young Mrs. Spafford, 
whom her sister seemed to love so deeply. It had been on the tip of his tongue to suggest that she might be able to lead her husband a gay little dance if she chose. How lucky he had not spoken. He tried to say some pleasant comforting nothings, and found it delightful to see her face clear into smiles, and her blue eyes look into his so confidingly. By the time the boat touched the New York side, the two felt well acquainted, and Harry Temple had promised to call soon, which promise he lost no time in keeping. Kate's heart had grown bitter against the young sister who had dared to take her place, and against the lover who had so easily solaced himself. She could not understand it. She resolved to learn all that Mr. Temple knew about David, and to find out if possible whether he were happy. It was Kate's nature not to be able to give up anything, even though she did not want it. She desired the lifelong devotion of every man who came near her, and have it she would, or punish him. Harry Temple, meanwhile, was reflecting upon his chance meeting that afternoon, and wondering if in some way he might not yet have revenge upon the man who had humbled him. Possibly this woman could help him. After some thought, he sat down and penned a letter to Hannah Heath, begemming it here and there with devoted sentences which caused that young woman's eyes to sparkle and a smile of anticipation to wreathe her lips. When she heard of the handsome sister in New York and of her former relations with David Spafford, her eyes narrowed speculatively, and her fair brow drew into puzzled frowns. Harry Temple had drawn a word picture of Mrs. Leavenworth. Harry should have been a novelist. If he had not been too lazy, he would have been a success. Gold hair! Ah! Hannah had heard of gold hair before, and in connection with David's promised wife. Here was a mystery, and Hannah resolved to look into it. It would at least be interesting to note the effect of her knowledge upon the young bride next door. She would try it. Meantime, the acquaintance of Harry Temple and Kate Leavenworth had progressed rapidly. The second sight of the lady proved more interesting than the first, for now her beautiful gold hair added to the charm of her handsome face. Harry ever delighted in beauty of whatever type, and a blonde was more fascinating to him than a brunette. Kate had dressed herself bewitchingly, and her manner was charming. She knew how to assume pretty childlike airs, but she was not afraid to look him boldly in the eyes and the light in her own seemed to challenge him. Here was a delightful new study, a woman fresh from the country, having all the charm of innocence, almost as childlike as her sister, yet with none of her prudishness. Kate's eyes held latent wickedness in them, or he was much mistaken. She did not droop her lids and blush when he looked boldly and admiringly into her face, but stared him back, smilingly, merrily, daringly, as though she would go quite as far as he would. Moreover, with her he was sure he need feel none of the compunctions he might have felt with her younger sister, who was so obviously innocent, for whether Kate's boldness was from lack of knowledge or from lack of innocence, she was quite able to protect herself, that was plain. So Harry settled into his chair with a smile of pleasant anticipation upon his face. He not only had the prospect before him of a possible ally in revenge against David Spafford, but he had the promise of a most unusually delightful flirtation with a woman who was worthy of his best efforts in that line. Almost at once it began, with pleasant banter adorned with personal compliments. "'Lovelier than I thought, my lady,' said Harry, bowing low over the hand she gave him, in a courtly manner he had acquired, perhaps from the old-world novels he had read, and he brushed her pink fingertips with his lips in a way that signified he was her abject slave." Kate blushed and smiled, greatly pleased, for though she had held her own little court in the village where she was brought up, and queened it over the young men who had flocked about her willingly, she had not been used to the fulsome flattery that breathed from Harry Temple in every word and glance. He looked at her keenly as he stood back a moment to see if she were in any wise offended with his salutation, and saw as he expected that she was pleased and flattered. Her cheeks had grown rosier, and her eyes sparkled with pleasure as she responded with a pretty, gracious speech. Then they sat down and faced one another. A good woman would have called his look impudent, insulting. Kate returned it with a look that did not shrink nor waver, but fearlessly, recklessly accepted the challenge. Playing with fire were these two, and with no care for the fearful results which might follow. Both knew it was dangerous, and liked it the better for that. There was a long silence. The game was opening on a wider scale than either had ever played before. "'Do you believe in affinities?' asked the devil through the man's voice. 
The woman colored and showed she understood his deeper meaning. Her eyes drooped for just the shade of an instant, and then she looked up and faced him saucily, provokingly. Why? He admired her with his gaze and waited, lazily watching the color play in her cheeks. Do you need to ask why? he said at last, looking at her significantly. I knew that you were my affinity the moment I laid my eyes upon you, and I hoped you felt the same. But perhaps I was mistaken. He searched her face. She kept her eyes upon his, returning their full gaze, as if to hold it from going too deep into her soul. I did not say you were mistaken, did I? said the rosy lips coquettishly and Kate drooped her long lashes till they fell in becoming sweeps over her burning cheeks. Something in the curve of cheek and chin and sweep of dark lash over velvet skin reminded him of her sister. It was so she had sat, though utterly unconscious, while he had been singing, when there had come over him that overwhelming desire to kiss her. If he should kiss this fair lady, would she slap him in the face and run into the garden? He thought not. Still, she was brought up by the same father and mother in all likelihood, and it was well to go slow. He reached forward, drawing his chair a little nearer to her, and then boldly took one of her small, unresisting hands, gently, that he might not frighten her, and smoothed it thoughtfully between his own. He held it in a close grasp, and looked into her face again, she, meanwhile, watching her hand amusedly, as though it were something apart from herself a sort of distant possession for which she was in no wise responsible. "'I feel that you belong to me,' he said boldly, looking into her eyes with a languishing gaze. "'I have known it from the first moment.' Kate let her hand lie in his as if she liked it, but she said, "'And what makes you think that, most audacious sir? Did you not know that I am married?' Then she swept her gaze up provokingly at him again and smiled showing her dainty, treacherous little teeth. She was so bewitchingly pretty and tempting then that he had a mind to kiss her on the spot, but a thought came to him that he would rather lead her further first. He was succeeding well. She had no mind to be afraid. She did her part admirably. "'That makes no difference,' said he, smiling, "'that another man has secured you first and has the right to provide for you and be near you is my misfortune, of course. But it makes no difference you are mine.' By all the power of love you are mine. Can any other man keep my soul from yours? Can he keep my eyes from looking into yours? Or my thoughts from hovering over you? Or... He hesitated and looked at her keenly, while she furtively watched him holding her breath and half inviting him. Or my lips from drinking life from yours? He stooped quickly and pressed his lips upon hers. Kate gave a quick little gasp like a sob and drew back. The aunt, nodding over her Bible in the next room, had not heard. She was very deaf. But for an instant the young woman felt that all the shades of her worthy patriarchal ancestors were hurrying around and away from her in horror. She had come of too good Puritan stock not to know that she was treading in the path of unrighteousness. Nevertheless, it was a broad path and easy. It tempted her. It was exciting. It lured her with promise of satisfying some of her untamed longings and impulses. She did not look offended. She only drew back to get breath and consider. The wild beating of her heart, the tumult of her cheeks and eyes were all a part of a new emotion. Her vanity was excited, and she thrilled with a wild pleasure. As a duck will take to swimming, so she took to the new game with wonderful facility. "'But I didn't say you might!' she cried with a bewildering smile. "'I beg your pardon, fair lady. May I have another?' His bold, bad face was near her own, so that she did not see the evil triumph that lurked there. She had come to the turning of another way in her life, and just here she might have drawn back if she would. Half she knew this, yet she toyed with the opportunity, and it was gone. The new way seemed so alluring. "'You will first have to prove you're right,' she said decidedly, with that pretty commanding air that had conquered so many times." and in like manner on they went through the evening, frittering the time away at playing with edged tools. A friendship so begun, if so unworthy an intimacy may be called by that sweet name, boded no good to either of the two, and that evening marked a decided turn for the worse in Kate Leavenworth's career. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Marcia Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 David had found it necessary to take a journey which might keep him away for several weeks. He told Marcia in the evening when he came home from the office. He told her as he would have told his clerk. It meant nothing to him but an annoyance that he had to start out in the early winter, leave his business in others' hands for an indefinite period, and go among strangers. He did not see the whitening of Marcia's lips, nor the quick little movement of her hand to her heart. Even Marcia herself did not realize all that it meant to her. She felt as if a sudden shock had almost knocked her off her feet. This quiet life in the big house, with only David at intervals to watch and speak to occasionally, and no one to open her true heart to, had been lonely. And many a time when she was alone at night she had wept bitter tears upon her pillow. Why, she did not quite know. But now when she knew that it was to cease, and David was going away from her for a long time, perhaps weeks, her heart suddenly tightened, and she knew how sweet it had been growing. Almost the tears came to her eyes, but she made a quick errand to the hearth for the teapot, busying herself there till they were under control again. When she returned to her place at the table, she was able to ask David some commonplace question about the journey, which kept her true feeling quite hidden from him. He was to start the next evening if possible. It appeared that there was something important about railroading coming up in Congress. It was necessary that he should be present to hear the debate and also that he should see and interview influential men. It meant much to the success of the great new enterprises that were just in their infancy that he should go and find out all about them and write them up as only he, whose heart was in it, could do. He was pleased to have been selected for this. He was lifted for the time above himself and his life troubles, and given to feel that he had a work in the world that was worth while, a high calling, a chance to give a push to the unrolling of the secret possibilities of the universe and help them on their way. Marcia understood it all and was proud and glad for him, but her own heart, which beat in such perfect sympathy with the work, felt lonely and left out. If only she could have helped too. There was no time for David to take Marcia to her home to stay during his absence. He spoke of it regretfully just as he was about to leave, and asked if she would like him to get someone to escort her by coach to her father's house, until he could come for her. But she held back the tears by main force and shook her head. She had canvassed that question in the still hours of the night. She had met in imagination the home village with its kindly and unkindly curiosity. She had seen their hands lifted in suspicion, heard their covert whispers as to why her husband did not come with her, why he had left her so soon after the honeymoon, why a hundred things. She had even thought of Aunt Polly and her acrid tongue and made up her mind that whatever happened, she did not want to go home to stay. The only other alternative was to go to the aunts. David expected it, and the aunts spoke of it as if nothing else were possible. Marcia would have preferred to remain alone in her own house with her beloved piano, but David would not consent, and the aunts were scandalized at the suggestion. So to the aunts went Marcia, and they took her in with a hope in their hearts that she might get the same good from the visit that the sluggard in the Bible is bidden to find. "'We must do our duty by her for David's sake,' said Aunt Hortense with pursed lips and capable folded hands that seemed fairly to ache to get at the work of reconstructing the new niece. "'Yes, it is our opportunity,' said Aunt Amelia with a snap, as though she thoroughly enjoyed the prospect. "'Poor David!' And so they sat and laid out their plans for their sweet young victim, who all unknowingly was coming to one of those tests in her life, whereby we are tried for greater things and made perfect in patience and sweetness. It began with the first breakfast, the night before she had been company, at supper. But when the morning came, they felt she must be counted one of the family. They examined her thoroughly on what she had been taught with regard to housekeeping. They made her tell her recipes for pickling and preserving. They put her through a catechism of culinary lore, and always after her most animated account of the careful way in which she had been trained in this or that housewifely art, she looked up with wistful eyes that longed to please, only to be met by the hard-set lips and steely glances of the two mentors who regretted that she should not have been taught their way, which was so much better. Aunt Hortense even went so far once as to suggest that Marcia write to her stepmother and tell her how much better it was to salt the water in which potatoes were to be boiled before putting them in, 
and was much offended by the clear girlish laugh that bubbled up involuntarily at the thought of teaching her stepmother anything about cooking. "'Excuse me,' she said, instantly sobering, as she saw the grim look of the aunt and felt frightened at what she had done. "'I did not mean to laugh. Indeed I did not. But it seemed so funny to think of my telling mother how to do anything.' "'People are never too old to learn,' remarked Aunt Hortense with offended mien. "'And one ought never to be too proud when there is a better way.' "'But Mother thinks there is no better way, I am sure. "'She says that it makes potatoes soggy to boil them in salt. "'All that grows below the ground should be salted after it is cooked, "'and all that grows above the ground should be cooked in salted water is her rule.' "'I am surprised that your stepmother should uphold any such superstitious ideas,' said Aunt Amelia with a self-satisfied expression. "'One should never be too proud to learn something better,' Aunt Hortense said grimly, and Marcia retreated in dire consternation at the thought of what might follow if these three notable housekeeping gentlewomen should come together. Somehow she felt a wicked little triumph in the thought that it would be hard to down her stepmother.' Marcia was given a few light duties ostensibly to make her feel at home, but in reality she knew because the aunts felt she needed their instruction. She was asked if she would like to wash the china and glass, and regularly after each meal a small wooden tub and a mop were brought in with hot water and soap, and she was expected to handle the costly heirlooms under the careful scrutiny of their worshipping owners, who evidently watched each process with strained nerves, lest any bit of treasured pottery should be cracked or broken. It was a trying ordeal. The girl would have been no girl if she had not chafed under this treatment. To hold her temper steady and sweet under it was almost more than she could bear. There were long afternoons when it was decreed that they should knit. Marcia had been used to take long walks at home over the smooth crust of the snow, going to her beloved woods, where she delighted to wander among the bare and creaking trees, fancying them whispering sadly to one another of the summer that was gone and the leaves they had borne now dead. But it would be a dreadful thing in the aunt's opinion for a woman, and especially a young one, to take a long walk in the woods alone, in winter too, and with no object whatever in view but a walk. What a waste of time! There were two places of refuge for Marcia during the weeks that followed. There was home. How sweet that word sounded to her! How she longed to go back there with David coming home to his quiet meals three times a day, and with her own time to herself to do as she pleased. With housewifely zeal that was commendable in the eyes of the aunts, Marcia insisted upon going down to her own house every morning to see that all was right, guiltily knowing that in her heart she meant to hurry to her beloved books and piano. To be sure it was cold and cheerless in the empty house, she dared not make up fires and leave them, and she dared not stay too long lest the aunts would feel hurt at her absence. But she longed with an inexpressible longing to be back there by herself, away from that terrible supervision, and able to live her own glad little life and think her own thoughts, untrammeled by primness. Sometimes she would curl up in David's big armchair and have a good cry, after which she would take a book and read until the creeping chills down her spine warned her she must stop. Even then she would run up and down the hall or take a broom and sweep vigorously to warm herself, and then go to the cold keys and play a sad little tune. All her tunes seemed sad like a wail while David was gone. The other place of refuge was Aunt Clorinda's room. Thither she would betake herself after supper, to the delight of the old lady. Then the other two occupants of the house were left to themselves and might unbend from their rigid surveillance for a little while. Marcia often wondered if they ever did unbend. There was a large padded rocking chair in Aunt Clorinda's room, and Marcia would laughingly take the little old lady in her arms and place her comfortably in it, after a pleasant struggle on Miss Clorinda's part to put her guest into it. They had this same little play every evening, and it seemed to please the old lady mightily. Then when she was conquered, she always sat meekly laughing, a fine pink color in her soft peachy cheek, the candlelight from the high shelf making flickering sparkles in her old eyes that always seemed young, and she would say, That's just as David used to do. Then Marcia drew up the little mahogany stool covered with the worsted dog which Aunt Clorinda had worked when she was ten years old, and snuggling down at the old lady's feet exclaimed delightedly, Tell me about it, and they settled down to solid comfort. 
There came a letter from David after he had been gone a little over a week. Marcia had not expected to hear from him, he had said nothing about writing, and their relations were scarcely such as to make it necessary. Letters were an expensive luxury in those days, but when the letter was handed to her, Marcia's heart went pounding against her breast. The color flew into her cheeks, and she sped away home on feet swift as the wings of a bird. The postmaster's daughter looked after her and remarked to her father, "'My, but don't she think a lot of him?' Straight to the cold, lonely house she flew, and sitting down in his big chair read it. It was a pleasant letter, beginning formally, "'My dear Marcia, and asking after her health. It brought back a little of the unacquaintedness she had felt when he was at home, and which had been swept away in part by her knowledge of his childhood. But it went on quite happily, telling all about his journey, and describing minutely the places he had passed through, and the people he had met on the way, detailing every little incident as only a born writer and observer could do, until she felt as if he were talking to her. He told her of the men whom he had met who were interested in the new project. He told of new plans, and described minutely his visit to the foundry at West Point, and the machinery he had seen. Marcia read it all breathlessly, in search of something, she knew not what, that was not there. When she had finished and found it not, there was a sense of aloofness, a sad little disappointment which welled up in her throat. She sat back to think about it. He was having a good time, and he was not lonely. He had no longing to be back in the house and everything running as before he had gone. He was out in the big glorious world having to do with progress, and coming in contact with men who were making history. Of course he did not dream how lonely she was here and how she longed, if for nothing else, just to be back here alone and do as she pleased and not to be watched over. If only she might steal Aunt Clorinda and bring her back to live here with her while David was away! But that was not to be thought of, of course. By and by she mustered courage to be glad of her letter and to read it over once more. That night she read the letter to Aunt Clorinda, and together they discussed the great inventions and the changes that were coming to pass in the land. Aunt Clorinda was just a little beyond her depth in such a conversation, but Marcia did most of the talking, and the dear old lady made an excellent listener, with a pat here and a, "'Deary me, now you don't say so, there, and bless the boy, what great things he does expect, and I hope he won't be disappointed.' That letter lasted them for many a day until another came, this time from Washington, with many descriptions of public men and public doings, and a word picture of the place which made it appear much like any other place after all if it was the capital of the country. And once there was a sentence which Marcia treasured. It was, I wish you could be here and see everything. You would enjoy it, I know. There came another letter later beginning, My Dear Little Girl. There was nothing else in it to make Marcia's heart throb. It was all about his work, but Marcia carried it many days in her bosom. It gave her a thrill of delight to think of those words at the beginning. Of course it meant no more than that he thought of her as a girl, his little sister that was to have been, but there was a kind of ownership in the words that was sweet to Marcia's lonely heart. It had come to her that she was always looking for something that would make her feel that she belonged to David. End of chapter 20